This commission of inquiry is now open. Commissioner James Igloliorti presiding as commissioner. Please be seated. I think we're all aware of the uh, COVID rules. I've been explained now several times. But uh, we do have a couple of new faces uh, relative to yesterday's appearances. So I'll ask uh, the practitioners uh, to uh, introduce themselves to the rest of the, uh, the uh, people here, please, starting down at the end of the table. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Darren O'Keefe. I'm a partner with Cox and Palmer, and I represent the Concerned Citizens for Search and Rescue. Good morning, Louise Bradley, mental health consultant. Good morning, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, today we are going to hear from uh, Mr. Richard Smith, who the inquiry retained some months ago as a consultant and expert in ground search and rescue. We are going to enter his uh, presentation as an exhibit, the, rather the slides that will constitute his presentation. So, uh, Madam Clerk, perhaps we, as a first order of business, we can enter that that uh, presentation, which we're about to receive this morning as uh, exhibit, I believe, P191. Uh, yes, that's correct. Thank you. And uh, as we uh, heard, I believe, late yesterday, Mr. Smith anticipates he'll take uh, much of the morning, at least, to, uh, to make his presentation. I would assume we'll probably have a break after about an hour and a quarter to give the uh, presenter a chance to catch his breath. And uh, we'll uh, have uh, the opportunity, we'll be there for parties to question Mr. Smith in the afternoon. Uh, I'll leave it to Mr. Smith to, to introduce himself as, uh, he, uh, as he plans to do, tell him a little, about, about, a little bit about himself. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Morning, uh, Commissioner. Uh, thank you very much. When I uh, first received the call to see if I was interested in participating in the hearing, I thought very long and hard about it, but I also looked at it, the challenge, and then working with uh, some really great... We need any mics. I am mic'd. Oh, you're mic'd? Oh, so good. Yeah. So it was a wonderful opportunity to work with some of the great people here in the, in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, and also some of the uh, brothers and sisters I've worked with in the years in public safety and search and rescue. And it meant that I was going to be away for you know, more than six weeks. But well, then you think back to the sacrifices that the volunteer search and rescue personnel make all across the country, and, and indeed here in Newfoundland, and all the sacrifices that we engage in when it comes to saving the lives of others. And I thought it's, it's a very worthwhile cause. And it really came down to a perspective is we need to get this right. We need to take our time and to make sure that when we have these recommendations from a wide variety and cadre of individuals, that they are the right recommendations to go forward, documented uh, towards the commissioner yourself and then also the government. I'm just going to go over the uh, background on myself and, and a couple of short uh, bios here. So starting many years ago, I was engaged with the uh, Canadian military and the Army Reserves while attending university and uh, it was a good opportunity to uh, serve the country and learn a lot and work with great teams of individuals. And that was starting in the 1970s. I then had the opportunity to either stay in the military and or engage in working with the RCMP and I decided to go with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police at that time. And I worked in uh, a number of different divisions which I'll touch on uh, shortly and that took me up to about 1999. There was an opportunity uh, to leave the force, as we often say, and then work in the interest of public safety and emergency management and I was able to do that with Clearwater County which is located in West Central Alberta. And I did, and I gained a lot of knowledge working with a team of individuals in emergency management, public safety, and it involved a lot of writing the plans and responding to disasters, and also to further my education. <clears throat> I then had another opportunity arise in 
2006, to work for the United States Department of Homeland Security. And they were looking for somebody that had a policing background, a search and rescue background, emergency management, and, and was a trainer that they could use in the Miami field office with the Southeast Florida Domestic Security Task Force. So I grabbed that opportunity uh, and off we went. But then Florida gets old pretty fast, the same weather every day unless you get a hurricane. So I decided I wanted to come back to Alberta, and I did. And again, thanks to uh, contacts and, and working, I worked for Alberta Justice and Social General up until January 2018. Now that whole time, <clears throat> I've been involved in search and rescue. Even though I had a full-time vocation occupation, <clears throat> I started my search and rescue missions when I was in the RCMP, working in Manitoba, which is called D Division, working in O Division, which is Ontario, working in G Division, which is the Northwest Territories, and at home in, in, in K Division. And I gained a lot of insight I did retire as the K Division Search and Rescue Coordinator with a similar position to uh, Sergeant Danny, Danny Williams. And it was an excellent opportunity to have an insight into SAR. There was several cases that were involved that changed my aspect on life as we went through it. And I'll explain those just a little further down as a member of the RCMP. But since 1986, I've been a volunteer, a practitioner with Rocky Mountain House Search and Rescue is where I started and that is also just in west central Alberta in Clearwater County, so west of Red Deer. And then I am presently with Mountain View Search and Rescue, which is the next county south of Clearwater County in west central Alberta. And those counties back on to Banff and Jasper National Park, and of course draw a lot of population from not only Red Deer, but uh, Calgary for tourism and, and recreation, and are very, very busy when it comes to public safety and search and rescue uh, responses. There was a need through myself and another fellow back in 1992 to really get more training materials here into Canada and also help involve uh, writing and changing some of the training materials that were out there presently at the time. So I grasped at the opportunity to work with ERI International and then into SARI Canada. So I've been an instructor and an international presenter with ERI International and SARI Canada since 1992 and I've been involved in a number of uh, authoring publications, standard operating procedures, field operating guides, and also working internationally. In Clearwater County, the emergency management side dealt with tornadoes, floods, wildland urban fire interfaces, uh, search and rescue assisting the RCMP and, and, and their mandate, um, major disasters, everything from pipeline explosions to anthrax epidemics, and also writing a pandemic plan in 1999. And so that opportunity was very value added for myself personally and my development uh, in the interest of public safety. The emergency management side in Florida was a challenge in itself. Trying to get 26 agencies to have interoperability and work together was under it, it was a really significant challenge in my life and also working with four other individuals to make that happen from Palm Beach County down to Monroe County, which takes into Key West of Florida. But we did it. But it took about 18 months to bring interoperability and get everybody to work together so that when the spam hits the fan, whether it's a hurricane, uh, something domestic and or large scale <coughs> search and rescue calls, that people would have interoperability and work together. And it worked out very well, thanks to a great team. So presently, I, um, I work with Search and Rescue Alberta as a volunteer since I have in 1986. And I'm on a provincial call-out team, an incident management team for Alberta Emergency Management Agency. Typically, I act under uh, the incident management team as a branch director. And one of the engagements I was involved in in the last major floods in Alberta, which spanned about 16% of Alberta in the Calgary area, was to be the First Nations Search and Rescue Branch Director and work with four First Nations to provide search and rescue services when floods had swept away a lot of the homes into the rivers, the drainages, 
and then to search all those homes and to make sure that uh, the SAR services through Emergency Management Alberta were provided on the First Nations and work with the band council specifically and about 130 some odd individuals on each one of those First Nations at any given time. And I was very fortunate to have some great division uh, supervisors to assist me in doing that role. Uh, like Mr. Harry Blackmore, I've been working with the CSA group and SARVAC in the ongoing research and development for core competency accreditation standards uh, for the country, so across Canada and also be involved in some of the basic search and rescue skills and you know, what should be required. We anticipate we can complete those studies by 2022. <clears throat> I have lectured at a number of international and national conferences, including SARSCENE since its uh, beginnings back in 1992-93, uh, uh, the Washington State SAR Conference. I didn't put Florida on them, I should put Florida, Alabama, uh, I've attended the Mountain Rescue Association in England, the Irish Mountain Rescue Association, Icelandic International Conference, and each one of those conferences I was a presenter and also completed some pre-conference course training for the attendees at the conferences. One of the latest endeavors was to be involved with the Cyrotech Science Symposium, and Bill Cyrotech was a great, uh, <coughs> uh, great mind and a great Canadian, and he was the one that developed a lot of the scent for the scenting dog for, for canine handlers, but also the original lost person behavior studies going back to the early 1970s. So his name is attached to the science symposium. And I was presented um, with a challenge of, of how to make sure that we could do a transition piece from initial response to advanced planning and how you could do that seamlessly. So I presented in my paper uh, these are at this conference and it was accepted and read over by many uh, uh, PhDs and, and folks from all over the world and it's now being uh, published. So with the publishing side, I actually have five uh, books uh, published and I, I'm a really big believer in your credit where credit is due and even though the company I'm associated with uh, publishes and of course prints and develops this material, I, I believe it is important that if somebody uh, hasn't been involved with research development, has given us a hand in developing materials, that they get credit. So I've, I've made sure that there are several names inside the covers of these manuals, because uh, that is important. These are the folks that are making a difference worldwide and, uh, and have taken up the challenge themselves and put many, many hours into developing search rescue skills, urban search and rescue, <clears throat> initial response for the incident commander, and search and rescue leadership, and, and search and rescue management for extended operations. In other words, operational periods that go beyond the third and fourth ops into multiple days. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. I know I'm here and was asked to be an expert, and it's always interesting. I think when you're sworn in, you understand the legal ramifications that you are an expert when you're sworn in, in a court of law, public inquiry. But with that being said, I've never really considered myself an expert. You're never 100% or you never completed school. You never completed your education. Nothing ever stops. You keep learning, you keep adapting, you keep utilizing different ways of doing business. So I'm always careful using that term, especially when it comes to search and rescue. Uh, being a practitioner, still engaged in SAR missions in my neck of the woods. The last one being a SAR management uh, role. Did you find that lost missing overdue subject? You said you were the expert. You should be finding 10 out of 10 people. Well, in that case, we did not find the subject. And the person probably is in the rest of the world. And the police are continuing the investigation. So you have to be careful using that term as a practitioner, but certainly from a legal perspective, we are experts. When we talk about individuals involved in SAR, it is important, and, and I, I really become anal sometimes at this, and it depends on where you are in Canada, and having had the honor and privilege of teaching courses here, working with great individuals over many, many years, um, and up in the Yukon, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, I, I, I can tell you, and Ontario as well, um, that it is important that people build a foundation of having the education, training, and knowledge that they can do a function so regardless of what that function is, whether you're a team leader, a team member, SAR responder, SAR provider, SAR worker, or SAR manager, that you've got that academic background. 
But then you need to take it one step further and make sure that with that academic background and the knowledge that you're proficient, competent, and credible. The slide on the left that you see before you, and there's not many photos in this presentation, but there are some. The one on the left is the military Royal Canadian Air Force Sartex, the pararescue. And they are taking somebody across a very narrow mountainous passage in my neck of the woods. And when they have plane crashes, a lot of times we work very closely with our stakeholders and partners, and we assist them in moving a lot of equipment back and forth after they parachute in, and also with the extraction, taking the equipment out while they get picked up with the casualty by helicopter, which is usually the case. The photo on the right also attests to education, training, and knowledge, and being able to do the job. In Newfoundland, many of the cases we dealt with here and under the review and in talking to a number of individuals involve people that have traumatic injuries but also become hypothermic by being in the outdoors. And as we can see from this morning, that can happen all year round. And obviously we think about it in the winter time. But training in hypothermia prevention for your SAR team but also for treating individuals and how they should be treated and then how they should be the packaged and then evacuation management, getting them out, is crucial to the success and survival of our people that we're working for, those potential survivors. And that's a, a training photograph on the right. And you just don't do it once, you do it every month. You do it every week. You do it as often as you can because you're never done with training. And it's interesting because if you're in the military, more so than the RCMP, and more so than if you're with Alsara, you know, SRA and the RCMP, yeah, let's have a training course. We'll get that done this month. And there's your training aspect that's over with. In the military, though, they'll do this training scenario. They'll do the training regimen 100 times because they have the latitude to do that. Whether you're in the Army, Navy, or the Air Force, they do it time and time again. And the pararescue, the PJs, the uh, Sartex are a prime example. They are some of the best the best in the world with what they have to deal with, whether it's marine environment, uh, in the mountains, or in the Arctic. Uh, they train constantly, it never stops. A lot of us, though, in the civilian sector don't always have that luxury. We wish we did, but it is important still and ever to train and train hard and train like you would be in the environment. So when we get to that, I wanna stress that a good training development program, as you'll see later on in the slides, involves training 24 hours a day. So we'll tell the team that you're gonna meet at 2300 hours, 11 o'clock at night at the SAR building, and it may be 15 below and it may be snowing, but we're going out to train, because that's what we do. And you need to train as if you're in real world scenarios and cases. But the same goes for the overhead team. When you're in the overhead team as a SAR manager, incident commander, your operations, your planning, your logistics, it is important that you understand how to provide that command and control, how to provide that management, how to provide leadership, and then how do you articulate to a judge, him or her, about how you came to make that decision, either to stand down a SAR mission, continue on a SAR mission, send a team in this area and not send a team in that area. You know, you need to be able to have the ability to articulate decision making and have a process to do that. So those are the things that are plaguing the SAR managers, the ops sections chief in those command posts or in the emergency operations centers time and time again. And we really need to make sure that they're good at doing what they do as well through practice and exercises. Real world exercises in the field with people actually out there you know, engaged using aircraft and also people in the uh, backcountry, but also tabletop exercises. And you just can't get enough of those and those scenario-based uh, tabletop exercises so you can make the proper decisions, provide leadership, management, and provide command and control and the documentation to support it. These slides, as you can see going forward right now, it was mentioned to me before, and I, and I agree, um, they're not specific to Newfoundland in, in so much as they are specific to critical incidents, incident management, and SAR management, search and rescue management. I, in discussion with Learned Counsel Jeffrey Budden, decided that we needed to put an education piece, an academic piece into this presentation, because once I get into the 
strength, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the threats facing Ansara and Newfoundland, and also the lessons learned and recommendations for Newfoundland and Labrador, you would then leverage back onto this education academic side to say, oh yes, that's what he was talking about and why we need that. So interspersed in this presentation of 90 some odd slides will be some academics so that you see where am I coming from and why do we need to do this. I often equate that acronym team, as you can see, is together emergencies are managed. And it is a team effort. There is no I in what we do. And the slide on the left is New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina. They lost the EOC. It was destroyed by the hurricane. And they had to move across and down the street to the Hyatt Regency Hotel and set up in a boardroom similar to what we're in today so they could run the emergency management for that parish and for the city. And they did very well, good a good job of doing that, but they had to bring in a lot of private sector personnel to do that. They had to bring in a lot of uh, interoperability with 13 other agencies to work in that EOC because a lot of the local folks had been taken out and they lost a lot of their property. Their family had to be moved. They couldn't function. The shot on the, on the right is what I love to do. And when you think back to working as a team and even going back into sledding, you've got a sled loaded with a couple hundred pounds of gear and you're on a multi-day expedition and trip. The dog driver, the dog puncher, the dog musher has to run beside the sled, run behind the sled, snowshoe out front, breaking trail in some cases, and then rely on the, on the dogs and the team or all do different things. The ones in front of the sled are called the wheel dogs. They're the big brutes that pull that sled and break it forward and free of the ice to, keep, to start things moving. The dogs in the middle are called team dogs, and they keep that momentum going and, and move that leverage down the trail. And of course, the ones behind the leaders are called swing dogs or point dogs, and they help the leaders make that G, ha, right or left turns. And the leaders are simply the ones that have the most between the ears, that can make that decision that when you're up in the Arctic and you wanna go in a reasonably straight line for a long period, a couple hundred kilometers, you wanna go in a very straight line. When you're crossing Great Slave Lake, you wanna be able to do that as well, and not zigzag all over the place. So it's important that you all work together, otherwise you're never gonna get anywhere. And it takes a lot of time, energy, training, and effort to make that happen, and SAR is exactly the same way. And I think about that often when you're running a sled. Uh, you get lots of time to think on your hands when you're behind those dogs. So we can talk about the law of the land here. And that's, it's been a big part of what we do. And, and these slides, again, are, are not like when I talk about due diligence, I've got 15 things to talk about due diligence. No, not, a, not at all, because we're all learned individuals here. But it's a matter of saying, there are certain things that we have to be accountable for, and that's that due diligence, responsibility, and accountability in public safety and search and rescue, to do the right thing time and time again. That leverages right back to that, having the education, the training, the knowledge, being proficient, competent, and credible with that academic side, and then providing the troops, your SAR personnel, the command and control, management, leadership, and then making the right decisions, whether you're a SAR worker, whether you're a team leader, or a SAR manager. We are working in the auspices of the Canada Labor Code. Uh, if you're working for the RCMP, that's a function under the Canada Labor Code. There are provincial labor codes, occupational health safety requirements. Mr. Harry Blackmore brought some of those up just the other day. And then there's the incident command system. So how do we get all these folks to work together with interoperability under one command and control system? And you'll see that the, that the favorite system in, in the G8 countries and how we run Olympics is using the incident command system. How we run the G8, G20s is using the incident command system. How we run incidents every day, critical incidents, involves the incident command system. So we're all doing the same thing. Like a lot of practitioners and academics, I'm a very voracious reader of after action reports, and there's a lot of them out there. Hurricane Katrina would be one, one of the largest peacetime emergency management disaster search and rescue responses, specifically in North America. There's the BP Gulf oil spill, very similar to the oil spill off the California coast now, but of a lot more significance. Then there's the Enbridge pipeline spill in uh, Michigan. Andrew Warburton's search and rescue mission in uh, July 1986 in Nova Scotia. Jesse Rinker, 
Alberta, Mount St. Helens, and then our public inquiry here in Newfoundland and Labrador. I'm just going to touch on some of these and some of the lessons learned. The reason we do that is there's some time between these incidents. And as I said at the very beginning here, if we do not change things now through this inquiry in search and rescue public safety in the province, when are they going to be changed? When are we going to have the best practices? When are we going to have that latest standard out there to go forward? Because if we don't do it, I'm showing you some examples of what's happened in the past, and some of these things still happen today. And, and in some of the cases that we dealt with, certainly they were back 10 years or more, and things have changed. Things are much better here. But there's always these lessons learned, and we talk about that through corrective action reports. Now, David M. Walker was a controller for the United States government, and David was that go-between the President of the United States and the Senate and Congress, and his job and his task was, after Hurricane Katrina, to come up with an after-action report. I don't have it here because it's about two inches thick. It's a good read, and everybody should read it who has a significant interest in incident management or emergency management. It is online. You can download it as a PDF file. But well, what's interesting about this is there are 125 lessons learned. And I thought to myself, I went through Hurricane Katrina. It was a very difficult hurricane to go through with, with people that I worked with in our EOC in Miami, realizing that we'd had 21 people die on our watch, citizens. But also the fact that the greatest nation in the world from a geopolitical standpoint at that time had all these lessons learned. And you would think that, wait a minute, how is that possible with all the money, the training that goes into emergency management, incident management? So David M. Walker took those 125 lessons learned and he broke it down into three main categories. And this goes right from the arriving firefighter to the police officer, to the SAR teams, to incident management, overhead teams. And he said, you know what? There was a lack of clear and decisive leadership right from the get-go from the ground level all the way up to Washington, right up to through FEMA. And we thought, well, that was interesting. But that's what he identified, and that was accepted from their hearings. In the further part of their Senate hearings, he said, you know what, there was also a lack of exercise planning, design, and implementation. In other words, you have this exercise, but it's something you want to get done in half a day or a day so you can have lunch or dinner and then go home and not really concentrate on what's really going to work for us in an exercise. What do we really need to do? Worst case scenario, not something we can get done in a few hours. And you just get the check in the box. And it's more than just the check in the box. It's making sure people can function and have interoperability when the, when the big one happens. And then he also said, you really have to understand the difference between having the capacity to do something and the capability. And what do you want to be to be successful? Uh, you want the capability. You don't necessarily need all that stuff. You may need to regulate what you have, <clears throat> but you need that capability to function in the field and to get the job done. For SAR, search and rescue volunteers here in Newfoundland get paid the big bucks to find clues for lost, missing, overdue people. That's, that's their major job, so you need to be good at it. With British Petroleum and Enbridge incidents, and Enbridge is a Canadian company based out of Calgary, Alberta. <clears throat> when they had the Marshall, Michigan incident, specifically, and they looked at the Talmadge Creek, which flowed into the major river system there, and it was a multi-day, multi-week, multi-month <laughs> uh, operations involving many, many agencies. I actually have some of the slides from that that we utilized. I got to spend three and a half months with the hearing and the inquiry for this through the Senate Hearing Committee for Environmental Protection. And it was a great opportunity to work with legal counsel, but also understand how things can improve going forward. And Enbridge stepped up to the plate and they said, we'll pay for everything. It's not an issue. We've made mistakes and these mistakes will be corrected. They bought homes. Then the, the cleanup was such a great job at the end, people said, I want my homes back on, on the creek. And so off they went. 
But what they realized in their mistakes were we didn't perform command and control very well. So here you end up having multiple incidents from multiple jurisdictions function during a large-scale North American incident, and most of the personnel in that incident were trained to what we call an incident command system I-100 or 200 level. Nowhere near enough to form and, and, and provide that service going on for multiple days. So they realized that they needed to train better in the incident command system. They could function for 24 hours, but once you start dealing with multiple agencies, multiple jurisdictions, and having to crank out multiple incident action plans for every operational period, which is every 12 hours, 24 hours a day this thing went, it never stopped, then you need people that can function in command and control. And that's a good lesson learned. And then the course training for the worst case scenario and not just simple things that could be over with a dike levy or a boom in half a day and we have lunch and go home. But look, we did our exercise according to the regulations. Well, uh, Richard, can you give us a, a short version of the, what the incident was all about and what the, uh, what the, uh, the uh, disaster was? Yes, sir, I will, because it was a $1.3 billion response by Enbridge out of Calgary. They took over a pipeline that was 35 years old that ran through Marshall, Michigan in the United States. And they did that so they could move their product from Alberta, from Fort McMurray, down to, through Texas, to Cushing, Michigan, and then down through Texas. And it was a business arrangement. Because they took over an older pipeline, it, it ended up crossing under, uh, through rivers and creeks, and the original went through, went, went through, through Talmash Creek. And it was buried, but most people don't realize that pipelines are only l buried in Canada anywhere from three feet to six feet deep. If they cross uh, through a water course, it'll still be only three to six feet deep under the bed of that river. And the Talamash Creek had dropped its flow, and not that the pipeline was exposed, but a lot of the rocks and the material overburden at, at the base uh, underneath the water was still there. And some of the good old boys in these big monster trucks have been crossing that creek and some of the rocks have been pounded down and then eventually the pipeline was punctured and they lost integrity on the pipeline that crossed Talmash Creek. And it actually affected a large um, lake and a reservoir, large tourism recreation area and many, many acreages in Marshall, Michigan. So it was a pipeline that ruptured, Commissioner. And so there's a lot of work involved with a lot of different types of equipment. So now you're talking about the private sector being called in, uh, Environmental Protection Agency, state health, federal health, uh, fish and wildlife, uh, volunteer groups, and residences, emergency management agencies, both federal, state, and local. And you have to work with all of them to function to solve the problem. And that's what Enbridge had to, to do. Bill Loki, being a dear friend from, for many, many years, um, he was actually the director of FEMA for Hurricane Katrina. He was the fall guy. The person in charge of FEMA was a guy named Brown, and he wasn't going to take the fall, so unfortunately Bill Loki did. And Bill's already admitted that. It's a public record. It's open source information. That's why I can say that. Bill's a, a great American. He has spent many, many years in emergency management, incident management. And his way of cutting his teeth was back in May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens. When it blew its lid, which isn't too far from British Columbia and Alberta, it was a worldwide volcanic eruption because it affected the world. And you can think of all the aircraft that are affected now by volcanoes it's going off and how it affects our environment. But it was a very long 72-day mission where he worked in the Emergency Operations Center of the state of Washington with the governor. She was behind him and beside him the whole entire time with a good close personal friend of mine, Rick Lavalla, who owns ERI International. And when they went through all this, they were dedicating primarily SAR personnel out around Mount St. Helens to find all the people that have been displaced from the volcano. And you have to understand that Mount St. Helens, when you see those original pictures, just like looking at Mount Adams, Mount Hood, and, and uh, today, 
deals with snow and ice on top of the mountain. And of course, once you get the volcano going off, you get this lahar. And this lahar goes out because everything melts instantaneously and then starts to slide down and flow and takes everything with it. And you also have those pyrocastic type blasts that goes out from the volcano as well, which just levels everything. So now you've got a catastrophic event. You've got a lot of SAR personnel out there from a wide variety and cadre of disciplines looking for people. But Bill realized partway through communications is an issue. Couldn't speak to the Forest Service, couldn't speak to the Park Service, couldn't speak to police and fire and EMS, couldn't even speak to the SAR guys. It was almost like going back to the Pony Express days of running messages back and forth. So communications was an issue in incident management, emergency management, SAR management. There was an ambiguity of authority. And what that really means in our incidents here is who's in charge? Who's in charge of search and rescue? Who's in charge of this incident that we've identified here? And the ambiguity of authority is a whole bunch of people in this case stepped up and said, well, we're the Forest Service, we're in charge. Somebody else would say, well, we're Environmental Protection Agency, we're in charge. The military stood up and said, no, no, we're in charge. So it was a problem. And you don't want that ambiguity of authority. You, you want to make sure that you know ahead of time through field operating guides, standard operating procedures, and planning as to who's going to be in charge, who's primary, secondary, and who's tertiary for these incidents. <clears throat> but Bill also realized they had a whole bunch of people come out of the woodwork. And what I mean by that is they had a whole lot of spontaneous, convergent volunteers. And if you spend a lot of time in emergency management, you realize that your initial first responders, whether it's a tornado, hurricane, a disaster, are the people on the block or on the street. They're going to get organized, they're going to get formed up, and they're going to start helping people. They're not going to wait for police, fire, and EMS to show up. They're going to start doing things on their own. And it may not be the right thing, but they're going to start doing it. But also when you have an incident like a large-scale incident like Mount St. Helens, they're going to go out there and start digging and being involved. And you're talking thousands of people. Well, you better have a plan for that. You better have a plan for that early and not wait for it to happen. And that was a key thing is you better have an understanding of who are these convergent, spontaneous volunteers? And I know uh, Mr. Paul French and Roger Gooby uh, from Nassara and I have had conversations specifically as, yeah, boy, we have that missing five-year-old and we had people coming out of the woodwork and we needed to scramble. To, how are we going to deal with all these neighbors who want to go out there now and look for the missing five-year-old? And that's a problem. So it's planning. Also, Bill recognized that there was a misuse of specialized resources. Now, he identified that that came from canine being misused, divers, dive recovery being misused, uh, helicopters being misused, and we needed to do a better job of that. How are these resources going to be utilized? How should they be utilized? And you really only know that from meeting and greeting your resources ahead of time and fully understanding their capacity and capability and, you know, how can they be engaged? <clears throat> we often say that the alligators the media, they need to be fed. And I'm very straightforward and, and, and frank with all this because they have a role, the media is in business to make money. That's their job. And so with that, they, they do that through information, getting information out, that's how they make money. But if you don't control them, you don't have a plan for the media, you don't feed them, then they're gonna get their information and source it from somewhere else and it may not be what you want. And so Bill said, we need to do a much better job of understanding the media's role, responsibility, what they're here for, because we need to look after them and give them what we need to go out to the public so things function a lot better. And if I get a missing five-year-old from St. John's, I can tell you right now, you're going to get a lot of spontaneous convergent volunteers. The rovers are going to be inundated and having to babysit a whole bunch of spontaneous volunteers doing grid searches throughout the town and the city and the surrounding area. But what I want to have happen is I can get a word out through the media and say, by the way, folks, you can help out the rovers and search and rescue and the police by not coming out here and destroying any potential evidence and or clues. You can search your own backyards, your own houses, check everything, including your closets, your washing machines, your trucks, your cars, your campers. If you find something, please call this number. Call the RNC at this number. But don't come out here because you'll hamper the star effort. So that's being progressive and, and being having a plan with the media because that's what we're going to do through our public information officers that they don't have so many guys coming out. 
So that's been recognized now for many years, and I know it's been mentioned to me, and it was mentioned the other night when we did a presentation a week or so ago uh, by a senior rover that, heck, we have some of these problems still today. And some of the communities that we go and assist and help, yes, some of these things still occur. So I'll just talk about Sar Rinker. Jesse Rinker was a two and a half year old boy. He was the son of an American missionary family on the San Chalo Chiefs First Nation, northwest of Rocky Mountain House in Clearwater County, Alberta. Sar Rinker was a 15 day ground search and rescue operation. Not two days, 15 days. And at the end of those 15 days, as a police officer responsible for the incident management of that mission, we didn't find Jesse. We had no idea where he was. And we had searched a lot of area. And it was very frustrating. At some points, we had up to 1,300 people a day working and looking for little Jesse Rinker. We had tractor trailer loads full of food coming from McDonald's being delivered to the First Nation at any given time. It was a big operation. And my statement will be is, where the RCMP at that time failed, Roger and Karen Rinker, the parents was, we did not have enough adequate trained police officers in search and rescue. We didn't have enough adequate trained uh, police officers to work in the incident management team. And even though I had taken some uh, SAR management training in 1980, 81, 82 through Parks Canada, up on Wood Buffalo National Park, and it was a great uh, advantageous ability to be able to do that, it was given to me in the task to do this. And plus I had some military search master training. Um, they said, Smith, here you go, you're gonna run this, and off we went. But we didn't have enough trained officers to really get involved in doing it. So we learned some hard lessons. And part of those hard lessons was, we need to change and have a RCMP policy in search and rescue, because back in 1986, there was no RCMP policy in search and rescue. It was an assumed role. We've been doing it since 1873. There was nothing written. The first RCMP SAR policy didn't get written and published until 1st of April, 1995. And I know council will probably check on that, and that's fine, because those are the facts. And I was very proud to work with a great team of individuals to help produce some of that policy. There's five of us that did it. But Rinker is the one that stuck in my mind as a police officer as to why are we here and what are we doing? Yeah, who, do we, who are we working for? and you're working for all those Jesse Rinkers. And so it was understanding the lack of training and knowledge in SAR. Wasn't enough of it out there. We lacked resource management, bringing all those resources in to get the job done. We did not form and have command and control very well. We didn't manage our <clears throat> documentation, information flow and coordination. And lucky enough, we had the Forest Service to give us a hand with some of that to keep us out of trouble because the Forest Service is being used in the incident command system since the mid 1970s. And then interoperability. We had the Canadian military involved in this, both the Air Force, the Army. We had the British Army involved in that search. We had parks, fish and wildlife, forestry. We had hundreds of police officers, and we were all going out there on a Type 3 grid search, looking shoulder to shoulder and pushing the bush, looking for Jesse Rinker. And so that started my public safety thinking and career thinking of, I think there's a better way of doing business. I better find some folks that we can work on to go forward on that. And that's what we did. Andy Warburton was a young boy back in July 1986 where a great friend of mine, Ken Hill, who is a, was a professor emeritus now at St. Mary's University, Nova Scotia, realized that that also was seven days in July where they didn't find Andy Warburton until that seventh day. And in discussions with Ken Hill over the years, they realized as well they made some of the same mistakes. So back in 1986, that kind of changed our perspective in Canada as to how are we going to do SAR? There's got to be some better ways of doing business. We've got to move forward. And this piece is in here, and, and, and the questions are fine, as to What's really changed since 1986? What, are we, what have we done? And, and I think sometimes we need to look at ourselves and have more meetings and reflect and look inside and say, we need to keep going forward, being modern, progressive, proactive, and changing 
as things evolve, because our enemy out there is a live, breathing, ever-changing entity. It, it never changes, all these lost, missing people. And, and again, with the advent of snowmobiles being able to go long distances, ATVs now, side-by-sides, off-highway vehicles, that changes the dynamics of how and, and, and where we're gonna look to get things done. So that gives you an idea of some of the original lessons learned and some of the foundations for you know, why am I here and why did I stay in SAR and why have I moved on and why have like-minded people done the same thing and I think Mr. Harry Blackmore is, is, feels the same way. With, you know, we've, we've looked at this and said, yes, we, we're gonna get involved. I was very privileged and honored back in 2001 to have lunch with Prince Charles. And there we are in Ottawa, <clears throat> we're at a table um, and we're having lunch and, and, it, and it, it was a wonderful, wonderful occasion to be able to be awarded Canada's SAR Volunteer of the, year, of the Year back in 2001. And as a SAR practitioner, as a volunteer, I never expected that. You don't do what you do for medals, rewards, or, or profit, really. You just try and make a difference. But he asked me, and there was 10 other people at our table, you know, he said, I've flown SAR missions in the UK. I've flown the Sea Kings, and why are you in search and rescue? And I basically said, it's for love. Love for my community love for my province, love for my country, love to make a difference in people's lives. And, and we've heard that through this hearing from Makovic all the way down here to St. John's. And people often say in the interviews we've had as to, it's to provide a service to my community. It's, it's to give something back is what a lot of folks have said. But that's love, that's, that's respecting your community and, and, and being a part of it and not apart from it. So that's a big part of what we're dealing with here, these volunteers. <clears throat> so command and control has to be a standardized system. And I say that because in some jurisdictions with uh, other agencies, they've embraced a British system called bronze, silver, and gold. Uh, other people will use a fire uh, ground command system instead of a incident command system. And it, incident command system is recommended as best practices by Public Safety Canada in their documentation on incident management, SAR response, it's in there. It's recommended in provinces as best practices. It's policy in some provinces through emergency management under regulations. And in some provinces, it's legislation that you will use the incident command system if you're gonna work in critical incidents here in the province. But it's not the same throughout the country. <clears throat> we have gaps. But it allows you to have continuity in operations, it lends consistency to what we're doing, uh, it makes us efficient, effective, and economic, and also provides direction for our resources. And it is important to note that very seldom do we ever work with single agency, single jurisdiction. More often than not, in, in Pacific to SAR here, it's single agency, but multiple uh, resources. And it can be multiple jurisdiction if you start dealing with Parks Canada. So it's good to have a command and control system in place before an incident occurs, and everybody's up to speed and trained to that. So again, there's no ambiguity when we come out. There's everybody working under command and control. They know who is the IC, who's incident command. They know who's the command staff, who is information safety liaison and who is the scribe. They know who's operations, they know who's planning, they know who's logistics, they know who is looking after the administration side and that is set up ahead of time so that we can function and not make mistakes. If you don't set up command and control right from the get-go, you're gonna lose it. And that's not what we want to see happen. <clears throat> so when we mentioned about the incident command system, it's not just one thing. And that's what's unique about it. That's what's so great about it. And more often than not, people will say, well, that system failed because of this, that, or the other. But what they don't realize, it wasn't used correctly. It wasn't used properly. But it is a combination of facilities all sorts of different types of facilities, from staging areas to base camps, to emergency operation centers, to command posts, to a host of different types of equipment to do a specific function on a, on a mission, to personnel who are trained to do the job, to making sure that you have procedures, to make sure that we can communicate, that we are working within a common organizational framework and structure, again, so that everybody knows who reports to who, and that all the resources out there are gonna be efficient, effective, but they meet 
the requirements of our stated mission goals and objectives, because there's no use doing any of this unless we're all working to find that lost missing subject. You want to find Sally Sanchez by 2400 hours. She's a little three-year-old that's missing, and you want to be able to do that. And that's important, because if we're not working with those state of mission goals and objectives, well, it's all for nothing. So when we talk about the combination of, of facilities and equipment, the incident command system is that command and control system, and it should be embraced and utilized on every mission. And I'll explain some other things as we go along here, because when I start talking about a mistake was made here, this is what's been identified to me, this is what I'm recommending, it, it falls right back to this here, command and control. But, so realistically though, if I am a incident commander from the police, for, for sake of argument, if I am that SAR manager, who's the ops sections chief on behalf of the police, I really just need to recognize what needs to be done and then take the appropriate action. I need to find Sally Sanchez by 2400 hours and I need to develop a plan to do that involving all of those people, information and a support structure to make that happen. It's quite simple. It's nothing more than that. And people get way too complicated about what is command and control. And there's an academic side, in there, but there's a practitioner based side and that's what it is right there. But as I mentioned, it, there's different elements working together. And this effective harmonious actions means that everybody plays in the sandbox together. And I, I'll use this example. It doesn't mean that the Royal Canadian Air Force is in this part of the sandbox. It doesn't mean that the RCMP is in this side of the sandbox. It doesn't mean that the Coast Guard, Coast Guard Auxiliary over here, and the NSAR is down over here, doing each and all their own thing with their own command and control systems trying to work on this problem. No, it means that everybody is playing and working together to solve the problem those, on those mission goals and objectives. And that's a key. That is interoperability. And interoperability means it's people, it's information, and it's a support structure that functions to solve our stated mission goals and objectives. Support structure looks at training, education. It looks at doctrine. And I know um, my learner counselor here, Jeff Budden, mentioned the other day that I've got a lot of props on the table in front of me. I have a lot of books on the table in front of me because those are some doctrine materials that support standard operating procedures, field operating guides, how things can be done, who reports to who, whose job is it to do what. Everybody knows a role, responsibility, and duty. This structure and control system does not exist solely on its own, but it's to help people recognize, as I just said, what needs to be done and they take the appropriate action. Now, information flow and coordination has always been a bugbear of mine, working in my background over the years. It's given me some latitude to say certain things. Um, similar to what you're going through here now in this hearing, I've had meetings with senior ministers of the Executive Cabinet Council in Alberta recently. Um, and it's interesting because people will say, I thought we already had that. I thought we had that doctrine. I thought we were there with this information. And sometimes you have to educate and get your point across and say, no, we don't have that. It still needs to be developed. But it is how we're going to do business. It's symbols, it's words, it's images, it's ideas, it's values. It's all those things. And one way or another it brings command and control to get that information out. And to be useful, and information to be useful, is that old adage is, you know, information to be useful must be shared, and it must be shared with others. So when that team in the field who's looking for the missing five-year-old here in Newfoundland and Labrador all of a sudden finds a shoe, finds a granola bar wrapper, that information must be relayed back to the command post, to the overhead team, ops, planning, logistics, to the IC. And if that information goes back to the overhead team because they have goals and objectives, they have strategy, they have tactics, and they have priorities for all of those, they're going to all of a sudden say, you know what, that information came back from the field. We need now to modify and adjust our strategy and tactics as the mission moves forward based on these clues that are coming in from this hasty team. So information is crucial. 
And otherwise, it doesn't allow you to be flexible in your plan. It doesn't allow you to modify and adjust your plan as the mission unfolds. And you have to do that, because now I'm going to say, guess what? We're going to put a canine team now ahead of that hasty team to look for that lost person, because it looks like that's the direction of travel. But it's shared information. Now, effective search and rescue management is fairly straightforward. Most people get this wrong. They kind of glob all the things with objective strategy and tactics together, and they need to keep them separate. So again, when I'm reviewing something, and I know Paul French will reiterate on this, I am very anal when I ask for something or a discussion on an item. And it's like, okay, we didn't, and I'm not saying Paul French did this, don't, this is just an example, from, because we had great discussions. But he understands that, yeah, objectives are something completely different than the strategy and the tactic. So when you walk into a command post, objectives are, what are we here to do and why? That's really what it's all about. What am I here to do and why? And that's like find Sally Sanchez by 2400 hours, by midnight. That's what we want to do. The strategy means how are we going to do it. The tactics is the who, the where, and the when. But when I have those objectives, like I have on the slide here, the important piece is what am I going to do first, second, third, fourth, and fifth, all the way down to number 12, let's say as an example. You prioritize all your objectives. That's a key thing, because if you don't do that, you can get them mixed up. Now, you can change some of those based on information coming back from the field. That's fine, but at least you're going to prioritize what you want to do. And then you assign the resources, canine, helicopter with a forward-looking infrared and a trained observer, a night sun, tracking teams, containment, confinement teams. I'm going to assign those resources out there to go find Sally Sanchez. That's important. So effective search and rescue management also means that that IC and the ops section chief, the SAR commander, must maintain situational awareness. They're in a command post. They're in an EOC. They're not, they're not looking outside. The hasty team out there searching for this missing three and a half or five year old, they're the senses for the people in the overhead team. They've got to relay stuff back of what they're seeing out there. Otherwise, the planning side of the house won't be able to get, make decisions. They can't do the advanced planning for the next operational period and continue on and on and on, et cetera. So they have to have situation awareness. I mentioned command staff having a scribe. Anybody that's been involved in a major incident, and there are some individuals here that have been involved in major incidents, and I, and I have a great respect for those individuals, they know they want a scribe. And that scribe is attached to their hip and goes everywhere they go to make sure that every time you give out a task, order, assignment, you interview somebody, you get their, a message over the radio, that's documented, because that gives you situational awareness of where are you at with the mission. If I don't have situational awareness with the mission, I will lose that command and control, and then the mission's going to gain control of me. And as I mentioned before, you don't want that. There is a situation report unit leader under the planning section chief in the incident command system. That function provides you situation awareness of where you're at with your mission goals and objectives and the overall mission from briefings, debriefings, what teams have accomplished what, and, and if they come back and go through a debriefing process. So the scribe is a different process than the sit situation report unit leader. But again, it comes back to information flow and coordination and documentation. How can I do a transfer of command from one overhead team incident management team of IC, ops, planning, logistics, finance administration to another team if I don't have documentation on our plan, our goals and objectives, strategy and tactics, and what we plan to do the next ops so that they know what their task is. I, I got to have that down there because we are running SAR missions 24 and 7, typically regardless of the weather. There are some instances where we might have to stand down because the risk outweighs the benefit. But you know, more often than not, we're 24 and seven. And then decision making. So I mentioned this before, and it comes up more often than not with civil litigation liability, but decision making is how it come you came to make that decision. And it gets asked a lot to the police when they talk about, they're the IC, did you stand the SAR mission down? How to come you did that? 
and the police know this from being involved with critical incidents when they talk about shoot, don't shoot. How come you made that decision? So it is crucial that we understand that. Now, there are a lot of factors that affect SAR management. Because critical incidents by their very nature are dangerous, dynamic, they're complex, and, and they're confusing. Here's a Sea King. Yes, it's a British Sea King, but that's fine. When I was working with the Mountain Rescue Association in Northern England, they were still using their aircraft here a few years ago. But if you look at that photograph, this is your mountain rescue. This is your guys involved with on the rocks, and there are a number of them with lines laid down to get an injured climber who's fallen a great distance, and they're being hoisted and winched up to that aircraft. And that aircraft is in hover effect. So you're either 100% doing this, or you are toast. So it's important for the mountain rescue team to know that. It's important for, I know the air crews know this, but that working relationship, that interoperability. So you want to call in these assets, you need to train with them. You need to study and understand how everybody works, how everybody functions, everything involved. Otherwise, when things go wrong, they go wrong real fast. And that's not what you want to happen in that particular case. There's always going to be a threat to our responders. So I comment on the helicopter extraction transportation system. Uh, I've done it. I was on the RCMP's mountain rescue team back in the 80s. And I've done it with our mountain rescue association team. And it is a young person's game. That is for sure. I don't do it anymore. But when you're slinging, as I just mentioned, working with that Sea King aircraft, you have to be 100%. You're hoisting, and now you're being slung underneath a aircraft. This is a Bell 407 on a Class D live sling using the HEX system, as Mr. Harry Blackmore mentioned yesterday. There is no margin for error. You've got to be 100% all the time. And it takes training. That training takes money. But there's a threat to the responders in doing that. It becomes quite high risk. Are there other ways of doing the business? So it must be evaluated and a risk assessment must be completed. But there's also a threat to the citizens that you're out there to complete the search and rescue mission on. If things go wrong, it's going to go wrong for them too. And it goes real fast. So they're dangerous, dynamic, complex, and confusing. They're dynamic because there's constant changes. One of those things was what struck me in Makovic, and I was, it was a real honor and a pleasure to be there in, in that great community, but also to work with the Barry Andersons of the world, to have Barry take me around and show me the places they looked physically out there in the bite and in those areas, and to walk all the trails in those communities, to walk around that community and have a look at everything that was there. It reminded me of being back up in the Arctic, but when you talk about constant changes, you talk about under the winter and under those conditions that were there with the ice out on the bay, all of a sudden now you have a large open lead that may or may not been there before. Those complexity analysis factors compound our search and rescue here in Newfoundland. Having had the privilege as well as hiking some of the four places here on, on, the, on the East Coast Trail, spending some time doing that, the weather crashes here. Well, that's a complexity analysis factor. The boardwalk is broken. It doesn't work. Well, if the park doesn't work, fix it. But there's a potential there for somebody to get injured. There's a potential under the rain conditions, like early this morning and other times, to slip down those slippery slopes. But those emergency situ situations are dynamic because of environmental atmospheric conditions that are constantly changing us. And nothing is cast in stone. We don't always get the right information that you want immediately at the beginning onset of a search and rescue mission. Um, people think that you have all the facts that you have now after five weeks of our hearings and this commission. You don't. It's not possible. Uh, you must investigate, as the police will often tell you, but information comes from all of a sudden somebody out of the woodwork who wasn't there before and tells you, I found a track. Oh, okay, I didn't know that before. I found a footprint. I found a backpack. I found a jacket. Those things change what you're doing. They're all time critical situations, and it does result in changing operational modes and priorities, 
as you go through a mission, things change. Your plans are also are not cast in stone. And I haven't looked at all some of the plans and all the notes from SAR managers. They made and they articulated quite well, all their notes. And that also comes from the policing agencies and the military agencies who did a fantastic job with their notes documenting the cases we reviewed. But it's a matter you can see the changes that occurred based on information. And so things aren't always up front with, I have all this data, I don't have that data. It doesn't come in that way. I have to struggle, I have to get it, I have to reach out and I have to dig for it. Here in the province, those complexity analysis factors, and complexity analysis factors really means that things that change your mission in a heartbeat. Here it is, sudden severe weather. More so than most places that I can think of. Yes, it happens in the Arctic. Yes, it happens on the West Coast. Uh, but realistically, you know, it's like, wow. All of a sudden, to me, the fog rolled in here. How am I gonna do things in this fog locally? All of a sudden now the overburden has changed because it is extremely wet and slippery for guys moving cascade toboggans and rescue litters back and forth. All of a sudden now we have, as you had in Makovic, you have ground fog. You can't see down through it. You had that up in the peninsula as well for the missing snowmobilers. Ground fog moving in. You had snow and sleet and you had cold temperatures come in. You had SAR personnel falling in open leads in the ocean. Lucky enough, they had the training and equipment on to be able to get out, risking those lives to save the lives of others. But that sudden weather, and it's always changing on us. And sometimes we often forget that. And I think we need to be incumbent in the fact that, hey, um, we need to prepare for the worst, and that's why that training is important. The mountain rescue here, you have mountain rescue here is no different than our mountain rescue. The difference we may have is that we're at 8,000 to 10,000 feet doing a lot of the helicopter extractions and altitude. But your mountain rescue here with the rocks, up north in Labrador as well, you get up the Torngat Mountains, is exactly the same as what we have out in the Rocky Mountains. It's no different. And it takes that technical capability and capacity with the equipment to do the job. That's a key to being successful. Winter search and rescue, yeah, it's tough. And one of the things that struck me in Makovic is, and, and, and I'll mention Barry Anderson's name, he's a fine gentleman indeed, telling me that we looked at the RCMP officer and we said to him, yes, you gotta come with us on this airplane crash, but not dress like that. And they outfitted him in all the proper clothing so a police officer could go to the plane crash because he didn't have the equipment. And he really didn't have the full training and they were gonna look after him with everything they had. That made a difference because it was a winter side of the house and it was changing as well. It was a blizzard condition. And that was mentioned by Mr. Harry Blackmore yesterday about them going out on snow machines. Could barely see the tail light of the, of the machine in front of them. They're, they're actually navigating by global positioning systems and in reach, and lucky enough, they were trained to do that. But your air and marine incidents here, yeah, there's a reason why the Coast Guard and, and the Royal Canadian Air Force called GSAR to give them a hand. You know, at the end, it doesn't really matter who finds the lost, missing, overdue, or down missing aircraft or ship at sea, and we've seen that recently with what's happened here with the, with the Marine side. We all need to work together under the mandated tasking agencies. We can all make a difference. We can all contribute in one way or another. And there are great examples here in Newfoundland Labrador where that has occurred. Because you see the photo here where the rigid hull inflatable is going up with souls on board and yeah, things go sideways. And they go sideways in a hurry, but it's also that technical expertise to look around the shores and everybody working together. Mass casualty incidents are never nice to be in. They do change your life forever. And that is important to note. <coughs> But you can have a mission within a mission. And this is where the training is important on factors that affect SAR management here. Because if I just went through this and said, okay, here's what I've learned, here's who I've interviewed, here's what I think you should do, thank you very much, I'm out of here, that's not gonna solve the problem. This background is, is crucial. So I mentioned to you about Jesse Rinker, May 1986. Andy Warburton, July 1986, my friend Ken Hill. June 1986, June 13th, was also a day I remember. 
We got a call that, from a ground search and rescue RCMP perspective, I was an RCMP officer, to go to Canmore RCMP detachment in Alberta, just outside of Banff. There was an incident in Kananasis country, which is just outside of Banff National Park. There had been a plane crash, Orville Paul, a biologist and the pilot was missing overdue. Well, this was an Air Force case. What are we doing? Well, the weather kind of comes and goes. There's a lot of high winds going across the rocks. And they want a hand with interviewing people at campgrounds, hiking trails, to see if they've heard or smelled anything out on the ground for this missing overdue small Cessna 162 that was doing wildlife surveys for sheep in the rocks, in the Rocky Mountains. I said, okay, we can organize to do that. I'm a team leader, let's get at her. Let's, let's, let's make a difference here. And off we went. On Sar Wolf, Sar Orville Paul, we had 13 people die. So the important thing to consider is we lost six from Casera that day. We lost military personnel and we lost two other aircraft in looking for one. So what we do out there is it's difficult. It's very interesting in, in certain aspects. But with that, I was one of the individuals, along with a gentleman named Chris Butler, who was a park ranger, who got to go to the site of the twin auto crash that, that the military owned, that they had many, many individuals, they had nine individuals on board. And they were looking for the other aircraft. And there was another aircraft that crashed looking for the first aircraft. So we had 13 casualties and they all had to be dealt with. That was a mission within a mission. Those things can occur when you are pushing the envelope time and time again in SAR. So multiple agency responses require a lot of command and control coordination, as I've mentioned. They really do. But all those things stuck with me as to, this is a fight to make sure we in policing, we in SAR do the right thing, always. And then in natural disasters, and I mentioned about the Alberta floods, and, and I know one province always likes to say something about another province, but Alberta really is the disaster capital of Canada. Just ask the Insurance Bureau of Canada. Because of the number of tornadoes, floods, wild and urban fire interfaces, Fort McMurray, Slave Lake, uh, billions of dollars of damage there. Uh, SAR has always been, and has been since our Edmonton Sherwood Park tornado, the backbone of responding to natural disasters. Mr. Harry Blackmore mentioned that Public Safety Canada has now finally realized that we can use SAR for natural disasters. Yeah, you can. It's been done in British Columbia and Alberta for a whole bunch of years. You don't always have to use the military. There are better ways of doing business with trained personnel. So that's a thing where our, that's part of it there, SAR in natural disasters, but you have to be trained to do that. You will get confusion on a SAR incident through SAR management when you get conflicting reports. You know, I don't think I've been on a perfect SAR mission. Mr. Budden here said to me, you know, Richard, you have a lot of experience. Well, that experience comes from making mistakes. And I don't think I've ever been on a perfect mission. Something invariably always goes wrong. It may be just a documentation is not right. It may be that you wish you would have sent a team up a, a certain area at a certain time. It may be because, you know, you failed to document something yourself. You failed to have a relief ahead of time. So those are things that are important, but when you start getting those conflicting reports, you've got to work through them and you've got to have a team that's available to do that. You can't do it all by yourself. It's not a one person job. But you get these unanticipated events occur. I mentioned to you about the 13 people dying in Sar Wolf, Sar Paul. There was another mission in our neck of the woods and it was a close call. We had a helicopter main rotor strike with our SAR personnel on board a machine going in to rescue somebody off a rock between two sets of falls in Crescent Falls by the Bighorn First Nation. And we pulled off the potential survivor, the casualty. The person was treated for hypothermia and then met her back to a hospital by another machine. But we then going back to pick up our rescue personnel, the one person left on the rock, to make a long story short, the rope had come up 
and struck the rotor on the A-Star B-3 helicopter. We were so fortunate that the A-Star rotors turned opposite to a Bell product and that rope happened to come out and it broke away uh, down the bottom and not near the curb mantle in the middle. So that also made a difference. So the pack and the rope went downstream and the other part of the rope went flying up on top, top of a cliff. That machine now had to land right away. And I heard that talk on the radio from the pilot saying, I can't believe that's just happened. I can't believe that just happened. But it happened so fast when you're doing the job. And these are volunteers on board the deck of that aircraft and board that aircraft trying to save a life of another. And now your volunteers, your friends, are there with their life on the line. Anticipated event security. Now we have a mission within a mission, again. You also don't get adequate information. It's not gathered or it's not relayed. So some of the problems with our management personnel is we're not relaying enough and gathering enough information. You can't have enough information to do this job. But it takes time, it takes personnel to do that. And as I get into later slides, I'll stress one more time, this is why you need multiple incident management teams, not just one. You don't establish comms. Some of the comments that were made to me here in Newfoundland was, we can't talk to the military. We've got to go through this, or we've got to go through that. And you need to have that direct link. You've got to be able to talk directly to police, fire, EMS, and military, Coast Guard. So we need to improve that. And of course, if you don't establish the comms, and you don't do it properly with all your working stakeholders, people in the SAR sector, it's going to create problems. So our incident priorities are always going to be the life of the rescuer, life of the rescuer team. Safety comes first. I go back to the Makovic incident where that search and rescue member fell in the open lead in those icy waters. They got him out. They dealt with it. But you've got to stabilize that incident. Stabilizing an incident for SAR a lot of times for, means containment, confinement. How do we stop this area from getting bigger? How do we stop that person from getting up and moving to a different area so that we can go find them? And then we worry about the property, the ships at sea, the aircraft. Those things are at the end. We, we talk about the lives first. So there are certain factors that are here. And these things are, happen as, as critical incidents unfold. They create the potential for injury or loss of life. I've given you some examples already. I give you the example of property damage. Well, I, I might break a ski. I could damage a snowmobile. That happened on, on the one up on the, on the peninsula. The snowmobiles were damaged. They couldn't see where they were going. They rolled the machines. We lose an inReach worth $825. You know, there's property damage. There's environmental damage. That sometimes we do that to save a life. But a lot of things that are out there can have a long-term impact on the agency. This hearing will have a long-term impact on agencies. I believe that. But it will result in a culture of change, which is good. Jesse Rinker, Sar Wolf, and Sar Paul had a long-term impact on the agencies and personnel that worked there for those missions. You must control the situation or it's going to control you. So that results in a constant risk assessment that never ends. You do a risk assessment, and maybe mentally, before you send the troops out, but you also want to document it. And pre-planning, where do you want to send everybody based on objective strategy and tactics? And then a lot of prior training. That's important to control those incidents. If you don't have those things going, then how are you going to control the incidents? It's going to be too loose. Things are going to be out of control. And you're there to bring order to chaos. And that's a key to being successful. Now, there's a great quote I want to give you before we, uh, I'll ask the learning counselor here before we take a little bit of a break. And this is a great quote which pertains to search and rescue. You gain strength courage, and confidence by every experience in which you really stop to look fear in the face. The danger lies in refusing to face the fear and not daring to come to grips with it. You must take and make yourself succeed each and every time. You must do the thing you think you cannot do. Eleanor Roosevelt was right, and she gave some fantastic advice to her husband, President of the United States, but that's exactly where we're at. Guys are coming to the line. They're facing that danger. 
and they're looking it in the face and they're making decisions to save the life of others. We'll uh, take a break now for 15 minutes. Thank you.
you mentioned that. Yeah, those it's the academic are, site sometimes. Uh, but. All rise. This Commission of Inquiry is now in session. Please be seated. Yes, Mr. Commissioner, uh, Mr. Smith will now continue with his presentation. Thank you. Commissioner, uh, so I had the honor to um, develop an appreciation understanding of the capacity and capability of Newfoundland search and rescue teams uh, throughout the province. And I did not take that lightly. It involved interviewing uh, members of the executive for Ansara in this particular case, and also a large number of search and rescue team coordinators throughout the province. In other words, on the island and also in Labrador. But it also resulted in the reviewing of search and rescue missions and mission reports and pouring over those documents and then making a lot of other phone calls going back. And I know Mr. Blackmore is probably getting tired of me calling him on several issues. And I know I've done that with other members as well, search and rescue coordinators, but they've been very gracious in offering the facts and answering the questions. And so this is part of the objectives and strategies of, of, of the hearing and why I was here. I uh, also participate in the public in inquiry hearings, and that also allowed us to gather information and, and take notes from the testimony of SAR responders uh, from Makovic and other locations, and really understand the role, responsibilities, and duties in Newfoundland and Labrador for tasking agencies and assisting and cooperating agencies uh, through the hearing and the hearing uh, process. To look at this information and then just try and correlate it and throw it together in a report doesn't always work. So we need to do a, an analysis and one of the tools that's out there to do analyses is, is called SWOT, S-W-O-T, which is for strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and, and threats. And I, and I use that model because it fits in a little better to the public safety realm, more so, um, but business uses that as well. We develop recommendations from the goals and objectives for, uh, for presenting at the policy and procedures hearings. So, so we have done that. So as you can see, I kind of fell almost on my academic side here, but there's also the, that education piece, and then we get into exactly what we did uh, to, to move forward. And you'll see that with the SWOT recommendations and also the ones at the, at the end. So these questionnaires were quite in depth. I had. Uh, the privilege of having most people on the phone for just over an hour. And again, they were very forthcoming. And uh, what I also appreciate was the SAR members being open, frank, and honest. Uh, some of them certainly did say, well, I wouldn't want this to get out, or I just want you to know, and here's another example of, of this happened. And, uh, and I felt that was great, because um, you want to be correct, and you want to be clear uh, when you start giving statements from lessons learned and recommendations. We also can, had the questionnaires and interviews with the RCMP and the RNC SAR coordinators, and there was some great cooperation there, without a doubt, uh, open and frank again, and also dealing with policy and, and procedures. Attended a, a number of Ansara SAR team facilities and participated in discussions with team members and also their executive members throughout the province. That also allowed us to look at equipment and have those open and frank discussions with those members as well. Reviewed hundreds of documents and exhibits submitted, uh, and, and also exhibits submitted from the government of, of Newfoundland and Labrador, but also documents submitted by legal counsel, documents submitted by the RCMP and RNC, and then attended meetings and discussions with the inquiry's legal counsel. So that kind of put us together the strategy. The objectives were, you know, what are we here to do and why? And now the strategy is, how were we gonna get it done? And that's my final slide there to, uh, to make that uh, happen. 
There is something I want to just mention here regarding the ground search and rescue teams, and, and it comes from working with some really fine men and women and, and the individuals that are there. Sometimes the term volunteer brings with it a lack of recognition, maybe a lack of respect, and, 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 but the phrase that SAR responder, SAR provider, and SAR worker often does not. The search and rescue teams from Nain to Makovic, from Cornerbrook to the Avalon Peninsula deserve credit where credit is due. Search and rescue members of ASARA are some of the best trained SAR responders in, in Canada and have often pushed the limits on physical endurance to risk their lives to save the lives of another. This presentation going into the account and respectfully submits that we can all improve in some way or another by being modern, progressive, proactive and these things we do that others may live. The SWOT analyses, as I mentioned, deals with the strengths, weaknesses, uh, opportunities, and, and then those threats. And they're both internal and they are external. And from going through all that information, all the interviews uh, and those open and frank discussions, I was able to put this together. And this is specific to the teams in Newfoundland and Labrador. The SWOT analysis chart, just to kind of give you an example, that's a typical chart from SWOT. Uh, and it does work quite well. It's easy to jog that down from people and, and they will give you, you know, the, the three strengths and three weaknesses and three opportunities and what, what are the three threats they think is out there. <clears throat> and just to have those open and frank discussions was very, very meaningful and I respect and appreciate uh, the input from all the members. One of the things that came up the other day was talking about competency. And I want to make sure, because it was just brought up to me at the break as well, <laughs> and I respect that. Uh, age, you know, should not have any bearing at all. Competency shouldn't be the criteria, you know, not age, not gender, or, or affiliation. And we have members of our groups that are 74 years old, all the way down to the 18-year-olds uh, involved right now. And, and this slide just shows that we've had an Explorer Search and Rescue program for many years. That's the 14 to 18-year-old high school kids who get 15 high school credits for doing a SAR training program. And there they are without the bikes, finding three middle-aged men who were lost for more than 24 hours out on some trail system. So it's not always about the person longest in the rain. So as we start this process, I'll start with breaking it down to search and rescue skills, search and rescue leadership, and search and rescue management. And it was important to do that because they all encompass three levels of training, development, and experience. And that is important. Now, some of the strengths involved, again, this is Ansara, is a number of people with years of training. A high percentage of SAR responders have greater than 10 years on the job doing those functions as a searcher, search and rescue responder, SAR provider. Within those search and rescue skills, one of the other strengths I noticed was the experience of the instructors. 15 to 20 years, you know, with the team. They're long on the tooth. They've been there a while. Some of them were there from the inception of the team, from the start the beginning. Um, and with that being said, they were very, very good at their outdoor activities. Majority of them, to maintain that credibility that they had, um, spent a lot of time in the outdoors. Um, it was really, and, I, and I respect and appreciate the length of time they spent on a snow machine traveling from point A to point B in the, in the winter time and camping out and doing those things. They do all that to maintain their skills. They're constantly using it time and time again. One of the other strengths here is, is team equipment. There's a lot of team equipment. And I remember being in Grand Falls, Windsor and looking at all the team equipment up on the shelves there. And it was just really, really exciting. And to see all those packs that are loaded, ready to go. So a high percentage of the teams have their own group equipment so that they're not purchasing it individually. It helps keep down some of the costs and expenses. The teams do participate in exercises uh, outdoors and uh, also exercises such as tying knots. That's an exercise too. So they do spend time doing that. Uh, a lot of times they'll get together for a meeting and then there'll be a training night where they will have an exercise. There's a great embrace of new technology. And that new technology has been mentioned here before throughout the, the hearings deals with the inReach. But it's also the tactical tracking radios so that we know exactly where the team went. 
but it also deals with the Emmerich system that they have and also deals with not afraid to embrace new technology. A lot of times it's borrowed and, uh, and that's fine. They get to have a look at it. And we talk about geographic information systems for mapping and planning. Some groups uh, for their strengths are out there have good number of members in training. And this happens at different times. So each group, I know I had one or two or three members in training and then some, uh, as the Rovers would be example, I believe we had 18 to 20 members in training at this point in time. So that, that's a good thing. And, and it varies depending, of course, on the size of the group and the location. So those are some internal strengths that come from Ansara. Some of the weaknesses, it's lack of funding. Now this lack of funding can be personal funding or it can also be government funding. For training, um, th that is a problem. It, it's difficult when these folks have to pay for their own first aid courses. And uh, Mr. Harry Blackmore did an excellent job yesterday in the part presentation also reiterating some of these things that I have right here because Mr. Blackmore and I have had some good discussions and some arguments over you know, training and personnel and equipment and money involved and who should pay for what. Uh, you know, we spent a lot of time together the last little while hashing stuff out. Um, and, it, and it's made a difference between the two of us. We both have a heavy respect for each other, but you know, where's this money gonna come from? And some members do not mind paying for their first aid training, others would rather have it provided. But it is a weakness, because you gotta get it done. And then some can afford their personal equipment, others who are getting into it cannot, because of family situations and work and or school, as an example, getting educated. So our member participation, it does wane, it does fall, um, and, and it's also to do with, there's only so many hours in a day and, and members are busy working, looking after families, uh, and it's not just SAR, volunteer firefighters do have the same thing, but it's hard to get the participation that every Wednesday night we're meeting, every Saturday, Sunday we're doing this, that, and the other, um, it's hard to get 100%. You just can't get that. And, and so that it can be difficult uh, because of the other compounding issues. Mentorship, I think there needs to be a greater leverage on mentorship and documented mentorship, especially working uh, together uh, and, and difficult type of occasions. Um, that helps people develop a strong mentorship program that can be documented as well as to what, was, what occurred between the mentor and uh, the person being mentored. Understanding the skills uh, it has come up on, on this hearing this week and also on previous hearings. Um, the skills involved with wilderness advanced remote responder or first aid. You gotta maintain those skills. Um, three years on a credibility to have those refreshed. So that is one aspect. And it also goes back to map and compass, GPS and reach. Uh, using the devices and getting not only the academic side, but refresher training and hands on. Um, we all fall that way. If you don't use it, we all know you lose it. Um, but it's having, again, it's time management. It's, it's getting people engaged to do it. There are some who are just, as I mentioned before, are outstanding. They're just doing it all the time. That's, that's their thing. They have a lot of time on their hands. Um, SISM, critical incident stress management. Now that has come up several times throughout the hearing process. It also came up yesterday as well. One of the weaknesses is not having that available for the SAR responder, SAR worker, SAR provider. And accessibly, readily available for counseling services as required. It is first aid for the mind. It is first aid for the individual. That is important, and so that needs to be developed and it needs to be documented how that should happen and going forward. <clears throat> the position task book is a way of taking a SAR skills responder, a team leader or SAR manager, and making sure that they get a number of demonstrated um, efforts in exercising, uh, demonstration of skills, uh, academic skills, um, being able to verbally, uh, you know, uh, challenge uh, skill, how do, you know, how do I do something? Setting up a six to one rope rescue system. Also looking at the, the first aid side of it, but again, getting into how do I do a tabletop exercise? How do I you know, segment my map and train topography analysis? How do I do scenario based? 
getting back into that, those position tasks, but keep everybody on track. It's done now, but it's done not with a, a book in mind. It's, it's, it's done with, yeah, you went through that, great. We, we got a mental check in the box. We, it should be documented. Participating in after action reviews. A lot of times people want to go home. Uh, everybody wants to get it over with. The police want to put the file to bed. The SAR workers want to put their equipment to bed and get ready for the next one. But they don't have to happen immediately. There can be a short critique and debrief afterwards, but certainly within a week or two, there should be a full after action review run by an independent uh, person who wasn't involved in the mission <clears throat> and through a documented process, what went right, what went wrong, what are, you know, what are we set out to do, uh, what else can we do to improve ourselves, getting everybody to participate in that and, and get those results. And, and sometimes it is hard to get everybody involved and have a number of those. This is for so, SARS. So uh, is there... Sorry, sir. Is there a, um, um, a text or a book that uh, people can refer to for that particular uh, kind of review? Yeah, yes, sir, there is. And there's been a standard out there for a number of years in, in public safety from incident management, emergency management, and search and rescue. Um, I emailed um, uh, Mr. Budden and yourself a copy of the after action report and review as, as, as a template that can be followed. It's been used um, across uh, the country. Externally, these are some opportunities that are out there. And, and this is a great part of it. Um, we can grasp and say, you know what, we need to have more training with mandated agencies. And I, I can tell you that after speaking with uh, a couple of police officers involved, they love training. They love training as well as anybody else. And they want to be involved. The RNC, you know, bringing that training into their uh, recruit training classes, but also making sure that their officers get uh, basic SAR skills and get, they get that from the rovers. But training with the people you work with in the field, Canadian Coast Guard, Canadian Coast Guard Auxiliary, uh, Canadian Park Service, um, and all different type levels of cor courses is a great opportunity because then things go a lot smoother and easier when you're in the field, when the span meets the fan. I believe the external opportunities there for police to do more ground search and rescue training. So whether they do it with, <clears throat> example would be the rovers or, or the RNC, it doesn't, doesn't matter, but they need to do more themselves. A rural, wilderness, isolated policing does require a strong knowledge of, you know, what kind of cases load could we have up here? If those case loads involve lost, missing, overdue people, then I should have a foundation in basic SAR skills. So I understand what the teams are doing. There's also that risk assessment side that's involved in it. So when you, somebody's telling you what we're gonna do, like a Barry Anderson and Makovic, that you fully understand that. So having that training available, it may not need to be a full course of a six-day course for the police ground search and rescue, so, but the attachment members really know and, and officers know, ah, uh, this is what's going on out there. I don't have to guess. I don't have to ask 20 questions. I know and understand that. I see as an opportunity the joint field exercises between ALSARA members and their SAR partners. These are all the stakeholders that you would have in a mission. And that may be involving the Canadian Coast Guard Auxiliary as an example for body recoveries where I believe the person's gone off the East Coast Trail and is down into the water area. Uh, joint field exercises are invaluable. So it's not just in the classroom, it's out in the field doing it, and it takes time. New equipment, excellent opportunity to look at uh, global positioning systems, different ones that are out there in reach, the different apps that are out there for smartphones. I know we mentioned Adventure Smart, <clears throat> but there are, are apps that go work with the in reach system onto your smartphone, so then you can use that device, and different types of stoves that are rapidly coming on the market that really meet the requirement for SAR. Um, those are excellent opportunities for, for training and development and new equipment. Uh, the, the use of working with a Casera, as an example, uh, on, on the spotter training, new training, a new equipment, a new spotter technology, uh, advanced medical wilderness responders. Uh, uh, Mr. Smith, this might not interrupt, but you gave me a really good uh, explanation in a couple of minutes of what the, the technique of spotting is. Uh, would you mind uh, doing that here now, just very briefly explaining what the, the uh, what a trained spotter is actually trained to do? I could do that. So, and I, and I don't have, I mean, I've, I've gone through the program myself, but I've never been a spotter trainer, but I've gone through it and we've documented it. 
But basically what you're doing is once you're aboard the aircraft, and there's different aircrafts from the light aircraft, everything from a you know, Cessna 162 all the way up to a, a C-130 Hercules, certainly you're looking out a window. You're going to be looking at the ground, but it's also based on altitude and, and, and slant distances out from the aircraft. And typically what you're doing is when you place your arm out at a certain angle, as you, and that indicates where your fist is located as a piece of ground that you, you want to look at. And then as the aircraft is going forward, you're not only moving that forward, but you're bringing in that arm or you're bringing in that sight picture on that uh, wrist area back in towards the aircraft and then back out again. So you're constantly scanning back and forth uh, on, on the ground, left to right, up and down on that little object that's out there on that piece of ground that you're covering. And that is why you'll see most of the aircraft are certainly less than a thousand feet and uh, the slant distances are also you know, less than that as well. It also depends on the aircraft platform and how you do that, whether it's rotary wing, helicopter, and or a small fixed wing. But it's important with the spotter training, and, and this is why I, I really believe in spotter training and also believe in the, the aspect of having the military do it and our Casera do it, is the fact that you gotta do it and you, and you have to do the refresher training. And I know Mr. Blackwell mentioned that it costs money to do that, I agree. You know, um, but you're not going to get meaningful probability of detection values. In other words, what you see on the ground uh, and the targets you're looking for, unless you have trained uh, sp spotters. If you don't have a trained person, then you you don't get meaningful probability of detection values. Now, with that being said, <coughs> excuse me. Somebody who's doing wildlife surveys, and that's their job as a biologist and or with conservation officers, an example, they're used to being up in an aircraft doing moose surveys and doing orbits and circles on a continuous basis, but it's also being able to do those grid patterns and look at that piece of ground that your fist is identifying as well. So there's always a chance to bring that in, but it's looking at the ground, uh, something the size of your fist held out as you bring it out and in towards the aircraft and back out again. Does that help? So it's more than experience, it's an actual system. It is a system, it is training, and there's a technique to it. And the Royal Canadian Air Force for many years has used that with their SARTEC program and also teaching CASERA. And then CASERA has taught uh, ANSARA members in this province to do it. But it's, it's maintaining that. And it's like everything. You, you can't have enough spotters because you never know when you're gonna have to put them on board an aircraft to go, to go do something and where they're gonna be. So you need to spread them out uh, throughout the Newfoundland and Labrador. The, sorry, answer good. And so the other part is, the, as I mentioned just briefly before, the Advanced Medical Wilderness Responder. Um, so some of the opportunities that are out there, there's different companies now providing this training. And it is important to look at different avenues and not always train internally, but to go outside and, and to bring those other experts in to give you the latest and best practices. Because more often than not, you're treating those trauma injuries, and those trauma injuries can be compounded with um, hypothermia. Uh, as an example, and we still have a lot of people pass away from hypothermia all across Canada, and it can happen in the summer just as well as it can happen in the winter time. So for, for SAR scale, some of those external threats that I saw, uh, no sustainable funding for training or equipment. Now this is not just and SARA. This is also going back to the law enforcement agencies because they have to reallocate budgets and finances. So it's not a fault of a SAR coordinator per se who's with law enforcement. It's just that there's only so much funding to go around to provide policing services. So if there was more money available out there, it would help the police train more of their members, part of their role, responsibilities, and duties, but also train CASERA or other ways of doing business. I'm not saying this way or that way. It's like look at other avenues, look at other ways of providing that service. To, uh, but sustainable funding is a key for training. And again, I know Mr. Blackmore brought that up yesterday and it, it is a problem all across the country, but let's not lose it, let's get on top of it. But then the equipment is also important because if you don't train on this new piece of equipment, all of a sudden you get out there and you need to use a wheel kit on something simple like a cascade toboggan or a rescue toboggan, and you can't figure out how it goes together or a piece breaks off, Man, if you don't have that, that's a threat. That's, that's not going to make it work for you. The lack of cross-training with other SAR sector stakeholders. Um, a lot more training with, with Parks Canada, a lot more training with Canadian Coast Guard Auxiliary, and a lot more training with CASERA. What works? What does not work? Is it possible to use them on every case? You know, you need to figure that out. What are the PODs that are out there from cross-training? 
with these different departments and agencies, probably detection values of spotting somebody that's out in a certain area. You need to know that and document it and everybody working together to solve the problem. We do have multi agencies and multiple policies. They can be difficult for Ansara, as an example, and or civilians to follow. Um, if you're in government, you're used to doing all that. All these policy and procedures, it's, it's like water for ducks back. Oh yeah, I'll just read this, that, and the other, and here's where it is. But if you're outside of that realm, it's not always easy to follow that. And so that's a threat because it's different now working for, <clears throat> say, the RNCs, it would be the RCMP, as an example, as it would be for working for Coast Guard and or Parks, Canada Park Service. So within now what policy, what can we do, what can we not do, and how are we going to set this up, and how do things function, who's going to be in command and control. Not enough field exercises, and not enough stakeholders uh, participating, and th that's important. Field exercises make you successful. <clears throat> we train on some equipment, but we need to get out there and do the 12 hour, 16 hour, even an overnight and, and changing teams over in the field, 24 hour exercises in the field. Um, there needs to be a lot more of them. The recruitment, I know we're dealing a session with that on Friday here with the hearing process. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it saying there's a lot of competing interests out there. Some of the folks in the room here are competing interest in, in, in taking those SAR personnel from NSARA, as an example, and putting them in Casera, putting them in Coast Guard Auxiliary, going to Canadian Rangers. People have a choice of where they want to go. Local fire municipalities and fire services are also a competing interest, so it's hard to get recruitment. In some communities, uh, and again, McCovic's a prime example, you might have a person doing all three or four of those jobs. They're in the Canadian Coast Guard Auxiliary program. They're a Canadian Ranger. They're in ground search and rescue. They're with the local fire department. Th threat is, they could be one of those other ones in engaged and then something occurs and now all of a sudden you've lost that personnel. Civil litigation liabilities is, is always a threat for emergency responders. Did we do the right thing? Did we drop the person? Um, is there potential uh, for that to happen, emergency responders? Yes, there's always a potential for that to happen. So that's, it's in the back of people's minds, but if you can show and demonstrate your plans, your training, your equipment, you're good. But people mentioned to me, that's a threat, you know, could we be sued? And they want to know the answer to that. Certainly leadership, and the next section deals with leadership. These are the folks that are out there providing that purpose, and that direction, and the motivation to the SAR skills guys. The, the, you know, the ones that are really involved, in, you know, as we often heard, boots on the ground. But the leaders are putting all that together and they're coming up with the incident action plan, they're coming up with their task, <clears throat> their assignment, relaying it to the team, meeting those mission goals, objectives, out they go to keep that team going, to find clues, as I mentioned before. Their job is to find clues and to keep motivating those guys, nighttime, daytime, in climate weather, to find clues. So some of the strengths in there is, there's a lot of folks here that got a lot of years of training. And so our leaders have the greatest number of years from the number, and also the largest number of SAR courses they've taken by being in the business. So that's a good strength to have. And, and I've seen that time and time again, and, and, we've, and I've documented it down with the questionnaires. So their experience in SAR is good, and they also have a large number of missions they can pull upon because of years in service on the job. You don't want to lose those guys. They are proficient, credible, and competent in their SAR skills because all the leader is for this perspective is an extension of SAR skills. They're team oriented. Um, I know talking to one fine gentleman who's in the room here who has, um, I won't mention his name, but he has a long history working in the fire service and also with search and rescue. And he's an, an older gentleman. But I tell you what, he is very team oriented. He considers his team members first. And age doesn't mean any about competency. That gentleman can do the job as well as any 20 year old. I know that. And he's told me that too, which is a good thing, because I need to be brought in every once in a while. So that's the guys you want. Those are strengths. Their experience with outside resources, they know who's in the field, they know who they're stakeholders, they know who they're working with in different parts of the province. And there's a trust and bond with working with those outside agencies. And that's one thing you see with working with the police. Um, you need to build that trust and the bond. If you, if you ever break it down or lose it, it's very difficult to get back. These leaders have that. They keep it there. 
They're, they do embrace new technology, inReach, GPS, and satellite systems, other satellite systems that are out there. They understand that. They take great pride in knowing all these techno gadgets and devices. They really enjoy those items, and they also use them to make the team more efficient and effective. Now, some of the weaknesses, again, it goes back to lack of funding. There's only so much money to go around when you talk about critical infrastructure, uh, infrastructure for rolling stock and vehicles, and for training and to replace equipment. So lack of funding to, to give them leadership skills, and also leadership skills and courses from outside their shop, outside the area. So they're constantly evolving and, and improving themselves as leaders. Because the main job of those SAR leaders is to make more SAR leaders. And so there needs to be a mentorship program that's documented, but it takes time to do that. And a lot of the guys were saying that, I don't have time to mentor anybody. You know, I don't have time to complete this process that you're talking about because it does take time. So that's, that's, that's a weakness. It can be worked on. SISM as well, they have a concern because they're the ones that often are not identify a stress injury in their team members, SAR responders, SAR workers. And they're the ones that are gonna bring it up to the overhead team to the executive, but also get that team member help. So again, lack of adequate programs and counseling. The position task book, uh, no matter where, and Wildland Fires used the position task book, so it was emergency manager for years. It's not a new device, um, and there's different formats out there. That can be used to maintain that competency for many, many positions in search and rescue and succession planning. Because if you're gonna build new leaders, Here's my documentation on making this person a leader. Here's what they've done. Here's what they can do. The opportunities that are out there is training with other SAR teams. So not only train with SAR teams in your backyard, but spreading out and working with other teams in the Avalon Peninsula, working with other teams in Labrador, working with other teams in, on the West Coast, et cetera, and in the northern part of the island. And that's a continuous thing. So, so reach outside your area. Those are opportunities and also to involve police GSAR training. They need to understand how the leader thinks and how they're gonna act and what they're gonna do. They're sending them out there, and so there is that participation to increase that SAR leadership knowledge on, on behalf of the, of, the, of the police, because that gives them better respect and appreciation that, okay, if this person's saying that they need this kind of aircraft, these are the injuries they're seeing, I have faith in that we have a trust and we have a bond. That's an opportunity to build that up. Increased joint exercises with all the NSARA teams. These are field exercises again. But I will say, it's easy for me to say that, but it costs money to complete a, a field exercise. And that's, and that's a significant issue we, we're gonna be addressing. We do require new leaders. They wanna make more leaders. And also to consider diversity in, in, in leadership as well as we move forward with all the people that we have in our communities based on the demographics of our communities. <clears throat> New training from outside agencies is an opportunity. What can Canadian Coast Guard teach us? What can Casera teach us? What can the RCMP and RNC teach us? What can Parks Canada teach us? <clears throat> what can the Canadian Rangers teach us? What can other agencies teach us? How can we share our education, training, and knowledge? And then develop this mentorship program from the SAR responders. The threats that are out there really comes down to the funding. I can't tell you the amount. I can't tell you why well, you need a million dollars, two million dollars, or five hundred thousand dollars. It it requires a financial backing, that is for sure. Uh, to have a mentorship program, and to assist people from printing documentation to sustaining it, database on computer software, whatever you're going to use, it's there. That's a threat to being successful in the previous slide. Not being able to train with the police. The police are busy. They're doing police work. Um, parks are busy doing park stuff. You can't always get that done. That's a threat. <clears throat> so somehow we have to change the way we do it, the dynamics, to make sure we can be more successful. Not getting multiple agency recognition. There needs to be recognition for these leaders, uh, for years of service, outstanding contributions by the multiple agencies. Um, you've had ships at sea this recently, uh, engaged in, in search and rescue operations, and, and you know, that's important for the leaders that are involved on those water vessels and what they were doing. Lack of exercises with SAR sector stakeholders. Train in the field with the people you'll be working with. Money. Recruitment. There were some comments made to me uh, 
um, I won't mention the area, but it was on the island here. <clears throat> no, I don't want to be a leader. <laughs> I'd rather just be a boots on the ground person in the field. You tell me what to do and I'll go do it. Okay, fair enough. It's not the first time we've, we've heard that. Um, some people do not want to step up. It's, they don't feel it's their role. They say, well, I'm not a leader. I'm not leader material. Well, leaders are made. They're not born. But with that being said, they don't feel comfortable. That's a threat because then we're losing out on that body as we go forward. So we need to have and build recruitment also to build people that can come in and be leaders as we move forward. <clears throat> now, what is management? It's accomplishing those organizational objectives through efficient, effective use of people and the resources that we have to get our job done. The strengths. In most cases we're talking about here, and I, I, I did not work out the percentage for this one, but they have the most years in search and rescue. They have the most experience. They have the most missions under their belt. They're proficient, credible, and competent with SAR management. They know they've been, they've been trained. They're team oriented. They're good at working in the command post. They're good at working in an overhead team. They're good at working with the police as the incident command side of the house and also with other agencies. They're good at embracing technology from geographic information systems to GPS to tactical mapping and, and, and the, like the MREC system, but also the ERIE system, so tactical mapping and producing that documentation. That there's, some, there's good strengths there. The weaknesses. I could sure use a refresher course. That statement was made on several occasions. I could use some additional training on that new stuff dealing with data collection, statistical analysis, lost person behavior. Okay, fair enough. I could actually use some training to go out and see, well, what do those divers do anyway when they do a dive recovery? And how do they actually spot from an aircraft and giving meaningful PODs? I don't know that. So number of SAR managers, there's always a requirement for more positions, without a doubt. And the reason you want more SAR managers in, in the province, um, and I want to say this categorically, is you want these incident management teams so that when one team is expanded, they've done their 12, 16 hours, another incident management team, which is basically um, <clears throat> command staff, general staff, SAR managers, come in and they can take over and do the night shift. So then that other team can take over who works that local area, they can again, again do the day shift. And you can go 24 and seven that way by having multiple incident management teams. When the other team's expanded, you bring another IMT. This is done today. It is carried out today, but it's done a little more loosely. People have working knowledge who understand that, but it also needs to be built upon and be documented because you wanna have a case where and we saw examples here up in the peninsula with multiple operational periods and having multiple teams that could do that and not have an incident management team that runs 17 hours plus. Because then you get into fatigue management and before you get physically tired, you get mentally tired. <clears throat> so there needs to be a mentorship program for, for SAR managers. So if you can't go on a course, you need to mentor with somebody, but what's the job all about? What can I do for you? What paperwork can I you know, complete and help you out while doing that? So a better training of people who are gonna go into SAR management. <coughs> there was a SAR group in the province who's, who had a SAR coordinator uh, acting as the, as the local SAR manager who was untrained. So you had somebody who was going out there managing searches who was untrained. Um, that, that's a problem, uh, and, but it's also a case of training needs to be offered and continues to be offered or that person should be removed from a role. That's, that's, that's a weakness. Better documentation during initial response phase with the incident action plan. There's a lot going on. No one expects a SAR management or a SAR management team to drop everything, a plan for two or three hours on the hood of a vehicle or in a command post while well, everybody's waiting outside. No, initial response means we know where we can go searching initially to get everything done. Let's find out where all those places and check them where the person is not, but then let's get that documented right away and also come up with our goals and objectives and scenarios and to where we want to search next. That also allows you to do transfer command at a later date. Position task books, again, pertain to SAR management as they do with SAR skills and SAR leadership. They need a strong participation in after action reviews. Not everybody could make it to an after action report or review because of jobs, families, it's just not possible, but they need to be there because they're the ones that are gonna say, well, this is what we set out to do. 
here's what actually happened, you know, and how can we improve ourselves as an emergency service delivery vehicle and with, for the tasking agency? Because how does a tasking agency measure the results unless they have an after action review? Just going to jump in there, Mr. Smith, just to go back to the previous bullet, the uh, uh, better documentation during the initial response <coughs> phase, and, and we've talked about this uh, throughout the inquiry, but perhaps you could just uh, explain a little uh, in a little more detail what you observed and what you would have uh, liked to have seen and why it matters. So you, uh, would this also be what, basically, I guess, the, the planning of the operation? So if you can sort of speak to those things, explain them a little more thoroughly. When you get that call for a lost, missing, overdue subject, it is important that you have a pre-plan of how you're going to do business. And then once you get out to the scene, you get all that information from the police, you're going to come up with some scenarios as to what do you think's happened. It does take time to do that. You're going through that mentally. As soon as you leave your house to get to the RCP detachment or RNC station, you're saying, okay, I wonder what could have happened here. So you're already going through some scenario analysis. Once you get to your location with the police, you want to get with your police incident commander <clears throat> or police officer and decide, okay, you think from a policing standpoint through your investigation that we have a SAR mission. Now we need to develop a plan as to what we're going to do. That is based on scenarios. So you want to come up with five to 10 solid scenarios as to what do you think's happened to this individual. They don't take long. Maybe that child has succumbed to an, uh, a wildlife human conflict. Maybe that child is being abducted, stranger abduction, uh, parental abduction. Maybe that child's wandered off uh, and followed a deer, a rabbit. Maybe that child's actually succumbed to hazardous type terrain. That's kind of what I'm talking about scenarios. So you're kind of already building this up and then you want to quickly document that down. Then from those scenarios, you, you can start to look at um, where do I want to search first, second, third, and fourth. And so you can look at a map and say, okay, well, let's find out where she is not based on your scenario. So you can say, well, we're going to check this trail, that trail, along the river, along the coastline, the campground, all the infrastructure, all the buildings, all the vehicles in the area. We want to check everybody coming and going from the campground area. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, I have all these multiple tasks. I want to go out there in the field and check all the tree line in the field that you look back in the campground site and say, hey, I, I can do all those things, but you're building a plan. So that instant action plan is important because it comes up with the objectives. We want to find Sally Sanchez by 2,400 hours. That's the plan, but she's missing from the campground. <clears throat> then you come up with investigational objectives, which the police help you out on, containment confinement objectives, and you're going to come up with search objectives. Those can be done in a short, really fast period of time. What I did see occurring uh, in, in this process, though, was um, not so much having a plan for that initial response, but having a plan or notes and documentation for here's what we did. And so what there needs to be is a little more upfront as to here's our action plan as to our objective strategy and tactics, our scenarios, our probability areas, identifying the hazards, and here's where we sent everybody. Because if, if, if I'm the SAR manager and I have to transfer command because I'm too tired or I have to move, then I can say, here's what we did as a plan, initial response. It's still in the initial response phase. You can continue that and, and, move, uh, and move forward. And just again to follow up, because this is a point that I think may be important. Uh, what does it actually look like? How long does it take? Uh, why does it matter? And did you see examples here where that was followed? <clears throat> uh, here, meaning your observation, the Newfoundland searches. Yes, thank you. We, I, I did see on a couple of occasions here, and uh, in, in going through the hearings, where there was no plan per se up front. The, the, the guys knew where they wanted to send everybody, but there needed to be a kind of solid documented plan. And again, that, this takes more training and, and develop an initial response to get that done. The time involved in doing that, it can take two or three minutes to an hour, depending on the complexities of the incident. Terrain, topography, weather, getting that information coming in, waiting for the troops to arrive to deploy in the field. But I will stress again, I'm not saying that you hold 50 people back while you do a very thorough, highly detailed plan. I know immediately 
if I'm talking about somebody missing from a campground, where I need to send them to start searching. More often than not, that is done because guys have a working knowledge. The men and women have a working knowledge. What they need to do is so, the plan is how you're gonna be measured, what you set out to do. If you don't have that plan ahead of time, then how are you measured as to what worked and what didn't work and what do you need to modify and adjust as you get into a second and third operational period? So lots of after action notes, but not so much up front. And I have that in a, in a slide coming up here just a little later as well. Okay. So, I mean, if, if the incident commander and the SAR manager tell you that they have good communication and they know how to communicate with each other is, and they have a close working relationship, is this written uh, plan uh, critical or is it desirable? We've heard uh, f from one of the teams or at least one of the teams say, well, we kind of know how each other is thinking, so we share and communicate that information, but we don't necessarily follow some kind of rigid uh, written plan and record it. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. As I am here, I can only give you best practices. I can only tell you what I've observed from interviews, investigation, and observation. Um, I will give you the best practices. When we talk about the plan, the police must approve the plan in one way or another. And it may be just a second, like right now, I can approve this plan because uh, the police officer's right here. Fair enough, or they're, they're working together with the plan. The police must also approve the resources. And I have some slides coming up a little later on this, but specific to say, Newfoundland Search and Rescue does not have a mandate to do search and rescue. They don't have a SAR responsibility. They are volunteers. The police have the responsibility to do search and rescue. So the police have to approve something. And if it's just, I'm gonna send people here, there, and everywhere, and we'll just do up some notes, then I don't have a plan. I don't have something that can be measured by it. And the police are approving just the notes that are happened after the fact, instead of a, an actual plan that has objective strategy and tactics and, and scenarios. And so that's a consideration. And then the police must also approve the ordering of the resources for that plan. Because if Ansara doesn't do it, and, and, and please don't take this wrong, what I'm saying here, I'm just giving the academic side. Um, and, 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 th and possibly the legal side here is that the police order those resources. If they don't have Ansara do all this, and there's no way that police can do this across Canada, it's not physically possible, then they must do it without Ansara with all of their officers. And if it's in a place like Makovic or Elside, then they're bringing officers in from all across the province and outside the province to do a SAR mission. And they must do it. I wonder if um, Mr. Blackmore can weigh in on that issue in terms of it's on, uh, uh, Can you, is that better? Okay. I, I wonder if Mr. Blackmore can weigh in on, on that issue in terms of, um, I guess the police approving the plan and approving resources. I, I, I didn't get the impression that was kind of how it was working in this province, but perhaps it is, and I just didn't, uh, didn't understand that. Uh, I don't think there's any written formula that we have to say the police sign off on it. It's always been done between the search manager and the incident commander together. Uh, Richard is stating that they have to sign off on it. I have never seen a plan signed off by any police officer since I've been at this. And, but it is uh, always discussed before anything is done and written into the log what we're doing. If you're talking about actually having someone sign off on it, no, it's never done, but it is jointly done. And it is gi uh, given that uh, once we come up with the plan, we discuss it and we just uh, continue on with it. But actually written down a plan that someone has the initial, no, it's never done. Mr. Williams may be able to add to this as well. Sergeant Williams, if that's okay with the commission. Yes, uh, Sergeant Williams here. 
it is a discussion had at that level, as we discussed before, SAR manager, SAR incident commander. Um, in terms of approving the resources, um, that is a discussion that comes from um, those two roles. Um, and say if it's for air support, yeah, that, that's a decision made together, but then the police would be the mechanism to contact for the air support as we've seen. And I guess in terms of formal sign off, not necessarily a formal signature, but in that discussion, there, there is an agreement between the two parties to say, this is the best course of action in the process. These are the resources that have been identified. And this is how we plan to move forward with the SR operation, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so we are, uh, as Mr. Smith pointed out, hiring him and have hired him to uh, point out best practices. I just wanted to uh, get his response to a point that we've heard on, uh, on one of the, the uh, sessions. Thank you. The incident action plan and, and what you're gonna do. What are we here to do and why? How are we gonna do it? Who, where, and when? I, I agree with Sergeant Williams, I agree with Mr. Blackboard that if I'm standing with the police or in the command post, I have the plan, this is what we wanna do, the officer's right there. But if the officer has to go to an assault causing in progress, a serious crime, motor vehicle collision, uh, there is an understanding that they would have to communicate and say, this is what we wanna do, has somebody in the office approved this? What we're gonna, you know, you, you gotta communicate it. More often than not, the officer's there. There's somebody there because of resources. But in some places where it's busy, you may have to say, here's what we wanna get done. And so you'd have to have a conversation before the officer left to say, what's our delegation of authority to moving forward? And that's the working relationships we have with the police in El Sara. And in some of the smaller, smaller communities, it's a great working relationship. You know, they're part of the community. Everybody knows each other and what goes on, how you think, I, and I agree with that. So it's, it's that trust, it's that bond that I mentioned as well, but you, there is a, not a, necessarily a, a physical I sign off on this plan. It's more, here's our plan, here's what we're gonna do, good to go, or over the radio or the cell phone. Does that help, uh, counsel? Yeah, okay. So some of the external threats, and, but on external, sorry, not threats, not, the opportunities that are there to go forward was the training with mandated tasking agencies. This last example we just talked about with Sergeant, uh, Sergeant Williams there is, is, is a good one. Uh, and, and this whole program, because I have still some several slides to go on dealing with, how would you like business done? You know, how do you want to get that completed? What, what suits your requirements? So you do that in the tabletop exercise. When you do a tabletop exercise, you're, you have a map on the table, you have a, a scenario of a lost child, and, and you need to do the, the tactical, the mapping, the planning. You need to do the incident action plan. You need to do all those aspects, all those parts of it with a team, and then the police are there and getting them, getting them involved and, and resource management principles, but that's where you start doing it. That's a great opportunity to really say, here's how we wanna go forward. Um, and then there, there is a, sometimes an overabundance of, of tasks that the police are asked to do in communities. A lot of police officers may not have a time to read a SAR policy, a division policy, B division policy, before a mission or national policy. I don't fault them for that. It, it's like anything with policy and procedures. Usually an incident happens and you're grabbing to say, what do I do now? How do I talk to a senior officer, supervisor? When am I gonna go forward? But you, you know, a, a better, I think, understanding of increasing police SAR management training for simply an awareness program for their ICs as their role, responsibilities and duties with El SARA or any other group. And then, um, and, 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 and this came from a conversation I had with an RCMP officer in, in Mokovic, who's, who's not there anymore, but, um, he, he was really good at identifying, you know what, we could do things better that way as, as far as understanding the full gamut, what should happen. And he admitted that, you know, I'm a really good investigator, I'm a crackerjack investigator, but I, could, I need to understand the SAR stuff better. And so that, you know, that comment was made to me and it kind of stuck in that, yeah, you're right. Uh, you know, what is my role? What, what looks like a good program? Uh, SAR management field exercises, uh, and then scenario based with the SAR teams as well, so that they're not just you know, health or skeletal, they're actually designed with, you know, loss, missing, overdue people in different categories and what you're dealing with. If we have a large number of people that are going missing that are in special needs categories, then maybe we should start training more on those avenues and, uh, and in the field and, and uh, getting role players and all sorts of people involved to do that. 
So new training for SAR management, new training on incident management systems, so the databases that make it happen, your MRIC system and, and the rest of that, it doesn't matter which system you use, you're using a good solid system here, it works. Train more people on that. Get more people understanding um, some of the changes and, and where lost person behavior is going and the different data there. And again, more training for the initial response side. <clears throat> Those threats, that are out there is sometimes people misunderstand the role of, 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 uh, of by police of Al So I just, yeah, I just opened up a can of worms here about who is responsible for SAR, and is that contractual base? Is it a given? Is it part of a you know you get paid to do SAR and then you can do it through the use of volunteers? Yeah, you you do, but you know who does what? And some officers who are new and it was mentioned to us again. Um, in, in, in McCovic, you had a brand new officer just out of training, and uh, that, that person did not understand everything, but lucky enough could get a hold of the supervisor at a later date, and, and it worked out just fine. But it's getting that advice what has to happen between the incident action plan and the resources. Cross training, um, we need to do cross training. It's not, it's not there, so that's a threat to a, to, a great, to a great program. And again, what I'm mentioning here is, is I have some other slides coming up, it, it takes funding to do that. Multiple agencies and multiple policies is always a threat. Which one are we working on? How does that work? Did I get that wrong between this police agency and that police agency? They do things differently. SAR managers um, need to be trained to a higher level of incident command system. Most have I-200. I would recommend I-300 as a minimum because it's, it's that level of ICS takes you into writing incident action plans <clears throat> for multiple operational periods and also gets you involved with working within multiple jurisdictions. It gives you a good foundation. Would you mind uh, just explaining a little bit about <clears throat> what an I-200 is, what an I-300 oh. is? Just contextualize a bit for, uh, sure. for those of us who are less familiar. Well, the incident command system being majority of an on-scene command and control organizational structure, and this falls back to my academic probably overboard, that I gave at the beginning of my presentation, why you need this command and control. The I-100 is just a introduction, this is ICS, this is what it's all about, and just tells you some of the functions that are out there. We talk about functions, not rank. These are the things that are gonna happen. If you're the operations sections chief, that means that he or she is a tactical commander, is gonna direct the efforts of others and implement the incident action plan. People would know that. So that's, it's a basic introduction, I-100. Majority of the provinces do that online, or you can just do it online. To give you an overview, the I-200 is a two-day course. It involves a greater understanding of incident command system forms, that there are forms involved, that there are operational periods, and here's what's involved in those operational periods, and here's how I can look at writing an IAP, what's required. Here's how I need to staff all the organizational functions. When we look at, we're gonna go into a second ops. The I-300 does take you into the <clears throat> multiple operational periods, cranking out multiple incident action plans, dealing with a whole bunch of different agencies, and it's not a simple problem or it's not something that's gonna be over in 24 hours. Majority of the I-100 and 200 folks are used to things ending within five, six, 10, 12 hours or within 24 hours. When you get on the I-300, you're now getting into multiple days. Does that help? Now there is an I-400, and that I-400 training is, would be for somebody like a Mitch Rumble, who is working in a provincial emergency operations center, ESD, because that gentleman would have to work with resources from with the, all over the province, but also outside, and working with compacts or agreements to bring in things to help with the snowmageddon and different things of that nature, so that the 400 takes that next level up even more so.
come and say hello. <laughs> oh yes, oh, hi, I'm good, how are you? Your presentation is
rise. This commission of inquiry is now in session. Please be seated. Uh, yes, Mr. Commissioner, we will resume the uh, evidence of uh, Mr. Smith, following which there will be questions from council. That will probably take the rest of the afternoon, and we will uh, start morning with, tomorrow morning with uh, uh, Ms. Bradley. That's the plan at, at the moment. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, uh, Council. Before we broke for lunch, I mentioned that the Search and Rescue Hazard Vulnerability Assessment, or Vulnerability Assessment. That's a tool that we've been utilizing for many years in both emergency management, search and rescue management, to do a complete assessment as to locations and types of search and rescue missions that you may engage in. It certainly uh, can occur in any jurisdiction. So it allows us to build a foundation for other planning and planning purposes. Mitigation efforts to prevent the problems. So in other words, we can engage in preventive search and rescue activities if we understand and know the problems. Prevention and pre-planning and training activities. So what kind of training will we need to engage in? Is it slope rope rescue, high angle rescue, a helicopter uh, a cargo ex extraction, hoisting, winching, a marine? It, it incorporates all that side. It allows you to modify and adjust your, your, your standard operating procedures, little manuals, and resource allocation for response to those missions. It allows you to understand what's engaged in rescue and recovery procedures and efforts, and certainly will identify and you'll know the capabilities of any resources that are going to be utilized to respond to the problems that you've identified through the hazard vulnerability assessment process. I just want to cover some of the academic slides here on, on this, and then I'll do some more of the recommendations, lessons learned, and then just a little bit of the academic side on the SAR plan because it's just, it's not a, a simple process and it's not that complicated, but it does take time, effort, energy, uh, personnel uh, uh, hours, et cetera, to produce. And then the publication and then approval by stakeholders and other personnel and groups as from the SAR sector. The vulnerability assessment um, is, is the homework and the investigation. As I just mentioned, everybody involved in the SAR sector should be involved in this. You can't do it in isolation. So I would not want a, uh, a police agency that is tasked and mandated to SAR just to do it on their own without consulting with NSAR as an example. It would be different in Nain. And one of the great interviews I had as well, uh, it was in Nain with the SAR coordinator up there. And in, and in dealing with their geographic area and the histories of the area, it has changed. And now you have the Torngat Mountains National Park in northern Labrador up at the tip there. But it's also not only the geographic factors you got to look at, it's understanding, well, how many people go to that park? And, in, and they have to do their vulnerability assessment with Parks Canada. And then you have to encompass the weather that's unique for that uh, uh, geographic area as well but also about the demographics. Where are the folks coming from who attend and, and, and go camping, whether it's canoeing, hiking, backpacking in Torngat Mountains National Park and in that area? And yes, it's Parks Canada. They rely on the Nain GSAR group, though, to assist them in carrying out search and rescue functions. And the one thing to note as we get through this, we can use as an example, is there are seasonal fluctuations. There's not a lot of activity there in the winter. Most of it is in the summertime. There's also international visitors to that national park. And there's also international visitors to the East Coast Trail. So is there a lot of private residents go there? Not as much as tourism and recreation. But what is really causing the problem? Well, sudden severe weather is definitely one of them in Northern Labrador. But what are the chances and probabilities in any given week that we could you know, predict the activity and the location and frequency of the number of calls on the East Coast Trail is another example. And you can start to isolate certain areas of that trail to say, here's where we're getting most of the problems. What is the problem? And as I mentioned before, if the park doesn't work, you may need to fix it. Now that's a kind of a generalized statement saying, you know, if the signages are, are broken and, and the signages are down, there's any confusing trail junctions, you may want to look at that. But what's the availability of the SAR resources to be able to respond with those resources to get the job done in the area? 
So if you can think about Nain, and then they have to respond to base camp just outside of Torngash Mountains, that's in itself is, is a substantial effort. And then you have to stage, and then you have to get into the backcountry. If you're going to use rotary wing aircraft as a primary uh, asset to, to move uh, the resources around, again, it adds these complexity analysis factors in coming in and performing a simple extraction from the backcountry of an injured backpacker. And I was privileged to go over a case with their SAR coordinator up there as to what actually happened with an injured backpacker that ended up having a, a broken leg. So you need to look at a good assessment and it does include the priorities and goals consummate with the need. So you may have some areas that do not have a high need, but certainly when you start looking at the hiking trails in Newfoundland and Labrador book, which is at, available at all the bookstores, you'll see you have 130 some trails that can be hiked in the province. Some of them are remote, some of them are close to the city, like here in St. John's. But if you don't ID the resources and needs for both rescue and search, you're going to cause yourself some grief. You may say, well, we just need rescue capability here. Okay, well, what if all of a sudden all you get is somebody calling in, I found a backpack or I found a jacket and there's a car still parked in the parking lot. Now you start getting that search effort as well. But it gives you direction for preventive PSAR activities and also mitigation. So mitigation really means how, what can we do to prevent these incidents from occurring? It may be just trail signage at the staging area, modifying the uh, parking lot, uh, modifying trail junction signs, modifying the boardwalks that are out there, uh, putting up a secondary sign at trail junctions indicating a hazardous type area. You may slip and fall to your death, so stay away from the extreme edges, etc. So there's different ways of looking at that, and certainly it has been looked at in those areas. Uh, Parks Canada does a very good job when it comes to public safety. They spend a lot of time uh, on that aspect. Uh, sometimes all of us outside the parks do not do a very good job of it um, based on other things that we have to do and the commitment and the, and the mandate's different. But we ne need to raise awareness with our local officials. That would be primarily RNC, RCMP, Parks Canada as to we have some concerns. We could get a number of incidents occurring there also, we can't get an Argo or an ATV down that trail because of the composition of the trail. We'd have to walk in and or use a helicopter. There are no landing spots for helicopters there. So we're making the RCMP RNC aware of the concerns when we do this good assessment. It certainly justifies management decisions. That gets up to your business case, your business plan, your SAR plan to say, here's what we have going on in this area we need to look at some prevention and investment and different types of training and equipment to get this job done. It will also identify any potential trends. Um, that is becoming important. One of the trends that we're dealing with, it's not just with international folks coming into Canada and traveling around our parks or, and our different areas, but it's also new immigrants to the country, new immigrants who are not familiar with the Canadian weather, the terrain, the topography, the uh, things that we have to deal with, and all of a sudden, they, you know, they really you know, take on more than they can, they can deal with because they're not equipped to be there, they're not expecting these certain things to happen. So it allows for realistic pre-planning, and thus the building of your SAR plan. And as you see the last couple of slides that I have to deal with here on SAR vulnerability assessment, this is how you justify building a SAR plan. You can't write a SAR plan unless you do a, a vulnerability assessment. You'll see it called both a hazard vulnerability assessment and a vulnerability assessment. If you just start to write a SAR plan, you don't have a foundation. You know, you really need to understand and justify justification of the problem the assumptions that can be made on, yes, we're gonna get calls in this area, a lot of facts bearing on those problems, uh, having good discussions with stakeholders, <coughs> people from the SAR sector, coming up with meaningful conclusions and then doing your recommendations. Another part of that Mr. is- Mr. Smith, uh, can, I, Mr. can I just ask you a question? I'm sorry yes, to interrupt. Sorry, Councilor, In yes. terms of like who's usually, it's on, okay. In terms of who's usually holding the pen, who's writing this report, um, who is it usually someone within government or is it someone within the police uh, service? Thank you, sir. Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> and it's been dealt with time and time again. In the past, my experience is a law, law enforcement SAR coordinator, SAR liaison officer, 
working with the local search and rescue volunteer group, produce this product in consult with the other agencies they work with. And, and as you know, based on where they are in the province, who are those other stakeholders? There may be none, or there may be three or four, like you might have around here in St. John's. So primarily it's been a law enforcement and a, a, a volunteer SAR group who produced that. But there's nothing saying that the government um, couldn't write this product and, and do the research development. But with that being said, you couldn't do it in isolation either. You'd have to have a consult for the stakeholders, the people who are going to engage and actually do it. Does, it, does that answer your question, sir? Oh, okay, thank you. So we also don't want to forget about the, the cost-benefit calculations that come with this. And, 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 and a big part of that is, you know, what is it going to cost us? Um, how do you get people out of these more remote, isolated backcountry areas? How do you get people off the East Coast Trail? It's close to St. John's, but it's also very remote. And if the weather crashes and there's fog in there, you know, what are the avenues you have to utilize? And there's cost to that. So the flow chart that we've used now for a couple of years just before I get into the specific slides, you know, really again goes over the jurisdictional data from uh, Torngat Mountains down the Avalon Peninsula and, and across the great province. It is different geographically, topographically, and then you demographically, of course, as your, as your people who are there. And to give, go back to the, the immigrant situation, look at where your new immigrant population is located. And then are they engaging in outdoor recreation activities? And where is that mainly out of? St. John's, the larger centers. And then they're going out and using the East Coast Trail as, as an example in some of the other hiking trails and, and backcountry areas. But identifying those activities and the hazards that are there is also an important aspect. So I'm, I'm just taking my time to make sure we understand that this is not a, oh, we'll do this in half a day, we'll do it in a day. You, there's a lot of visitation to these areas, there's a lot of interviewing parks, staff, public works, people that are putting up signs, you know, the SAR group that does tasking agencies involved. The unique thing about it nowadays, though, compared to how we used to do this back when I did my first one was in 81, 82, 1981, 82, was that we, know we now have geographic information systems or mapping data. So now we can use tactical mapping and planning and great databases. Um, an example, Paul French from uh, uh, Rover Search and Rescue is really up on all this stuff. He can just bring up the map. We can just put little pins on that map and then have a database to say, here's where everything's occurring, right? And so that's a simple process, but all of a sudden you can see the clusters and saying, wow, look at a group here, a group there. That makes it short work of where we need to put our resources. Because you may want a, a rescue cache in some of those locations that's secure, either in a facility and or a locked device, because you don't be able to carry everything back there. And an, an example would be, we've used bear-proof garbage containers, locked, the big ones that parks have, and put all our rescue gear in there, and it's all waterproofed, and pretty hard for somebody to break into it, and it's in the middle of the trail system, so we don't have to helicopter so much stuff in. That's what this is doing for you as well. But identifying the hazards and effects, so the vulnerability, you know, what is that vulnerability? Steep cliffs, the ocean, being on the rocks or slippy, being swept away out to sea. And so what are the effects? You know, the effects could certainly be a downturn. It's, hey, it's too dangerous to go there. The weather's too bad there all the time. We don't want to visit. We don't want to go there. Uh, and then a risk calendar. When are these things actually occurring? Um, and a lot of the parts, and, and now I, I've been looking up some great people in, in Labrador who are doing these long-distance trips by snowmobile up and down the trail system. It goes, you know, all the way up the heartland there and out to the ocean and back and forth again, joining all the communities up through there. And there's more and more people that want to do that time and time again. So when, you know, it's, it's all year round. It's not just in the summertime. But the resources being identified also gives you an idea of equipment and training. Because you may not have a piece of equipment that's required for doing winching off the side of the slopes. Um, you may need to upgrade that equipment. You need to train in that equipment. Of course, there's a cost to doing that. The human resources gets into the fact of how many personnel do we have available 24 and 7 that can respond to do that job with the equipment and do we need to get them trained on it, night operations. The report is a fairly straightforward report. It's very similar to a, a, a gap analysis. It's very similar just to standard business report. It's got a problem assumptions, facts bearing on, on the problem, discussion items, conclusions, and then your recommendations with a cost-benefit analysis. It also means if you don't do something, like a SAR vulnerability assessment, it could also cost you this in the long run. 
Now to go back to the refine and improve alignments and linkages in SAR, there needs to be a common SAR operational manual, a SAR plan and a pre-plan. We don't have one here. The next item I know sometimes can be contentious, and I'm not saying it has to be this way, I'm just saying it's missing. There's no legislation here. <clears throat> There's no regulation or policy specific to SAR. Um, my concern would be, and my opinion is, that if we throw money at SAR and the problem, what happens in four years, five years, the government turns over, the cycles change, or something else goes on, it's not written anywhere to maintain the sustainability in the funding and or the program itself. And that also pertains to the police, but saying, you know, we need to increase the police budget because they've got a lot of SAR public safety incidents. We can't keep keeping them on the same budget. So they need training, they need development, they need better working conditions so they can go out working with their stakeholders and their partners, et cetera, that are out there. We can't keep the norm. So it allows you to do that, but that's what's required. So once you have either legislation, regulation, policy, it, it kind of is built into a foundation and then you, you shouldn't lose it. You can modify it and go forward uh, as the time goes on. But it also protects the, the health and safety of SAR volunteers. We do need the, uh, a SISM program, critical stress management program for the SAR sector. And I know our, uh, our counselor, Louise, will, will certainly uh, advise us on that. And it's, it, and it's a wonderful program that can be adapted and utilized in many ways. I'm not gonna you know, address that fully, but there needs to be one. We can't leave it loose the way it is. Uh, Mr. Harry Blackmore and I had a discussion here, and yes, he will always find the money. He, will, he said he can pay out of his own pocket, but he will get somebody on a team somewhere, treatment, to see a psychologist, to get help, to see a peer counseling group. Uh, you know, if necessary. So, but it should also be there in a, in a plan. The incident command so can system, I just uh, interrupt for a second? Yes, Scout Commissioner, sorry. Um, so you're speaking about um, the SAR vulnerability assessment in light of what might occur in a jurisdiction. You're not saying that uh, for every trail, for every area, we should make it into a mini national park. I mean, you're just saying to be sensible about it, go through a vulnerability assessment if you're a, a SAR agency in the area. It, it, am I getting it right? Uh, let me just elaborate on that, Commissioner, because, uh, yeah, I, I may have gone over it a little too fast. Um, the SAR vulnerability assessment would be completed province-wide okay. in, in all areas, not just in parks because you have so many trails. I think there was 130 trails I saw in this book that I saw at the chapter of the bookstore, as an example, in Newfoundland. Now, not that this is gonna occur in all those trails, but it's certainly, you wanna do that provincially to say, where are our problems? You know, who are the people that are going there? Um, and what are those problems? Is, is it ice climbing? Is it sea kayaking? Um, you know, is it hiking? Is it mountain biking? Is it snowmobiling? Is it skiing, snowshoeing, dog sledding? Is it all those things? So, and then, of course, when are all those activities occurring? So it's, it pertains to the whole jurisdiction. Sorry if I didn't make that quite clear. Okay, thank you. I think yeah. I get it now. The incident command system is, is, I've kind of been beaten up on through the process here, but certainly it's recommended uh, best practices in by Public Safety Canada uh, to be utilized in critical incidents. They've published that, <coughs> but it's also legislation in British Columbia to really make sure that all of these stakeholders and everybody that's encompassed working in SAR have the right command and control system, you need to have, have legislation, regulation, or policy that ensures that, because that builds interoperability to all the responders in the SAR sector. You can't have groups doing different types of command and control systems. There's just a couple of slides here I just want to cover on this plan. I, I had many, of the SAR personnel asked me, well, what is this plan you're talking about? And you'll see it called a pre-plan. It is a SAR plan. And now that you've completed your search and rescue hazard vulnerability assessment, like what are we gonna get ourselves into, you can produce a document for your jurisdiction that talks about all the SAR missions, the resources, and who's gonna do the job, who's gonna do the job on a regular basis, who's primary, as I mentioned, secondary and tertiary, to complete that mission. And, I, and I, it's an exciting thing to participate in. The actual process of writing the plan, in my mind, has always been 
better than the plan itself for some reason. When you go through that process, SAR vulnerability assessment, writing a SAR plan, you really understand public safety and what everybody has to do in the province to save lives. There are many books out there, and it's, so it's not so much the, you know, how to get the job done. No, it's not the technical manual. It's not those SAR management manuals. It's usually that little one underneath, you know, that's, that's, that's quite readable. It's, and it's got to be readable, to put it in simple terms. It's a working document. And, it, and again, once you write it, there's a maintenance program for these documents. So somebody said to me, well, how can you justify a full-time police SAR coordinator? This is an example. They said, they can just do that part-time or quarter-time, whatever you want to do. And I said, you know, by the time they get around to all the detachments, they have to attend all the um, uh, senior uh, NCO meetings, the officers' meetings, interview people, you know, assist the, the Novus, uh, Newfoundland Search and Rescue Program uh, people and volunteers doing this program of SAR vulnerability and writing it. That takes a lot of time. And then you have the maintenance as well, and it's, they're, they're continuously updating and changing things in the, in the program. And then there's training that goes beyond that. And then, you know, and, and, and so those relationships have to be built and maintained. So it, it, it's uh, not something you can just do once and then walk away from. And here's the slide that says, you know, it's a working document. Ongoing information. Information changes. Usually it's typically is when you, you produce it. But now, thanks to our databases, we can do it electronically, uh, and you can just print it out as required, but it's the technical data that's actually gonna be used during the, in the mission, so it should be operational. It should pertain to how we're gonna get the job done, and it is a key to being successful. It's gotta be efficient, effective, economic, and does protect you from litigation, because you can say your SAR plan is how you're going to be measured, how you're gonna do business. And if you say that, Somebody else is gonna do that, and that's part of your plan, then that's what it is. But it's identified. So pre-planning is one of the most important functions in SAR management. Um, I asked several of the SAR managers, some of these other groups, and through the questionnaire process, have you engaged in writing a SAR plan? Everybody said no. Uh, there was no SAR plan out there. Okay. Um, what do you do locally? Well, I kind of know what to do locally was typically thing. I said, yeah, I know you do. You, but is there a star plan? Is there a little template to follow? And, and they didn't have one. They said, have you ever gotten one from the police? And, and, the, and they said, we've, we've never seen one. So I said, okay, that, that's fine. So providing an initial direction in solving the mission and solving the problem and it allows you to look for a foundation for future decisions. How are we going to do things in the future? It is a management tool. The pre-plan is complete when it defines the authorities. And I mentioned this before, uh, and I know we've had discussions over this. You know, the police have the mandate to do SAR. Newfoundland Search and Rescue does not have a mandate to do SAR, but they get delegated authority through the police to do that function. Um, and and this, this goes back to the plane crash in Makovic, where now GSAR is going out to do a, a, a tasking that typically Royal Canadian Air Force would do through their resources, but they're weathered out, which is fine. So then they contact the police, and then the police contact DSAR, and off they go. They get delegated authority to go out there and do it. But, it, you know, the pre plan defines that. It is a blueprint. It also talks about the legal responsibilities and jurisdictions, because you've got Parks Canada here running some parks, and you'd want to work with that. And then the agreement should be in writing, easy to read, simple, and be flexible, because they have to be changed and modified as you go forward. So just some of the major influences to consider, that vulnerability assessment area, any constraints you may have there, external influences, the organization, and of course the emergency conditions. The plan is, it has to be simple, and it also allows you to be updated on a continuous cyclic basis. So it's a team effort, but it takes maintenance. And here's the last 10 points when we talk about, yeah, these are what you need to do to get the plan done. It's rescue and search related. Historical data from all the past incidents. Establish who's gonna to respond to what. Obtain the law enforcement parks and easily having jurisdiction support. Um, it can be legislative mandated, right? By the responsible agency executive. Um, talk to resources. You gotta meet and greet those resources. Make sure they're willing to do the job. Draft an SOP. That's standard operating procedures. How are you gonna do it when the, when, when the incident occurs? 
and then get comments on the draft plan. Allow people to comment on them. Usually you give you know, 30 days to comment on the plan, they get everything back to you saying, you can change this, modify that based on this, that, and the other. And you clarify it, you modify it. We all do that as we go forward to eliminate and, and avoid any duplication or conflict. Training missions, using the plan, critique that training with the goal of improving the plan, finalize the plan, get more final critique comments, and then you have a plan. I'm gonna miss that one, I just go right here to refine it. So this is the last few slides when we talk about some improvements. The sustainable funding for the SAR sector is, what I, is, is not there right now. That would allow you to have the FTEs, full-time equivalency positions, to do a job. It really can be multifaceted way of doing business, but it is required sustainable funding. Is it just for one year, two years, three years, or is it gonna be in maturity to, to go forward for SAR? So, uh, we're not, SAR is not gonna go away. People getting injured and, and hurt out there is not gonna go away. People are gonna have more leisure time, more disposable income to go out and do things. Infrastructure sustainability funding for the SAR sector. That's an interesting comment because it came right from the Bay of Islands Search and Rescue Group where they're borrowing a building from the local municipality. All their vehicles are parked outside. The building needs to be expanded. Um, should SAR own buildings or should the government own the infrastructure? It's a question. And you know, and then, then the SAR groups, as an example, would almost like a lease or a grant procedure, apply for grants and infrastructure money to maintain that, change it, do whatever they need to do it. Um, you know, maybe the government should own all the vehicles too, as far as that goes, and all the costs associated with those vehicles. Um, so there's different ways of doing it. That comes down to the public-private partnerships for development and implementation. I don't see that right now. Um, it's really heavy on Alsara. Uh, I can tell you from in, in major discussions with people in the executive, and you heard it yesterday from Mr. Harry Blackboard, a lot of time, energy, and effort goes into fundraising in a wide variety of different types of fields just to do that, infrastructure and, and sustainability. And, and, it's, and it's burning out the SAR workers, SAR responders, and, and, and then all of a sudden they get calls on top of it and you start to lose people and they say, I don't have time for this anymore. And that's what's sad to see. So, federal provincial partnerships for indigenous SAR programs. And I know the discussions, we've had that discussions at our hearings, I think it's a great thing and it should be there and it's just a matter of how do you wanna do that? You, that can be looked at, it can be researched, it can be developed to build those programs. Pacific SAR in indigenous communities, involving El Sara as an example, as a lead agency to get that done. The last one, is, it wasn't typed in there after Mr. Blackmore brought it up. It, it's certainly something I've had in here because the accident, death and dismemberment workers' compensation outside of any existing temporary coverages. It is hard, and I, and I don't have the exact wording that Mr. Blackmore used, but it's talking about Algoma insurance and, and where that funding is coming from. If governments change, there's cutbacks, they're gonna they lose some of that. There's trade-offs that are not covered, or are they covered? Those things need to be there, and, and again, in discussions with the executive, is they don't have a full, solid foundation for insurance coverage. We've often said that uh, it's funny how people th think you should uh, mention about thinking outside the box. Well, you shouldn't be in the box in the first place. Being modern, progressive, proactive sometimes means rocking the boat, stepping on toes, but it means you're out front. And you are willing to make changes, a culture of change. Casera spotters on search missions, I think is a really value added to the program. They cannot be used though, unless you have a SAR manager, ops sections chief, police IC that says the train, the topography, geography, the weather is conducive to a fixed wing aircraft over there or a light rotor wing aircraft on the decision of the ops sections chief SAR manager. Because they're the ones that are in there with the weather looking at the situation and know what kind of coverage they wanna get. But certainly, Casera spotters and Casera training spotters is also a great program. It's done nationally, and I think it's a, it's, it's a value added uh, for sure with their expertise through the Royal Canadian Air Force. Casera can also be used for flying overhead. 
at a higher altitude as a radio relay. So we're talking about what's a quick fix. We don't have repeaters nor the radio. If it's available, depending on the weather and other things and icing conditions, et cetera, they can run a communications relay over an area and, and so people can talk to each other. Regular crews on aircraft give you a higher POD. I mentioned this a few slides ago. When they are scanning, much better than part-time observers. People that are trained, retrained, practice, practice, practice. It costs money to do that. So when you, again, you put money in funding and, and sustainability for training development, <coughs> it has to include these recurrency fundings for credibility. There's no doubt that rotary aircraft have changed the way we do business for many, many years. But it's gotta be the right aircraft for the right job. And there's a wide variety of those out there. The deployment of unmanned aerial systems, unmanned aerial vehicles, those legal terms that I'm using. I know people have a tendency to call them drones, but drones are bees. But these UAVs, UASs are a valuable tool, but there are some problems. And, and part of that is the licensing requirement that's been mentioned before, the training, maintaining your pilot proficiency, also be able to fly five kilometers 10 kilometers away from line of sight and do tactical gridding and mapping and photographing the area and then putting all these map sheets together. That technology is there, but you can't legally do it. It's holding, the, it's holding everything back. And I think we have to have some sort of discussion and leverage going towards Transport Canada for the CARS regulations, civil air regulations, to say there needs to be changes for public safety. SAR. Always, you can decision to perform with the closest asset is nice. There aren't enough UAVs to go around the province. There needs to be more. Now, whether that's the small light ones, light, lightweight ones to deploy down the trail or the larger ones that they have here in the rovers, again, it goes back to that's a decision for stakeholders, not for myself. But I, I, I would suspect we need more out there because everybody's saying we'd love to have one that um, Paul French has. Not that it's Paul's, it's, it belongs to the rovers. <coughs> So here's, I mentioned this just a few minutes ago, the train spotters through Casera. Uh, can I just interrupt for a second yes, on the last Yes, sir, point? sorry. So what would, what would enhanced regulations to uh, support um, unmanned vehicles or drones look like to support SAR specifically? Allowing the SAR, as the Rovers as an example, and their $130,000 UAV to be able to fly out of sight. In other words, you can pre-program your UAV to run a grid pattern. That grid pattern based on the platform um, can fly a certain type of distance and it can go out there and it can search, but it can also grid the area and come back with a number of photographs and show you what's out there. But, it, but right now you have to do it within sight. It's to get the regulations changed so you can fly it out of sight. Mr. Smith, those regulations, would they be uh, federal regulations? They are federal okay. regulations. Yes, they are, sir. Yes. But with that being said, I, I know I mentioned that there may have to be some move towards approaching Transport Canada, the federal government, and get support to do that and for SAR missions to change things. Yeah. Thank you. For helicopter operations, uh, again, train spotters through Nelsara and across Newfoundland and Labrador, more spotters. So if a group has two or three, let's get them 10 because those two or three may not be available at the right time uh, to board aircrafts to go do the job. You need more train spotters. Night operations are important. We don't just search during the daytime or from 06 to 1800. We search 24 and 7. Uh, Teledyne produces the forward-looking infrared. And that is the instrument that you see on the, on the bottom of the two helicopters up, up on the screen there now. On the one on the right, it's forward-facing. And in the, on the RCMP one, it's also forward facing with a night sun spotlight in the back of the, of the aircraft. So it's about the size of a soccer ball. You are looking at a television screen about the size of my laptop through a hooded device. The observer has to be highly trained and dedicated and have many hours on the instrument. But they, it's just like looking at a, a black and white TV or now there's color ones. And, and of course, the color ones are very nice because it's like looking at a a uh, small color TV and identifying the objects there through infrared. 
Um, you can identify maggots in a dead dog from a thousand feet. I've done it. Okay, you can identify a lot of things out there. As long as there's a temperature differentiation of 0 0.002 degrees, see, you're good to go. So everything changes based on sun, light, and all sorts of stuff going on. But you've got to be good at it. If, and, and again, if you don't have a full-time crew working on a FLIR, it's part-time results. I know the military do a great job with that. Uh, sometimes in the Aurora aircraft, sir, though, right, it's probably a little difficult because of the speed when you're looking for somebody on the ground and the trees are around that area as compared to out looking for a ship or a submarine. The night sun is also very important, which you see on, the, on those two aircraft there, uh, the uh, EC-130 and, of course, the A-Star B-3. And that's because it can really light up the ground, which makes it easier for searchers to do their job, easier for a canine to do their job. But aircraft operations, I am recommending that that has a capability. There's a difference here between this slide and, and kind of the next couple. You need an aircraft mechanic, of course, AME, to, to, to attach some of these tools to the aircraft, where if you're using a HEX system for slinging Class D, a trained rescue person can put that on the aircraft itself without an AME mechanic being there. They're signed off to do it. Aircraft should be able to perform rescues. It's no good when the helicopter lands, having the crew get out and say, well, now what do we do? So do they go back and get a mountain rescue crew, or do they have the basic understanding and a basic line gear with them to do some, yeah, some low angle, high angle work when they're up there? And SARA and stakeholders can determine the type of aircraft. None of these next pictures are meant to say this is what you should have. No, they're just an example. Helicopter operations, the pilots and crews need to be trained to perform search patterns that are based on the Royal Canadian Air Force's SAR program. That's what's acceptable. Um, a lot of times you'll want those patterns, and you may want a 50% overlap to get higher probability detection values for looking for a lost child in the forest or in forest cover. Uh, and it's important that aircraft crews know how you want them to search. And it's not just going out there and looking around and then developing their own system. An aircraft that has the HEX system on it, a capability, helicopter external transport system, and yes, systems cost $26,000 just to get it. <clears throat> then there's the training and the, and the capability and then also the performance of that. You know, it's got to be there. Um, it, it's a, for a light single engine aircraft, like the EC-130 there, the A-Star, they're great tools. If you get a machine that can hoist winch, like you see here with the Bell 412 and the Cormorant, well, then you get the winching capability, and that's great too. So there's trade-offs. Is one platform going to answer all your questions? I don't know. Probably not. You'd have to have a look at it and do a study and get that study done as soon as you can. There's a lot of good knowledge out there. There's good, a lot of good knowledge in this room. With helicopter operations, it's no good having the crew or somebody get off who does not know how to treat somebody for a traumatic injury or hypothermia. If you have a crew person get out and they just grab a patient, a casualty, and, and drag them to the aircraft, throw them board the aircraft, and then fly off, and that person's mild to severe hypothermic, you could cause yourself a lot of grief. They could go into ventricular fibrillation and they could die. So it's important that the time is spent with the crews being able to perform the job once they get out there and they go on the ground. Thus the aircraft frame. They can land and get it done. It's got to be able to transport patients. One patient, two patients, well, depends on the platform, depends on the aircraft. The aircraft for service should be done provincially. Uh, I know it was brought up to my attention that one aircraft in St. John's is not going to look after the province. I understand that because I've had people in <coughs> uh, different areas tell me that we'd love to have a helicopter up here. Um, and we were just in a community where that was certainly the, the case. And they've had to go through several machines to go and get the job done. So there are trade-offs that have to be determined. You can have a look at uh, the SAR HVA can determine the level of service, which we just went through. This is the HEX system you see here with the Bell 407 on your left at the top of a mountain. And it goes down to being attached to the two rescue personnel on the left with the uh, counterweight bag. The uh, A-Star 
B3 on the right, there it is all laid out, and it's expensive. Um, but it's a system that lends itself very well to mountain rescue, rescue, search and rescue personnel, because those aircraft platforms are usually a little more cheaper and more inexpensive to operate than the larger platforms. And they can also sometimes get in in tighter holes to get the job done. So just to conclude, I'll tell you that the SWOT analysis, um, I mentioned before to some of the members, and sorry, executive, that when the members spoke to me, some of them wanted it off record, some of them wanted it on record, but they were brutally honest. And so then it was documenting that and coming up with the strength, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the threats. Um, and there are different strategies, <coughs> excuse me, strategies to do that, and I went through that process. After, the, after all the questionnaires and all the interviews and visitations. And I, and I believe it worked to our advantage here in SAR for the hearings. I can probably take the questions now, uh, Council, if, if you wanted to, before we're done. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, I've spoken to uh, all the lawyers. I know that everybody will have. Uh, I, I did not speak to the lawyers of the federal government. You were in the room at the time, but I know everybody else will have questions, and, and perhaps uh, uh, Mr. Bedford, Ms. Bedford and Mr. Freeman will also. Uh, I can uh, start with a few questions, and uh, then we can go around the room. Everybody will certainly have their chance. But I will say, as I said yesterday, uh, we regard this as somewhat free-flowing, so if say I ask a particular question that that uh, ties into somebody else's question, don't jump, in, don't hesitate to jump in, and uh, and uh, and we can explore that topic rather than doing it in some of the disjointed fashion. So I have uh, a few things I'd like to uh, explore with you, Mr. Smith. Uh, one thing is we've we've heard some uh, quite a bit, I guess, about uh, about risk, about the. Uh, the risk that searchers have taken on, and we've heard in our in our uh, our hearings around the island, some and here in St. John's, some quite extraordinary stories. We heard about uh, about Mr. Dyson in uh, Makovic out on the open ice, very thin ice, and actually going through the ice. And I believe Mr. Anderson may have as well. We've heard of people also Makovic in the Burton Winter Search. Uh, being out on on a thin ice in their their efforts or great efforts to uh, try to rescue Mr. Winters. Uh, also from a Kovic, we heard about the the search for the downed aircraft. We uh, we heard in the Great Northern Peninsula about the searchers coming back with their skidoos uh, uh, beat up from uh, from operating in very difficult conditions. And uh, and there's a general tendency, I would say, in our culture to celebrate heroism and to to uh, give people rewards for really fearless acts. And against that background and this sort of long-winded question, you talk about the uh, the duty to manage risk, about how not to put a, a searcher in harm's way trying to, or in unacceptably in harm's way in order to uh, to save a lost person. And we heard Lieutenant Colonel Marshall talk about as well about the pressures that Sartex uh, operate under the risk and that some of them have died and uh, why it's important to uh, calibrate that risk. And I guess what I'm asking you now, that's sort of a preamble, uh, at what point is it best to have sort of arbitrary standards like we will not attempt a search if, it's, uh, if the winds are over 100 kilometers an hour or the temperature is below a certain point or what have you, and at what point should that be left to the discretion of the search manager, realizing the pressures the search manager may be under to find a, a child or find a, a, another vulnerable person? Can you tell us a little bit about how that is best managed? Thank you, sir. You need to have a risk assessment process. Certainly, senior SAR managers uh, senior SAR personnel have been able to do this mentally, and so they calculate the risk based on what they're seeing and uncovering out there in the terrain, topography, environmental, atmospheric type conditions. By going through a risk assessment process, you want to make sure that certain avenues are, are covered when we talk about risk assessment for the team. And that guide is there. 
It's local conditions, um, it's local pe people who are be conducting those risk assessments who would have the ultimate say, but by going through the risk assessment process, and there are forms, and there's data collected, and you just fill in the blanks and you check things off to make sure that you are green, amber, red, and it's called SAR, GAR, green, amber, red. And so that's, that risk assessment process has been used for a number of years, different jurisdictions, to really understand you know, the risk involved in, in your mission. And it may be because you have inexperienced people, it may be because the equipment's not what you want, it may be because the weather is, is a factor, but it's calculated. And most good managers have calculated that mentally, and now we need to make sure that it's documented and then they can do that. And if you have a standard format to do that and a guide and, and folks are trained on it, it will help them out as well. But the ultimate decision would be with the IC, looking at a written documented risk assessment and or a discussion between the IC and the ops section chief, the SAR manager, to do that process. But they should have something, they should have a guide or a tool, because somebody's gonna say, well, how, how did you come to make that decision to go out on that SAR mission when all of a sudden you lost two SAR members? And so that would be the issue. And then you say, well, here's what we did. Why didn't you go out and, and search uh, over this area here? Because the risk outweighed the benefit, and it's documented. Okay, Mr. Smith, have you ever been in a situation where the police have said to searchers, you know, we want you to go out and a SAR manager saying, no way, I'm not sending my people out. Have you been in that situation? I'm sorry, could you, sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. Have you been in a situation where the police, the incident commander is saying, you know, send the searchers out and the sort of search manager saying, no way, it's too dangerous. Have you been in that situation? No, I have not personally. I do not know of any cases where that has occurred. I, I know of cases where things have happened. I gave you my helicopter rotor strike as a, as a main example where the uh, search and rescue leader said back to the, the, the police, I see that we're good to go. And then things happen. If you're in the business long enough, hard enough, the spam will hit the fan. Things can occur. But you try and calculate those risks and have a look at it. I've never been in a situation where the police said, you will go or else. No, I've never heard or, or, or know of that personally. Because it's interesting, I mean, I think what we heard in, um, you know, with regard to some of the operations that the commissioner was examining, um, it appeared as though, um, you know, that certainly this, the, the people that were working as the SAR managers with the GSAR teams perhaps had more knowledge about search and rescue issues than the RCMP officer that was the incident commander. And you wonder, you know, at, at who, sh who's, who should be making that decision in that, in that instance where perhaps the SAR manager is, uh, is more experienced, knowledgeable about risks than perhaps the incident commander. Yes, sir, that's, that's a great question and a good statement. Um, in, in my opinion, it's the learned person, which is the SAR manager, the ops section's chief, the tactical commander, advises the incident commander on the plan, resources, and whether we can do it based on a risk assessment and the process they've gone through. And then there's a discussion. And in my opinion, <clears throat> majority of the RCMP officers, RNC officers that I've spoken to, and not just here, elsewhere, will take the advice of the learned uh, volunteer search and rescue person over what they think, what they know. And so they'll, they'll, they'll certainly say no. It's a no-go for launch. It's, it's a red. We're not doing it. Avalanches are a prime example the, uh, and the blizzards. So it, it's also based on the comfort level. And I know um, Mr. Budden here sort of just mentioned about you know, the teams going out in a blizzard. Uh, I've been out in blizzards, sledding, doing different things. I know SAR personnel who have done that. And it's, again, a, a risk assessment comfort level they will accept and deploy. But at any time when they're out there, the risk assessment can be modified and adjusted and they can stop and shut her down or come back. That's part of that process that is constantly evaluated. It's not just done once, it's constantly evaluated as you, as you move along as well. And then that's relayed back to the tasking mandated agency. If that helps. Yeah. Yeah. Just to follow a question, and again I'm struck by Lieutenant Colonel Marshall's uh, point, and if I, if I mis misunderstood you, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, do jump in, but as I understood your evidence, there are sort of red lines that crews will not be in the air more than, or not be engaged more than 15 hours a day. They will not fly when the ceiling's below a certain point. And, and these are lines that 
that uh, that cannot be be crossed by people on the scene. Uh, so it's not up to the crew to say, well, we're feeling pretty good. Let's stay 16 hours. That's an absolute standing order that you, uh, you you stop at a certain point. And as I understand it, the intention is to keep people, to protect people from their own best instincts. And I'm wondering, do such red lines exist uh, in the in the GSAR community? Like, are there rules that basically say you will not search more than 16 hours a day for three consecutive days, or you will not go out in, uh, in weather below minus 40 or any such thing that you're aware of? The SAR plan stipulates fatigue management as part of that process. The guidelines for fatigue management have usually fallen to wildland fire as they start working 12-hour operational periods initially and then finally they go to tens and then they go to eights when they're working through wildland fire that may be after seven, 10, 14 days. As I mentioned before, in your plan, you wanna have that in there. How are you gonna manage fatigue management? How are you gonna deal with people getting tired? You will not have people go over 12 hours. With that being said, the team lead, the SAR manager and consult with each other and the IC, if they've got to transit back for an hour on snow machines and or whatever, skiing back or whatever they have to do, um, certainly I've, I've, I've heard already that, you know, folks will, their mission's over when they're out there and now they have to get back to the command post. So they're just willing to ski back instead of spending the night out there. Because that's why the, the teams are so highly trained and dedicated is because they can spend the night in a location if they have to. They have the equipment to do that. I believe Mr. Blackmore mentioned that the Arctic oven tents were issued to the SAR groups in, in Labrador, just for the revision so they can spend the night out there and then start again the next day. So they, and they can look after themselves. And when they went out for the plane crash and other SAR missions, they had all the tools and all the equipment they needed to camp out, which would relieve some of the fatigue management. So that can be put into the SAR plan, but. It, those items that you mentioned for Lieutenant Colonel uh, Matthews thinking about, yeah, you can't fly more than the you know, 15, et cetera, operational and maintenance and whatever, that's put into your SAR plan is what you want as a guide. Uh, we've heard the term lost person behavior as sort of a term of art used uh, throughout this. And uh, just to, uh, to lead to my question, as I understand it, that's, uh, I guess, uh, a series of publications or methodology that says, if I'm looking for a, a six-year-old child, the child is most likely to be within a half a kilometer of, my, of where the child was last seen, as opposed to a 12-year-old child who might go further, types of uh, lost persons. The, uh, and we've also heard in, in the searches we've looked at that uh, in some cases, at least, individuals have been found outside of where uh, of where perhaps the uh, the manuals might might suggest they they might be, and I guess my question is, how does how should a search and rescue manager or incident commander guard against tunnel vision, and by that I mean it's a term we use in uh, in examining uh, uh, police operations, and it's basically saying, well because. Uh, oh, uh, most uh, women are murdered by their domestic partners, then we will focus on the domestic partner. Uh, that's called tunnel vision. Is there a similar concern in the search and rescue literature as to how to avoid against the predictive, uh, uh, predictive mm -hmm. methods? Yeah, thank you, sir. There is. And it's called the four methods to establish the initial search area. You mentioned lost person behavior. That is statistical data and knowledge. The best lost person behavior you can have for a missing three to six year old would be that data from your community, your area that pertains to you. And that's done through statistical analysis and you work with partners to produce those, those documents. Then you can rely on um, material that's available for lost person behavior from Eastern Canada, <coughs> excuse me, and then from Canada as a whole to rely on that. But those percentiles, so statistics are based on um, your 25 percentile, persons found from the point last seen, the 50 percentile, and then the uh, 75 percentile 
and then sometimes even the 90th percentile. So more people are found closer to the median distance, the 50 percentile, based on the number of cases uh, than any other location, but you still need to search the point last seen going out. But again, you find people in this 50 percentile. If you focused only on that, then all of a sudden you have a really fit, uh, well-educated outdoor pursuits interest young adult. Um, they could certainly go outside of that norm of the 50 percentile of in your case, I think you said 810 meters from the point last seen. So people underestimate the search area because they only focus on statistics to plan their search. They don't focus on the other three methods, which we've mentioned before. So the four methods to establish a search area would be theoretically. Theoretically, how far could this person walk in this kind of environment, this kind of terrain, the overburden in the weather with the equipment they have, based on we've profiled the person. We, we know everything about them and we've got into their head and we know their equipment and all sorts of things so they're quite capable of going this thus far which may end up being two or three times what it says in lost person behavior the next part of that is statistical which we just talked about the next part of that is subjective considerations so the subjective considerations are trained experienced star managers can eliminate vast portions of the search area based on a train and topography analysis person crossing rivers um, would they cross a large open lead, as an example? Would they go over a top of, of, of a mountain? And so that, that also comes into it as well when you're looking at, at the map and you're planning. And the last part of the four methods would be deductive reasoning. Reasoning backwards. So the police do this all the time. Every good detective can do deductive reasoning. It's called analytical reasoning as well, where all of a sudden you find the body, and all of a sudden now you got to reason backwards and how did the body get here? Well, we think in, in SAR, or when we have to look at it, is the clues that are out there from the point last seen heading off in, in a certain type of direction, we want to start deducting that, yeah, the person's not going to climb that mountain, they're not going to go against the, you know, around the base of this cliff, et cetera, uh, because the train takes this kind of footwear, they're probably not going to get farther, they're only in flip-flops, so it's, it's looking at that or they could be injured. So all four methods are used, so you do not underestimate the initial search area, because what typically happens kind of follow up on your question there, is that SAR managers will draw these circles on a map 360 degrees from the point last seen, which is a physical place that somebody saw an individual. And then when they draw those circles on there, they say, ah, the 50 percentile, we're going to concentrate all our resources just around here, we're just 800 or let's say a kilometer from the point last seen, and that's it. And if we don't find the person there, uh, we must, uh, you know, they must have uh, way outside or in what we call the rest of the world. When in actual fact, some cases, based on outliers, um, you know, skewed data, because it's based on normal distribution data, on mode, median, and mean. And then when you get skewed data, I mean, mode, median, and mean are typically all the same in normal distribution, bell curve. But if you get skewed data, then the mode, median, and the mean are different. You want to focus on the median distance because more places are, 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 more positions are found closer to the median than any place else. Also half are on one side, half are on, on, on the other. And if that's all you do, you've missed that skewed data or the person going off on that trail, the old railway bed that goes right through the whole entire area, the nice walk down the drainage that leads you outside the area. They, they kind of miss that, which is now taken way beyond your 50 percentile or your, your data. So, and that's why they miss a child. Uh, they, they miss an individual. They, they've gone outside that. But if you look at the train, yeah, that's part of it. And, and the other thing with the deductive reasoning, that's scenario-based analysis. You're, you're saying, yeah, if I'm a berry picker, where are the best berries? Where am I going to go in a continuous place to go find those, those berries? And then off you go. Does that help, sir? Yeah, that does. And I'm struck by what you said about the 90th percentile. So there's no, nobody would be so arrogant as to say, well, uh, th this is 100th percentile or 99.9. .9. So there's, I would assume there's some humility in that recognizing that predictive models are only even a 90 percent is still one in ten falls outside of that uh, yeah it, it, it's easy to get caught up and lose situation awareness as i mentioned it's about information flow and coordination which you're getting back from the field what the field personnel are telling you it allows you to look at it and constantly modify and adjust your plan as the situation unfolds but you're not going to just focus and say this is it, this is where the person's gonna be found. There's, there's always a chance. So you need that information from the, the guys in the field to say, you know what, this trail's open, this trail's in good condition. This creek bed is dry, the person could have gone down there, way outside the search area. 
So then you start to look at epicycloidal type areas and not just circular radial and not just squares. They're all different shapes and sizes of looking in certain search segments to, to, to get the job done. Thank you. Uh, one thing I'll do, Mr. Commissioner, I have a few more questions, but perhaps we can move on, let other people ask some, and then if, if mine remain uncovered, I'll, I'll return to them at the end. So Mr. Ralph, perhaps Fine. if you want. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Smith, um, I, think, I think it's in your discussion paper you cited um, a search in Newfoundland that was by the Newfoundland Rangers that was quite some time ago, maybe 80 or 90 years ago. Do you remember that? I'm having trouble with well, that's that. That's okay, sorry, sorry but I get, my point being is that it, to me it appears that sort of historically the police have been responsible for, for searches. It's sort of late, it's been, that's... I'm sorry, so did you say 80 or 90 years ago? Yes. Oh yes, I'm sorry, I remember that on the historical side, yes, sorry. Right, no problem. That, but, but it appears as though the police have been, uh, been responsible for, I guess, a search and rescue historically. Is that your sort of sense of things? That is correct, sir. And, um, and, and, I, and I guess in Newfoundland, um, our, our model, uh, or sort of maybe perhaps you can call it our ground search and rescue policy, is that the police are, I guess you say, mandated to do the search and rescues. They call on volunteers, uh, and I guess the volunteers, uh, to, to, to a large extent, have the expertise. And the, the, I guess, government officials, generally speaking, in Newfoundland are not sort of directly involved in a ground search and rescue except uh, when they're arranging air support. Is that your understanding of how? That is my understanding, sir, yes. And um, I guess it, in terms of that model, is, it, is that similar throughout the country? It is variable. I prefer the model where the police are the incident commander and you have strong, hotly trained and dedicated volunteer search and rescue personnel who can go out in the field and do the job. In my opinion, that's one of the better models in North America. There are some models, uh, Ontario and, and uh, Quebec, where they have police search and rescue teams. They have spent a lot of money, time, effort, and equipment to train police officers to go all over the province doing search and rescue operations. And they typically may not use volunteer SAR in their areas until the third or fourth operational period or later on. It's slowly changing, but that's being what they do as a standard. Okay. Um, in some jurisdictions, they'll go right to using the Canadian Rangers if you're up in the, in the higher Arctic, those, those personnel. Right. Yeah. And so why, why it's, your, it's your conclusion that it's better to go with the volunteers as opposed to having uh, teams of policemen trained to do that, that work? Yeah, brr. Train police officers to go do the job, I would not want that. I can't afford it. And so it's a question of, of expenses, you think, or costs? A big part of it's financial. You think you have 90-some personnel who are police officers? It's like your emergency response team, your, your, your SWAT-type teams, right? <laughs> and you have to move them all around the province to go do searches. Uh, they come from different detachments. You're losing some of your policing capability in your local communities already when you start to do that. And how they maintain their competency in those skills after their, after their courses, and then you have the expense of giving them all this gear as well. Um, so, and they would have to gain some knowledge anyway, get local knowledge once they get there. So it's a lot better to have the trained GSAR personnel locally and even have those folks move around the province. It's a very expensive right. option so if, to use law enforcement no, fair enough. research. If I hear you correctly, it's not just a question of cost, then it's actually a question of quality of service. That's it is provided. quality of service. Now, if I have a homicide and I have a perpetrator out in the area, I have a psychotic who could harm themselves or somebody else and or GSAR, I would not use ground search and rescue. Right. So there are certain cases where it's a criminal and or a person who's psychotic capability, I would not use that SAR team. I would use a law enforcement team. That law enforcement team may not be just police. It would be armed law enforcement officers, so it can come from many disciplines in law enforcement within a province. I'll give you an example, it could be a park ranger, conservation officer, fish and wildlife, uh, a sheriff as an example, commercial vehicle, and they would go out and do that with under the direction of the local provincial police. Because um, you've mentioned now, I guess it's interesting to me that you've mentioned a number of plans, the uh, vulnerability assessment, I guess the strategic plan, and uh, the, the, the SAR plan. 
And again, I wasn't, I'm not quite sure, I think you mentioned the vulnerability would not be done by government, but uh, the other plans, again, who, who would be responsible, do you think, for doing your SAR plan and also your, um, your strategic plan? So you have the SAR vulnerability assessment, which we know and understand what that is now. Yes. And that's kind of why I did the education academic side. And then you have that SAR plan. So the SAR plan is your strategic overall plan of, you know, how are you going to do it I'm here? Sorry, so is the SAR plan. plan and strategic plan, are they different things or are the same no, thing? No, they're the same thing. Okay, okay. Yeah, so, and that's the same with, pre, some people call it a pre-plan, some call it a SAR plan or a strategic plan. That's, it's kind of the same thing. <clears throat> but it's how are you going to do business in SAR? You don't complete that plan in isolation. You've got to write your SAR vulnerability assessment first, and that's a team effort with stakeholders who are in the SAR sector. That's why I kind of use that term SAR sector. It's a big part of it. So I wrote it without involving Newfoundland Search and Rescue Association. It would be like, okay, I've probably missed something here. You know, so I would need to incorporate all my actors and, and, and from that sector, including law enforcement, including Parks Canada. And now who actually is gonna write that? Yeah, that's, that's my question. Yeah, I, I know, and I was getting that. So who's actually gonna write that? I would say, um, the volunteers would have trouble writing that without funding, direction, and support. Because you've got to travel. You've got to, you're going to incorporate expenses. And so it's hard for a volunteer sector to do that on their own. But if you had a volunteer sector that was funded, then that's quite possible. It would be the best way to do it. And they're not going to do it in isolation either. They're going to go work with government. And they're going to work with the stakeholders from law enforcement and parks. And also work with Casera and uh, Coast Guard Auxiliary as an, as an example. So, because um, okay, yeah, I think yeah. right now there are really, there's, I would fair to say, no officials in, in, the, in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador who, by virtue of their position, are trained in ground search and rescue. Do you know, I mean, I, and now Mr. Rumble is different because he was an RNC officer who was engaged in that thing, so he was yeah. trained in that. But otherwise, it, there's no sort of uh, official position within government. That would, uh, that would warrant, I guess, uh, the, the training in that at the present time. In your government, that yes, is that's correct, right. sir. Yes, in your government. Yes. In other jurisdictions, they have government workers, employees that do that. And, and so where would that be? So uh, can you give uh, me an Alberta, example of... Um, Alberta, British Columbia, uh, the Yukon's another, another example there where they do that. In Manitoba, it's the fire commissioner's office that does that for GSAR. And so have they, have, the, have those people been, have those officials been involved in the vulnerability assessment? They have. But they so which, play, which one they, would you sort of think is kind of, you know, the, the best, uh, best vulnerability assessment that you've kind of seen? The BC model. Some of, some of what I see, you may find this hard to believe, falls on deaf ears in Alberta. Right. So, and I've really been pushing hard to change that over the years. But BC runs a good program, but $6.6 .6 million buys you a good program. And, and so they have, I guess I, I, mean, I think I understand they have a director, I can't remember the fellow's title, the fellow's name now, but what was that position of a director? Um, Ian Foss, I think. Yeah, is, yeah, sure. And what's his title? He is a director of... I think uh, director of, I can't remember what his exact title is anymore, so I've got a card somewhere, I think, but I yeah. think it's director of ground search and rescue. Yes, right, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry? He's a ground search and rescue He's specialist. Yeah. Title is rescue specialist. And I guess so. So in Alberta, um, I guess perhaps you are most familiar with that system. Can you describe how it works there, in, in terms of again the role of, of government, the role of the police, and the role of volunteers? Yeah, SAR falls under the Alberta Emergency Management Agency, and they fall under the Alberta Emergency Management <laughs> Agency for use in uh, SAR. You've been used in disaster response, but also for funding because they supply the SAR groups with a certain amount of funding. And the funding is coming <coughs> from a couple of different ministries, such as Alberta Parks and Alberta Environment at the presently, putting it into AEMA, as they call it, to kind of look after SAR. They are asking for SAR to be a, uh, a, a governance body under the governor of Alberta at this time. It's just not quite there. I don't understand what you're saying. What do you mean? They're, they're going to be their own entity under government, so a quasi-judicial government body. So that's what they're looking at right now, very similar to the BC-type model. Right. And then they will supply them with funding. They'll report to assistant deputy minister, deputy minister, and go through the same processes that we're all used to. So in, Al in Alberta, so they fall under Alberta Emergency Management Agency. 
they still have a provincial volunteer association called Search and Rescue Alberta, who then has the volunteer teams like it is here throughout the province reporting to them through Search and Rescue Alberta. Right. You know, if, so, I, if I could just yeah, because I think we're on the same topic yeah. instead of me going back yeah. because this came up in our initial discussions and I, I was interested in it because I, and I still I guess I'm, I'm a little lost as to and I think that's probably where you're pursuing your line of questioning in terms of the, the legislative role of search and rescue or, or where does that fit into the mix because I know in your, in your presentation and your recommendations it says to develop legislation regulation policy for SAR. Um, and I know we had referenced the BC situation before, and, and, and since Friday we did our original. I had a chance to look at it's, and I'm not again. I'm not certain the, the BC Emergency Program Act would that be the governing legislation because that seems to be similar in nature to our existing legislation. And again, our legislation seems, and again, Mr. Rumble may be able to, to, to come in here, but. Our legislation seems to be, the Emergency Protection Act seems to be kind of generic. You know, when I talk, it's emergencies in general. When you, you have something what appears to be province-wide as opposed to isolated. And when I went through the, the Emergency Program Act in BC and their management regulations, and they have, they have local authority management regulations, emergency program, the word, sir, doesn't appear in any of them. Like, there, there's no reference. So, uh, you know, when I look at our legislation, I said, well, maybe our legislation's a little antiquated, and BC seems to be the cutting edge. But when I looked at at least this legislation, I, I could stand to be corrected here. Maybe there's other legislation. But I don't see any reference to SAR in any of them. And so I'm wondering, you know, I guess my question is, what, what's the advantageous piece of having legislation, and sh do we all need legislation, or should there be? How does how does SAR operations and legislation fit together? That's what I, I guess I'm missing. I'm not sure exactly where it is in the British Columbia side okay. under emergency management, but it's how they run their Justice Institute and their SAR programs, the Provincial Emergency Preparedness programs, through their emergency management. And unfortunately, I, I, I don't remember where that is. Uh, and a lot of, I think what you're talking about there is it's called emergency services or emergency personnel. But the legislation, in, in my opinion, would just formalize who is responsible for search and rescue in the province and all the coverage that goes with that, role responsibilities and duties, and how all the stakeholders fit in, is how I see it. Now, I know it was a good point that brought up the other day, sir, that it may not have to be legislation. It could just be a regulation under an existing act and a policy. What I'm just saying is there's governance. And it's also been brought up to my attention, <coughs> excuse me, that when I've looked at other provinces as well, it is different because sometimes it's just policy and sometimes it's just a dir policy direction. This is what we'll do as to who's going to write the plan. But if you don't have something from a governance standpoint, either in legislation, regulation, or policy, it could fall by the wayside and it can change going forward in the future. So it, it, it's about the integrity of the SAR program itself. And so how do you govern that without a backing from government under authority? And so Ms., I think Mr. Ralph alluded to the, how the process works, and we all understand, I don't need to reiterate that. So is there, in terms of the call comes in, and I spoke to this yesterday, is there any province, are you aware of any jurisdiction that has a policy? Like we've, we've talked about what the procedure is, but I don't think you can find anywhere. Here's the steps of how this works. I mean, I know the RCMP have their own lost and missing persons policy, and I'm, I presume the RNC probably have their own policy as well. But that doesn't tie in with you know emergency measures and provincial and the federal system. But is there, is there any province that you could go back and say, here's the roadmap of exactly how this works? We've spoken about it. We all understand it and appreciate it. That's why it's accepted. But I have yet to see over the last month or anywhere that where you know, this procedure is laid out. You are correct, sir. It's not articulated or qualified and quantified exactly in any legislation. Okay. It's been what we've asked for and in discussions with the president of SARVAC, Search Rescue Volunteer Association of Canada, in discussions recently, it doesn't mean that we should not do it. It's a way of making sure that you have continuities of programs going forward and all those things that involve search and rescue. And, and so how do you protect the interest of the SAR worker? 
So in Alberta, if you went to the Emergency Management Act, I think it's Section 311.1. I'd have to look it up it's, it's on, online, but it mentions the SAR and because they're using search and rescue for disaster response, and, they're, and they are covered. And they're the only ones that are actually mentioned in, under that act. Okay. But it doesn't outline exactly the SAR plan that you're taking. No, it does not. Yeah, and I think that leads to, you know, Mr. Ralph's point of, yes. you know, who's responsible for what plans, what, what course of action. Okay. Correct. So my opinion and going forward is there should be direction. There should be some way of doing it. And if, and if government would say, we believe that the RCMP are responsible for search and rescue, then you're, and say they will develop the SAR plan, that's what you'd have if you don't have okay. I'm governance. That's fine. Yeah. Thank you. So just, I'm just curious, so in, in your jurisdiction, in terms of um, funding, how does funding work in Alberta? I think you mentioned that basically there was, it comes from two departments, and what kind of levels of funding do you have there? The funding there is for training only at this point in time. There's no funding for, uh, um, for operations and no funding for... Uh, for no, the, op the operational funding, it comes out of the police budget through, through Justice Solicitor General. If, if K Division RCMP, uh, for some reason, don't have the money at the end of the fiscal year, and, and then it comes out of the Solicitor General's warrant for financial accountability. Right. There's always money for SAR, but it comes out of the police budget. Right. So is there any other province that's similar to British Columbia at this point in terms of um, uh, funding? No, sir, there are not. And I guess it's, I mean, I, so I guess it's kind of difficult, I suppose. So basically, if you were to look at, if you were to compare provinces, you'd have to look at money that's spent sort of through police forces. So is that a situation? I mean, is there, are there police forces in Alberta that give money to uh, uh, GSAR groups to buy things? No, the provincial money covers all the training for all SAR groups in the province, including the ones in Edmonton and Calgary. There are several city municipal police forces in Alberta, as you're aware. Calgary, Edmonton, Metastat, Lethbridge, Brooks, Tabor, uh, going on. And it's up to them to supply any money, but it's not like every year they give twenty five, fifty, hundred thousand dollars as does not happen. The training comes provincially for all those groups situated there. Operationally, when SAR has expenditures, they're covered under law enforcement. The team has put in expense claims and they're all covered under the law enforcement budget. Right, but that would be just sort of, you know, per diems and, and travel, that type of thing. Not, you know, if you've got to rent a building or pay for a building to no. house your equipment and no. stuff like that. Critical infrastructure, infrastructure is not covered at all. The Alberta model now is, there's a, um, and Mr. Blackmore can correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's a $2.2 million NIFT National Initiative Fund grant they have now to re-examine the Alberta model. They have, <coughs> right now they have full-time people hired, I believe it's three people that are hired to do exactly what we're doing right here before an inquiry. That's what they're doing right now in Alberta. Right. So that, that, when did that start? When did that work start? Just this year, right? Was that sure. a SAR, I'm sorry, that was a SARNF grant to... Yeah, uh, so to it started the, this year. And to whom did that grant go to? I'm just curious to hear. It went straight to us. Oh. That grant went to SAR Alberta. It started this year for a three-year program. And it's uh, set up to restructure Relook at everything that they're doing, make sure that it's done properly, and come up with a basically <clears throat> a list of recommendations they're going to give the government. I'm sorry, so uh, Harry, who did that money go to? Did it go to Search uh, and Rescue Alberta? Yeah. Search and Rescue Just Alberta. the same as it would come to in El Sarah. In El Sarah. No different. Right. I'm going to jump in before you. Uh yeah, well, I, you know, your thoughts I, 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 I was going to suggest that perhaps I could uh, uh, stop asking questions for a few minutes and then perhaps jump in later. All the time. Okay. So uh, don't you agree, though, that for Newfoundland Labrador, where every search is a potential uh, police investigation and can switch at any moment, that really it should start off under the aegis or the authority of... Uh, the police in most respects or in all respects for this province? Commissioner, uh, thank you very much. Yes, um, you never know what you have until you find the ultimate clue, person being sought after, and it could be a sexual assault and homicide. Uh, the police have to be the lead agency. They are responsible for all missing person incidents and, and the investigation, and, it, and it, a majority 
of all of the search and rescue teams in North America fall under the law enforcement umbrella or community. There, there's no really outside. There's the odd emergency management one in, in uh, some of the states, but they all primarily fall under the local sheriff and or police agency. And it's, and it's the same, and it's, and sorry, Commissioner, it's the same in the UK. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Um, Mr. Smith, so I'm just trying to understand, we're talking about, it sounds like two major documents, uh, the vulnerability assessment and the SAR plan, which is also called the pre-plan or the strategic plan, is that correct? That is correct, sir. Okay, and so your, in your, your assessment, I guess the vulnerability assessment comes first? That is correct, sir. And are you thinking that that would be a, like, who would be the whole, I, I understand it would require stakeholders to participate in those conversations uh, to create this vulnerability assessment, you would basically, what does that look like? You look at your province and you see where, if you have a lot of search and rescue operations happening in Butterpot Park or something, um, then you know you have to focus on that area. Is that what a vulnerability assessment looks like when you start out? How does, how does it, can you tell us a little bit more about that? It, it does do that, sir, in one aspect, but it doesn't mean you just focus on that area. It, it, mean, it means that you are going to identify that as a problem area based on the hazards, the, ge the geography, the demographics, who's using it, the, ter you know, uh, the, the train comes into it, uh, what equipment and training is required <coughs> to go in there and look after the incidents. So you, now you have identified a high use area. But you wanna do the SAR when provincially so that you know throughout the whole entire province where are your problem areas? Where are you getting all the calls, all the cases? What kind of cases are they? And then that allows you to go from there and develop a plan. So that's just one part, uh, the, the locations of, of interest is just one part of this vulnerability assessment, is that what you're saying? Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay, but so it's, it's a, if it's a province-wide review, the vulnerability assessment it is? Yes, sir. It would be, a provincial document, you would think, uh, is what I'm driving at, as opposed to where we have two police forces um, and Parks Canada. I mean, these may, may be stakeholders who'd participate in that conversation, but who would hold, who be the holder of this document and the maintainer of it? And if I assume it would be a living document, it might change every five years, or um, I'm just trying to understand whose document that might be if the commissioner is recommending, for example, uh, a vulnerability assessment should be written. Well, who's who's uh, gonna be responsible for that, or who should be? Thank you, sir, that's an excellent question. Well, the tasking mandated agency, through the governance, through the province, would be responsible for that. So if you're responsible for search and rescue, that's search and rescue vulnerability assessment, that is yours, because you are responding. You're getting paid to do that job. The example of Parks Canada, they complete the process in the national parks. So then when it comes down from the vulnerability assessment, you go to the, the SAR plan. Um, again, you're gonna need stakeholders to participate in conversations to get that SAR plan together. And again, if it's a recommendation that's coming out of this inquiry, you know, ideally, I know we don't have a lot of other provinces to compare to by the sounds of it, but ideally, who's the holder or the keeper or maintainer of, of that SAR plan? Would it be NL SARA if they had proper funding and support from stakeholders? Or would it be the province? Or would the two police forces have uh, two different ones? Or I, I'm just trying to get a sense of this. It doesn't sound like there's a lot of precedent for it, maybe BC, um, but I, I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that if, you, if I may. Very good, sir, thank you. There would be an overall strategic provincial plan owned by the government, which would take it up really to say that RNC, RCMP are SAR providers, then they would end up having the operational plan of how they're gonna do business, and, that, and also input from the SAR sector and their, and their stakeholders. So the, the government plan, as I see it, would not be you know, that thick, so to speak. It would be a, a document that says, yeah, who's, who's gonna provide SAR services in our province? 
uh, based on contractual obligations, obligations and going forward, but realistically it's the SAR provider again, the agencies having jurisdiction would typically do that plan. Okay, thank you. Um, I understand you were involved with the creation of some, or consultation on some RCMP policy back in 1995, is that correct? That is correct, sir. And the, the, the sort of that, that document or that policy creation has uh, evolved up into today's RCMP search and rescue policy, is that right? That is correct. And so I, I understand, I think you generally have a favorable view of the RCMP's search and rescue policy as it stands today. Yes, sir. In, in reviewing the policy, both the national policy and the B division policies, which we'll speak to here, it's a very good search and rescue policy overall. It is. There are some minor adjustments I think need to be made to that, but it's nothing that affects the operational capability of the stakeholder agency having jurisdiction. Okay, thank you. Um, you had mentioned Transport Canada and drones uh, during your presentation. And uh, you may have noticed my ears perked up a little bit, of course, you hear anything aeronautical and federal is, uh, is a very esoteric and complicated area. I just wanted to, and I don't, uh, certainly don't mean to be adversarial with you, sir, at all, uh, but I, uh, I wonder, you don't have any particular expertise in uh, aeronautics or no, the sir. aeronautics act? No, sir, I, I, I do not. I'm speaking as a uh, ground search and rescue expert with a knowledge of that we have to use UAVs, UAS systems uh, out there, and that there are some restrictions at this point in time. And you, so you would sort of defer to the expertise of uh, the Aeronautics Act or the aeronautics regulations uh, when it comes to what's safe or not when it comes to drone operation? Yes, for the cars regulation, yes, for sure. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. And I just had a, a very minor um, point we wanted to make about uh, your discussion paper, which I know is sort of the jumping off point for our... Uh, for our discussions here. Uh, this discussion paper, I think, is, uh, Madam Clerk, if you could call it up for us, please. I think it's Exhibit 83. We'll have to switch screens every now and then. I think we're looking for section 4.3, which is page 10. As, as I said, it's just a minor thing. It's a very extensive paper, obviously, so this is just a, a small item. But the uh, first paragraph there, under 4.3, it says, ground search and rescue searches for lost and missing persons and walkaways from downed aircraft. Yes, sir. Yeah. So I'm just, uh, we're fairly certain that that would be a federal uh, response in that scenario there, where you say ground search and rescue uh, for lost and missing persons and walkaways from downed aircraft. I think the, um, I think that one may be a federal search if it's a walk away from a downed aircraft, at least we're fairly certain that that is the case. Is that just a, perhaps a, a, an error there or? No, sir, I disagree with you. Okay. The walk away is a missing person. If there is an injured person on board the aircraft or beside the aircraft or it becomes a Royal Canadian Air Force responsibility, if it's a walk away from the aircraft that is now a police responsibility and a search responsibility, if the person's a fatality on board the aircraft, beside the aircraft, it becomes a police responsibility. Now that is my understanding from policy and working as a practitioner in the field. Okay, um, and so this, the source of the information that you're providing there is uh, your experience, I guess, or your uh, recollection of? Yes, sir, part of it's experience and part is the recollection of the, of the policy. Now, unless the policy has changed recently that the RCAF is now responsible for walk away from aircraft, but I've uh, worked with um, the RCF and the CIFSAR school out of, out of Comox, and through discussions with them and training with them, they have advised myself as well that walkaways, somebody may go 5, 10, 20 kilometers, is a police responsibility. Okay. Um, well, I don't know if uh, Lieutenant Colonel Marshall can weigh in yeah, on that as well, because well, he has some sure. expertise in that area, and it's just one of those things, and I apologize I hadn't brought this up previously, but we just uh, came up in passing, and I thought it yeah. might be a minor thing, and if there's more complicated, then so be it, but uh, yeah. I don't know if you have anything to say on that, uh, Lieutenant Colonel. Yeah, absolutely. Lieutenant Colonel Marshall, um, I, I did notice that in, in the uh, document there, and I thought it was curious, so I did reach out again to my uh, OACs of the uh, JRCCs, and uh, they agreed with me where 
we don't really search for airplanes in an aeronautical event. We search for people. So even if we found the airplane empty, we would still consider the people, the walkaways, mm -hmm. our responsibility. Um, now, there's no specific uh, legislation or policy that says that. It's just, as yeah. it's your understanding, it's a ground star event, it's our understanding that that's still an aeronautical event. Yeah. Anyway, that's why it's a round table, I guess. Well, as long as we have somebody looking for the lost yeah. missing person from the aircraft, the walkaway is the most important. Precisely. And using both assets, I think that's important. I was about to make the same point. Better two, two agencies looking than yeah. none at all. Perhaps. Yeah. Uh, we don't have any more questions right now for Mr. Smith. Um, Mr. Budden, I will mention, um, and I didn't, we didn't get a chance to talk during the break, but uh, Lieutenant Colonel Marshall did have some statistics and things that you had requested when we were back in Makovic. Um, and if you have time this afternoon, he could speak to that as well. But I don't want to uh, interrupt Mr. Smith's evidence right now, but I just wanted to let you know that. Thank you. I think, uh... Thank you. I think we will have time at the end of today. If not, you'll be here tomorrow, will you, Lieutenant Colonel? We'll get to you, if not today, then tomorrow. Thank you. Do you wish to take a quick break, Mr. Commissioner? 15 minutes, sir.
All rise. This commission of inquiry is now in session. Please be seated. I believe where we uh, left things, Mr. Uh, Commissioner, was the uh, council for the federal entities had, had, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, finished their questions. So we should now, I guess, the normal progression move on to uh, Mr. Williams and Mr. O'Keefe for their parties. And myself and Mr. Ralph, I think, each have a few more questions. Um, do you, would you like to go first or? Okay. Um, I have, uh, I just have two or three areas that I want to touch on, uh, Mr. Smith. Um, and one is that, you know, looking at some of the materials that are out there, I noticed that you had referenced it in your presentation, uh, federal provincial partnerships uh, in, I think it's uh, slide 84, it was federal provincial partnership funding for indigenous SAR programs. Um, and you specifically identify that. And I referenced previously uh, in McCovic, in the Senate report that was done, and again, we're not going, but that was again a, a review of search and rescue, albeit marine search and rescue, but there was a number of recommendations that came out of that report um, that identified specific recommendations in relation to indigenous communities um, and, and things that could be done as a benefactor of that. And, then as I, I had referenced in our, my discussion with Mr. Ralph earlier, I had had an opportunity to, to look at some BC legislation and, I, and just by coincidence happened across the fact that BC has um, uh, emergency legislation and indigenous communities and the quote I found was the government of Canada and the province of British Columbia have a 10 year bilateral agreement to enhance the delivery of emergent, emergency management support services uh, to First Nations communities in BC. So there seems to be a recognition of a uniqueness to indigenous communities. And I don't think it's fair to say that it's a uniqueness to necessarily just northern indigenous communities, because obviously, you know, it's not, uh, indigenous communities aren't, are not uh, restricted to the north. In terms of your review and consideration of, of SAR programs, is there anything in particular that you could draw our attention to in terms of one, what you think is lacking in terms of support services for indigenous communities and the fact that, um, you know, one of the focal points of our, um, our uh, inquiry is a loss that happened in Northern Labrador that involves a number of coastal communities with a, a heavy indigenous influence. Are there, is there anything in particular that comes to mind that you think we should be cognizant in considering indigenous communities in the SAR program? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, yes, there are. In really spending that time in Makovic um, and, and embracing uh, the, the people that were there. We, we had the opportunity to walk around the community again with uh, Mr. Barry Anderson. And, it, and, and in discussions, I, I realized that the Canadian Rangers have a junior Canadian Rangers program. And th th those young adults kind of stay in that Canadian Ranger program, but there, there is the potential there for a youth education preventive search and rescue program within the youth community, which would help engage uh, young Indigenous youth in a search and rescue explorer or search and rescue um, rover program. And it would be up to the uh, NSARA group folks to determine, you know, which terminology they'd like to use. So education uh, for search and rescue uh, for young adults and maybe leveraging on the school diploma system as we've done it elsewhere. Uh, regarding that, I think would be really advantageous as one. Uh, the second part of that would be a uh, off-highway vehicle, um, over-snow vehicle, snowmobile program, for, again, for preventive search and rescue that does involve uh, technology, uh, such as the in-reach or the personal locator beacon. It was brought to our attention in those communities that we have um, indigenous people going out in the land with really no emergency beacon, Aircraft have an emergency locator transmitter, ELT, but the snowmobiles do not. 
Would we need that on every snowmobile in the province? I do not think so, but definitely with, with folks who are doing much longer trips, hunting, fishing, going out on the land, uh, spending time out there, the personal locator beacon and or an inReach program I think would work very well there with SAR and a partnership with NSARA to, to, for training and, and development and, and the management of those beacons. But of course, people in the local community can also get involved with management through training and development side. The third part of that uh, would involve the Coast Guard Auxiliary and or the water uh, side water vessel training. And I know for many years, uh, law enforcement agencies were involved with the education side of um, uh, small vessels regulations under the Canada Shipping Act, but now with the Coast Guard Auxiliary and the contacts in those communities with ANSARA, who were teaching the small vessels uh, and um, education preventive SAR programs, there is another opportunity there as well for NSAR to get involved in doing those programs. But I, my understanding that the funding has been re returned or cut back when it came to that, but definitely uh, the water vessel. So this pertains to going out on the land, uh, and, uh, which a, a lot of folks do, I mean, as, as we know. So those are preventive SAR programs. That leads you into people's interest in joining ground search and rescue. So then you end up with the recruitment and then to foster that through NSARA as, as well as part of the training avenues. Um, are you familiar with the Smart Ice program that exists? The, the group called Smart Ice. Yes, but not, I just know of it. And yeah. again, I, and I have very limited yeah. knowledge myself, but this is a, a, a group that my understanding is that are involved in uh, the use of technology uh, in northern areas and with changing climate change and the impacts on ice uh, with respect to providing supports and education to local communities in the north with respect to considerations for operating both on the land and on the, on the, on the water. Um, are you able to, to speak to that at all? Thank you, sir. Not really. I don't have an in-depth knowledge of that at all. I, I just know the program. I've read about it and looked at it uh, online. But I, I will say the, uh, the SARVAC programs on, on, on ice safety, but what they're doing involves the climate changes, I remember, and, and traveling and, and the changes. And I believe we had conversations, uh, again, in Makovic, specific to it's different now than it was 10, 30 years ago. And people in the community are, are, are telling us that. So yes, that Smart Ice program would take that expertise and work it with the community members and, to make a difference. Again, I, I know a little of it. I'm just, in fact, yeah. I'm just, I was just looking at something online as she was speaking. It says, it's an innovative program called Smart Ice. It's putting new technology in the hands of people in the north to reinforce their traditional knowledge of sea ice in the face of unpredictable changes in conditions. Uh, and I have made, I've made contact with that group in preparation for the inquiry. And I, they do have a, an educational program that involves the youth of that area. And I wonder whether or not something of that nature would be also beneficial in terms of, you yes, know, yes, educational sir. Components. Yes, sir, 100%. You can't do enough education in, in communities. Um, I, I think it's really important, especially with peoples that spend a lot of time on the land, uh, traditionally, and also for hunting and fishing and, 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 and tour guides as well. Okay. Yeah. The next uh, area I'd like to touch on, it was, and again, it was just triggered by the, uh, <clears throat> the Federal uh, Marine Search and Rescue Inquiry um, and uh, the Senate Committee Inquiry. Um, and there was a recommendation that came out of that report. It said the committee recommends that as a pilot project, the Department of National Defense authorizes a civilian helicopter, uh, civilian helicopter operator to provide aeronautical search and rescue coverage uh, in the Canadian Arctic and in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, are you familiar with any other similar types? And I'm, I'm not speaking just to that recommendation, it's just that, that kind of triggers where I'm leading with this, is that are you familiar with any other pilot type projects? Because, you know, we, we have a tense tendency to talk about helicopters like they're, they're Volkswagens, you know, when you get in depth conversations like this. But obviously, the involvement of any new helicopter program, whether it be provincially, federally, or otherwise, is an expensive undertaking. So are you familiar with any other similar type pilot programs if it was to be recommended that such a program be undertaken from a study perspective as to utilizing in this particular case, because I think it's been highlighted that the, the void in nighttime um, applications of helicopter search and rescue here in the province? 
Thank you, sir. I, I do not know myself personally of any other programs across the country. So there's, you're not aware of any models that might be able to be adopted or anything that we might be able to consider in terms of that? No, sir, not at this time. I know of public-private partnerships with aircraft, uh, the City of Calgary being one of them, where there was fundraising for two uh, uh, AC-130 uh, helicopters, Eurocopters, for that city, all raised by private funding. And then the city partnership was the maintenance of the aircraft and, and the crews. Um, and then there was a, another um, private company that also donated uh, to that cause as well for, um, going forward. But okay. But that's um, the one I know of. Yeah. Another piece that, in, in reviewing your, your presentations, uh, there seems to be a gap with respect to the whole communication piece. And, um, and where I'm leading with that is not necessarily communication between SAR resources, it's communications with survivors and families. Uh, because there, obviously, every time you have a SAR mission, there's somebody <coughs> affected by that, whether it be the individual who's being looked for or family or loved ones. Um, and I don't see a whole lot in terms of specifics in relation to, you know, the, the SAR program, how it should work, and but it seems to be a gap in the communication piece. And in particular, I mean, it's come up on a numerous occasions throughout this inquiry about the mental health element of that and, and medical mental health, medical aid. And that seems to be a gap. Is, there, is that because you don't think there's a need for it or do you see a need for any enhanced programming or recommendations in respect to that whole communication piece and support piece? I, I see a gap there, sir. And I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, I had it in my slide as, as, a, as, a, as a point because I think it's important um, if ANSARA or SAR sector stakeholders um, are involved, engaged in a mission, then after that mission and you go through the after action report, that's typically done for the operational side. The family communications gap has been left to, let's say, police community services uh, teams to look at on, on the recommendation of, a, of, of the local police, where I mentioned that we should have an answer back from them as to, you know, what happened in your perspective with the SAR program and the emergency services that were delivered to you or your family? So it's like having a gap analysis with the family and having people that can mentor and bring that out. I see that as a missing piece and I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up. And then having it go back to the SAR group and the, and the SAR agency having jurisdiction, the stakeholders, and say, um, here's what we understand that, that's occurred from, from that individual's perspective, that they were out there for 12 or 14 hours and before they got the service, even though they activated the spot or the inReach or did something. I mean, it's just, you know, you have to look at it that way. That's exactly what happened. It's not to say fault causes, it's to say, you know, how can we improve? And then to go back on the SAR group as, in, a, in a positive light and saying, this is what we've learned. Here's some changes, which require some changes to training, development, standard operating procedures, and or yeah, you did a great job. We just failed to get back to the family. That also comes, though, in my experience, and I've had this with lost and missing children. It's to go back and with the parents and with community service officers and re-interview re those children to kind of say, you know, recreate the missing person incident to help us with data and data collection in the, in the future, but to really understand from a lost person behavior standpoint, so what we call the some cognizant recognition factors. Why did you go left and why didn't you go straight down the trail? And what actually happened there to really start learning, you know, from, from those youth and from those people. And you can take that to all levels of people. It's just, it's a timing thing and time management for that. So that's that service delivery communications piece that I could see coming back and being developed, but that's an investment. So would you see that being um, something that could be added? Because I, I think, you know, when we went through it, as, as you properly described this morning, the, the academic, side of, of search and rescue. Um, and it, it lays out, you know, policies and formats and procedures, manuals, et cetera, as to how operations should be conducted and who should be in charge of things. But again, it doesn't appear that the communications piece is fit in there. Is that something that should be addressed, that that those involved in, in SAR missions should have a set, a set protocol in place as to how to deal with, whether it be through debriefing through SAR technicians through the police resources or the community, because I think in the case of John Doe, it became very apparent that there was a significant community piece that could have been involved there to avoid this from being as repetitious as it was, you know? Yes, sir. That, that can be included in 
standard operating procedures as part of what you want to do operationally after a search and rescue mission. And that can be, that can be written in, and I agree with your concept there. I, th I think it's, it's a, a good um, communications piece that has not been addressed in the past. I just just for your Williams, information. If, uh, I'm sorry, if the, if the Winters would like to weigh in on, that, on this discussion, just to open sure. it up for them. Is that, it, would anybody like to, to speak to this? There's, there's one other point I'd like to touch on because it comes directly from the family at the break, and, and then maybe we'll open it up if anybody would like to speak uh, to any aspect that I've raised, and, and this one in particular, and it, it probably comes out of our discussions prior to the break, and, and we, were, we were discussing it, you know, and, and I, think, uh, I think one line that was very, very up to, uh, you know, very characteristic of the discussions was that uh, one of the family members has said, you know, it seems like everybody's in the sandbox, but they're not playing together. Um, and that it's, it seems disjointed in the sense that, you know, through all the, the academic professional uh, discussions that we've had over the course of this day, at the end of it, they're left to think, and, and correct me if I'm not categorizing your, your comments to me correctly, but they're left to feel like there's no rule book. You know, the questions that Mr. Ralph raises, okay, well, you know, who's responsible for drafting the, you know, the specific plan? And then we speak to, you know, the order procedure as to who gets called, but we can't, we can't point to a piece of legislation or policy or regulation as to where that outlines. Can you understand or can you appreciate the concern that the family sees, you know, having sat down and listened to, to all our discussions over the last five hours, that it seems like there's no rule book out there and that, you know, everybody has an understanding of what their role is, but if you were Joe Blow to come into the room and say, mm -hmm. okay, can you show me the document that shows how this search and res rescue stuff works in the country that we can't point in? The RCMP have their own procedures, the RNC have their own procedures, you know, search and rescue have their own procedures. I'll throw that out there. I don't know if that accurately reflects and your comments or if, or if anybody in the family wants to add or elaborate, uh, elaborate to, to what I've characterized as your concerns. Did, have I characterized it appropriately? Okay, sure. Well, sir, um, again, again, with all due, res due respect, the family and you, sir, um, I'm here because I, there's been a missing piece over the years. Um, I have failed to do it as myself and I've gained experience because of it. Yes, you're absolutely right. Playing in the sandbox together may not have that appearance, but the SAR operations is working well together as a whole. They're, it's never perfect, but more often than not, it's working great. It's working well uh, with all the agencies that are there. What, what we fail to do is after the SAR mission is to sit down with the family and or individuals and bring them into a debriefing and, and a critique process. I think that would be really value added and, and, and important because then they have a full understanding of plans, goals, objectives, strategy and tactics, how it unfolded. Because if you're not briefing the family twice every operational period, on their missing loved one and what's going on, they don't have that situation awareness themselves. And, and, that, and, that is, and that's a failure of our system. We all get hung up and we're all, and we're all really busy um, in, in doing that and, and allow them to have a bit of a uh, critique process themselves. But it's, it's to take their interest and take, and take it at heart so that we can improve ourselves uh, as, we, as, we, as we move along. And I guess the uh, interesting point as well, because it seemed to me that uh, during the course of this inquiry, there were times when the families learned a lot about the search during the yes, inquiry, correct. and it was kind of it, it was I was it was interesting to learn that I think you know certainly there's there's a couple uh, operations where the family learned a great deal, and you wonder whether that should have been available. That information should have been available right after uh, the the operation ended. Is there, is there anything else left that, that anybody would like to, to speak to from the family? Sure. I just wanted to mention as we had discussed, uh, as we had discussed briefly, but thinking over all of this and we, we discussed it just a few minutes ago. Um, okay. Uh, just to mention, as you had said, that everyone is all playing in the same sandbox, but working in different corners, working with different policies and guidelines. 
working for the same goal, but not really communicating to each other. And we don't see that standard or standardized mm. plan working with the feds, with the province, with the GSARs. And we have people like Mr. Blackmore who's volunteering so much of his time to search for missing people and so many others like him that commit to saving lives when someone is out there. And I think, or I, I would like to recommend that these parties all come together and work together, communicate together for the best outcome so that people don't have the same outcome that we had to face. Thank you. If there anybody else would like to have any comment or? Here now, okay. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to Mr. Blackmore too for everything you guys did. But same as my mother said, I find the federal part of it was a little disconnected from what should have been. But like everybody's saying right now, they all need more communication to see outcomes so we wouldn't have to go through things like this and more people don't have to go through things like this. And I found our family was lied to so much right from the beginning and the lying has made me feel like I got no trust in like the higher part of it. But with the search, ground search and rescue, I feel like I can trust them with my life. But everybody else, if I got lost today, I wouldn't trust nobody else to search for me. And that's pretty much all I got to say. Thank you. Okay. Are those your questions, Mr. Williams? Uh, yes, those are my questions. Thank you. I believe Mr. O'Keefe is the last counsel who has yet to have the opportunity to ask any questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Budden. <clears throat> um, Mr. Smith, I have um, a couple of questions. I represent the Concerned Citizens for Search and Rescue, as you know. And um, we have two of our members here today, Mr. Mervyn Wiseman and Captain Wilf Bartlett. And uh, they've given me some questions. Um, I want to start off with, with a general question, and then I want to ask a specific question that touches on um, this MOU that was referenced in your recommendations. The first question is, um, and, and I appreciate your presentation, um, but throughout the presentation, and I saw it Friday, I saw it again today, I don't get a good sense of where Newfoundland and Labrador sits in the national picture. You presented to us um, significant experience in North America, uh, in the United States, um, attending European conferences and so forth. Um, I guess to put it simply, how does Newfoundland and Labrador's search and rescue system compare um, to the others in Canada? And specifically, you had mentioned British Columbia being, I think you had said that's, in your view, the best of the, of the systems we have. Where do we rank compared to those, to those other provinces? Thank you, sir. I had a slide that dealt with Newfoundland search and rescue, SAR workers, SAR providers, SAR responders. And I presented that slide to the hearing in all sincerity. The individual search and rescue worker here is highly dedicated and trained and has committed many, many hours to providing search and rescue services through Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, and they have made sacrifices. Um, it is some of the infrastructure, some of the governance uh, that doesn't always come together like you want, and then some of that is to self uh, or sustainable funding. To say that one system is better than another system, there is no one system across Canada and the world that's going to fit everybody's model. We are similar, but there are differences. 
Um, the system is fragile. And w what I like to either train to or help people with is that resilience. Um, it, it can break, and it can break based on hours that are being inputted to do things where, where folks want to maintain their time for operations. It, it can break because of lack of infrastructure and, and the maintenance. The resilience would be having a strong governance and having strong plans and strong SOPs and a strong engagement from the SAR sector and the stakeholders to improve upon that asset delivery with personnel and, and equipment. Um, to say that we could take the BC model, maybe just half the amount and bring it here is, and it's, everything's going to be right, no, it's, it's not necessarily going to work. Um, we are all different in this great country of ours, and we need to have that uniqueness in the public safety sector. Uh, you've got a great delivery vehicle here, and I know I may be going around your direct question, but you have excellent SAR services here with the SAR personnel and the equipment they have that they fundraised to make it happen to save lives. Can it be improved upon? Every system can be improved upon. That's why I mentioned about giving best practices. So to say that you're number two, number three, number 10, no, not at all. I would never do that. Um, you can't do that um, because of the uniqueness of what we have and some of those factors I mentioned in the SAR vulnerability assessment. The people here going back many, many years have de de dedicated themselves to search and rescue, whether it was the Canadian Rangers, uh, sorry, the uh, Newfoundland Rangers, uh, the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary, uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, uh, the, the volunteer programs that started in the late 60s, early, early 70s, they've all made a significant difference and uh, they will continue to do so. And even if there was never any aspect of improvement, I can tell you by talking to so many folks, looking at what they have and what they do in their community out of love and passion, they will still stay committed to search and rescue and they will still do it. And even if you took everything away, they would still do it. And that is you can't put a price on. That you cannot replace. And that's to be commended. That's, that's for sure. Um, so it, it's very difficult, sir, to, to say that Ontario system is the best way to go and that's the model and you fit number four. No, it, it just doesn't work that way. I'd like to say there's a measurement tool, but there's not because of what you have here. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate your answer. Um, you didn't answer the question, but I appreciate everything you've said. Um, let me just try to rephrase this um, in a way that maybe makes a bit more sense. So in your presentation, you've outlined, uh, in addition to your experience, numerous factors that you would take into consideration in advising on best practices, how to come up with a search and rescue system that's effective and efficient. And there are a number of different factors. You went through them. And if I was to take all those factors and put them on a checklist, OK, and do essentially a triage and say, well, look, I've got 10 areas that need to be covered off to have an effective search and rescue system. And you know, of those 10 areas, I can break them down into 10 points each. So I got a 100-point scale. And if I fall below 60, then I've got a really big problem. If you were to do that kind of a triage in our system, because I expect you've, based on the questionnaires and all the other things that you've done since you've been here, if you did that kind of a triage on our system, what I'm asking is, relative to what you've observed in other provinces, where would we be on the scale? Are we, are we at 60%? Are we at 70%? Are we at 30%? Where is your sense of where our province sits on that scale? And I'm not asking for, just to be clear, I'm not asking for a comment on specific search and rescue teams in Newfoundland. I'm talking about our system and the resources that we have available as they're used in our system. Where is your sense of where we would fit relative to the other provinces in Canada? Thank you, sir. Uh, I respect your, your question. It's difficult. Um, yourself and some other provinces are in that 70% range, if I was to weigh it out. I, I wouldn't be the only GSAR expert or person who could bring in here to look at this after a, a gap analysis or, or a SWOT, whatever you want to call it. Many provinces are there. It's often been an overlooked area, and it's often been relied upon for the search and rescue personnel from the volunteer associations to provide as much level of service as you can. And, and 
it, it's never had that full government support. Okay, and, and it's just a, it's a fact that we've had in, in Canada. So uh, I'm not sure if that helps or not, uh, but there are other provinces in your position. Sir. No, it is helpful. And just focusing on that point, so you say there are a number of provinces in this 70% range, and I think maybe it's fair, uh, fair to say that no province, no search and rescue system anywhere is going to be at 100% based on what you've told us, and I think that's just common sense. In terms of the recommendations that um, you would have coming out of your review of our search and rescue system, um, what are the critical, in your view, critical steps that would need to be taken to get us to, the, uh, among the higher ranges in Canada, assuming, for example, that British Columbia is the gold standard, if you will, and I'm just using British Columbia based on what you told us earlier, what are the, criti the mission critical things that need to be done in this province to get us to that standard, if you could summarize them in a few bullet points? Uh, thank you, sir. Um, I, I know that what I'm saying here is, is live, and, and, uh, but British Columbians will admit as well that their system's not perfect. There are problems. Governance is a very important factor in search and rescue. That governance we kind of covered off this afternoon. I, I, I'm not going to say that you have to do this or you should do that, uh, the other, but a strong governance model, which in, involves the SAR HVA, involves the SAR plan, uh, involves your stakeholders. That, that, that's an important aspect. The other thing that comes in is the Volunteer Search and Rescue Association and its personnel need sustainable funding. They need support for critical infrastructure, buildings. They also need sustainable funding for infrastructure, which is rolling stock and equipment. They need some sort of break financially to assist them with being a volunteer. I would ask them, do you want to be paid like a volunteer firefighter on compensation that way as you get it from municipality or do you want to be a, a volunteer and maybe have a tax incentive or, or some other avenue or along those lines? It wouldn't be so pretentious to say you have to do this, no. Um, those, those things there, are, in my mind, are very important. You've got, in a way, you've, you've got Newfoundland Search and Rescue Association with a great executive, a great board. As, as we've seen here in all the hearings and all the time, many, many hours of dedication from people. It, um, it doesn't get much better than that. They need support. It's fragile. And I go back to that. Resilience will be that we can adapt, utilize, and overcome to all these unfolding circumstances and, and make it work. And part of that is those five things I've mentioned. Thank you. Um, so just, uh, I just took two points from your answer, and you covered this off in your presentation. Um, you focus on a SAR plan and the various aspects that go into a SAR plan, which you just use that term generally, and funding. Um, one other point that you mentioned in your presentation that's come up, and there was some discussion amongst my uh, colleagues here and, and the participants on this issue, is this recommendation of an MOU. And in the MOU, um, I understand y y your recommendation is that we have participation from all stakeholders. I was wondering if you could elaborate on how you see an MOU unfolding given the geographic challenges that we face in Newfoundland and Labrador. And specifically what I mean is one of the points that our group has been making, and I believe the Winters family were just making the same or similar point, is that we live in a province where, you know, our shoreline oceans are essentially our highways. We live in a province where the vast majority of our people live around the coast. I know we're not unique in that respect, of course, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, British Columbia, and the Northern Territories all have oceans, obviously. But, but specific to our, our province, how do you see an MOU uh, coming together without meaningful involvement from both 
the provincial government and the federal government to address allocation of things like allocation of resources and you know allocation of responsibility or in other words to ask a very simple question is it possible to achieve an effective MOU without the provincial government and federal government being actively involved in that Thank you, sir. That's a very detailed question. Uh, and I want to be very careful how we qualify and quantify uh, my, my answer here with, with that. I, I had a little sentence up there about you should not be in the box in the, per, in the first place. When it comes to MOUs, and we talk about governance, we have a lot of learner council here from federal, provincial. Um, they work within the realm of, the, of their governance and, and legalities. It, it can be difficult to develop an MOU that involves all the SAR sector and all the stakeholders, but it, sh it should not be and does not have to be. Um, I mentioned to the Federal Council that our S national SAR plan, our guiding document federally, is 2008. We had another one uh, that was addressed in 2017 that went out for review, but it was not accepted. I would say that we can move forward. There are many, many brilliant minds out there in search and rescue that can be involved in assisting in a new federal plan, new provincial plan, and then MOUs from all sectors. It's nothing that can't be done. We often say in, 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 the, in the private sector, you would like us to do what? Yes, we can do that. We'll take that as a challenge and we'll go forward. This should be a challenge, I think, because of the unique geography and peoples of, of Newfoundland and what you just mentioned, sir, to say that we can do this. We can do this in the interest of the taxpayer and the people of the province of Newfoundland and Labrador because we have to, to save lives, and, and address it as that challenge with an MOU that would work across all sectors. But it's going to take hard work, dedicated effort. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, but those are possibilities, I believe, can happen. I guess one, one, one point, uh, just like you to touch on, and maybe it's more of a comment, and maybe I can get your reaction. It strikes me that a MOU to govern search and rescue issues in this province is likely not going to be effective unless both the provincial government and the federal government are involved in that. Would you agree or disagree with that point? I'm not sure, sir, if I agree with that entirely, If it's because this is G ground search and rescue here. I believe we already have it established for the marine and for the air nautical side. That's already been established. Um, for ground search and rescue and then resource manager from ground search and rescue, I think MOUs would be value added for that program. Uh, but certainly from a provincial standpoint through their agencies having jurisdiction, it's, it's possible, and, and it's happened, that they can produce um, the plans to go forward and MOUs internally. You don't always have to go federal if that's, if that's the case. Um, and I'm talking from the, the GSAR perspective. I don't think it's my place to comment on uh, the marine and, and the air side of that and saying you have to have an MOU and everybody work together in unified command. I, I don't think that's necessary because from a ground search and rescue perspective, it's a police responsibility through ANSARA to do the search and rescue mission. The other resources that come to the table, regardless of where they're from, would, would be assisting cooperating agencies for ground search and rescue. Thank you. Those will be all my questions, yeah. Mr. Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, actually, my issues have been addressed uh, by council. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Edna. Just talked about uh, the. Oh, sorry. Just, just to tie back up with what he was just discussing in terms of uh, working up plans on any type of rescue that needs to be implemented within the region or within our, my region, I guess, in Labrador, when you look at what the ground search does, and I commend them for what they do, and anyone else who has to step up when they're called. Uh, when you talk about who's drawing up a plan and looking at our ground search and rescue teams, which are very limited numbers in our communities, uh, and the understanding of those relationships with 
who they have to work with, whether it's the RCMP or having to call uh, any other parties that need to become involved, as they had with my grandson. Uh, looking at the recruitment and retention and the drawing up of plans as to what's going to be done for a missing person, you already have an idea, but you need to set up the safety plans. And I think setting up those safety plans in the long term for a uh, very limited number of volunteers already that volunteer in so many other different areas in such small communities. When we talk about burnout, that burnout is real and it's there. And being a member of a support team for GSAR and other departments in the field that I work in, uh, it's very real. And I think those things in smaller regions you need to be aware of as well. Uh, because the resources are very limited and existing, already existing departments, whether it's clinical or what else, are already running to a max. Uh, thank you very much. Please continue, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Just uh, before I start, we're going to be hearing from uh, Ms. Bradley tomorrow, and uh, and I think that uh, some of what she'll have to say flows uh, uh, directly out of, uh, I think, some of your concerns, uh, Ms. Winters, and and other concerns other people have raised as well. The uh, I just have a couple of questions for. Uh, uh, further for Mr. Smith. Uh, one is that uh, we, we've heard some really amazing uh, uh, things about the technologies available. I'm assuming if somebody said to you 20 years ago that you'd be able to track every snowmobile on a search or be able to see the color of a house from uh, 40 kilometers away, you would find that, that uh, probably literally unbelievable. And uh, which sort of begs the question, and uh, you may be, with your expertise, best positioned to, to give us in some insights into this. And we're going to be hearing stuff tomorrow as well, of course. But like, how will search and rescue be different, do you think, in, in 10 years' time? We've heard from searches back as far as 2010, and, and ones from a year or two ago. And, and a lot has happened in 10 years in terms of the available technology. What's on the horizon in, in just, uh, I guess, a few sentences? How might search and rescue evolve on a technical front over the few years ahead? Thank you, sir. The address of the unmanned aerial systems, unmanned aerial vehicles, that technology and capability will only increase and develop in, in the future. I know you don't like to use the word drones, but what you're talking about is what we've talked about here as drones, I guess. Yes, sir, that okay. is correct. So the UAVs, UAS platforms going forward, um, bigger. Uh, there are, certainly now the technology is there where you can put uh, two, three people in a UAV type of aircraft and it's, it can be a, it's autonomous and up it goes and does its thing and delivers, delivers people from point A to point B. So certainly they use that from an aeronautical standpoint. Again, it has limitations. The ideal aspect is the tracking side through satellite technology. Certainly, uh, some of the larger players in the world right now are putting up enough satellites that would literally sink a ship when it comes to uh, internet capability. That technology is also there for tracking people by wearing apparatus or having an apparatus with you so that you can have a signal go back for your active track. The inReach does that now, but it's only going to get better and increase and then have that capability to um, touch a button to say, this is what's going on, I need help. So it was just gonna go that next and next level. But realistically, I'll also be honest with you, that sometimes there's no, no substitute for somebody looking at footfall impressions on the ground for tracking somebody as to exactly where they went in a certain type of environment. Technology can only take you so far, but it's definitely great tools, and the imagination is the limit as we know. Thank you. And. Uh we, we've heard again a, a lot over the past uh, several weeks about the, uh, the heavy commitment of uh, training uh, time and uh, volunteer time and fundraising and all that. Uh, we've also heard, I, I believe in, in uh, it might have been exploits, and I'm not quoting directly, but 
there's something to the fact that we we uh, expect our volunteers to have their own, uh, at least some of them to have their own uh, skidoos, their own snow machines, their own trucks. Uh, we've heard about the cost of the gear, and I guess this is a question for you and a question for uh, Mr. Blackmore, if he can, would care to to uh, to, to comment as well. The uh, how does ground search and rescue uh, deal with the challenge of being too uh, pricey for many people who would otherwise be glad to become involved and to help out? Uh, how how is uh, how is that sort of on the radar and how is it addressed? Yes, sir, it's, it's, a, it's a great point. Very good question. I'll address it first if Mr. Blackbird doesn't mind. One of the aspects with clothing and everything including a backpack and the items needed in the backpack to be a part of a hasty team, that could be around $3,000. If the group is not supplying anything, you can invest an easy $3,000 to do that today with the proper equipment that can sustain you for 24 hours. If you're using your side-by-side, -side, your um, quad, your off-highway vehicle, your snowmobile, you know, now you're looking at uh, twelve to $20,000 for one of those vehicles. Sure, you use it for recreation, you use it for your own en enjoyment, but you're using it for search and rescue. Uh, so those are investments because it's the wear and tear on that apparatus. And there are some coverages involved now and pricing agreements and MOUs to say, yeah, these certain costs will be, will be covered. If we can incorporate, again, a, a triple P, public-private partnerships, um, with corporations uh, getting tax incentives, some other format where they can say, I don't mind sponsoring SAR in the province on a continuous basis so they can have this pack or a pack. doesn't matter what it is. Not, so I'm not talking about the, the larger items, but clothing items that will supply the uh, rain gear or some other gear to use. Those are all possibilities going forward. Um, and volunteerism from the business and industry and corporate sector can certainly be tapped in to help. Um, that's, that's a great avenue to, to, to look at to assist with the funding. Uh, there are groups, and, and we've seen that here in the province, that as I mentioned before, have here's your hasty team pack and, and off you go. But it's when you start having to spend those cold winter nights, those wet, miserable days out there 24 and 7, that sometimes the clothing becomes the key as well, so you don't become a potential survivor yourself and end up in trouble. So it's looking at different options, different ways of doing it, and, and, and networking with the private business and industry and corporations, and then, but also allowing some of the governance side to say, yes, we believe this is a worthwhile tax incentive and, and base to help the groups out. That, that would be my perspective on it as well. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Blackburn. I'm not 100% sure, uh, Mr. Button, if I understood the last part of your question, but to do with uh, clothing, equipment that we're using, most of the people now, we'd like to have clothing supplied, don't get me wrong, but uh, right now most people buy their own things because they uh, know what shape is in, they keep it in good shape. And uh, that comes right on down to snowmobiles, ATVs, etc. cetera. Uh, some teams out there do have a couple of snowmobiles or an ATV, but most of the search and rescue volunteers would rather use their own equipment now we only get, if we use our equipment, when we were, uh, turn up with a $20,000 skidoo, you get paid $10 an hour if you use it. But uh, most people like to use their own equipment for the simple reason they know what they got, they know what's on it, they know how the machine works, and uh, everything that they would need if they're out doing a search, hopefully, is on their own machines, and most of our people operate that way. As for the last part of your question, I'm not exactly sure which what or what you wanted, so uh, unless you want to repeat it, but yeah, I'll... sure. Well, I guess my concern is, uh, how does the uh, when you're you're looking to attract people, uh, how do you uh, uh, how do you deal with the fact that some people may, while otherwise qualified, while otherwise really willing to step up, are either not in a position to afford this and are perhaps embarrassed to say so, or or uh, feel intimidated by the sort of the sense that they're expected to provide a certain level of equipment and stuff. Do you, is that on your radar, I guess, what I'm asking, and how do you deal with it? With this? 
It is on our radar, most of the way that the teams uh, tackle it. Uh, pretty well, as long as you've got a good pair of boots, you can join. Uh, once you get in and you're on the team, if the team is worth anything at all, if they see you that you are turning up the searches with improper equipment or improper gear, they probably won't let you go, but steps would be taken to buy equipment for you. We've had people come in that, yes, they had a good pair of boots and they're willing to help out, not fully decked out, but the team then would step in and help them out the best way they could. Uh, I know on our team, you haven't got a set of rain clothes, I go upstairs and I give you a set, simple as that. But uh, most of the people that are coming into this, we haven't seen that as being a big problem. There might be a scattered one, but most of the people that are in volunteer search and rescue uh, are well equipped to go out in the country. Um, and as part of the coordinator's job within the team is to uh, make sure you are. And one example of that was exactly in McCovey when they went for the plane crash. Someone said their CMP fellow wasn't dressed properly. Uh, before he left, Barry Anderson and a couple more of the boys made sure he was properly clothed. So that's the way we go at it. As to someone supplying everything for you, unless you're in the military or something, that they're going to give you the clothes, I think that's the only way it'll work. And uh, then once you get into everything being given to you that way, you also lose the part of uh, volunteering a bit. You're ex you expect everything to be given to you, and that's not what we're at. We are asking for a lot out of this inquiry. Don't get me wrong, and I won't drop my price. But <laughs> uh, things out there, too, that volunteers do, we will keep doing. And uh, that's just the way it is. But overall, most people come well-equipped enough to go out. And then the team itself has extra gear that uh, would be made up for them. No different than we went on a search tonight on the East Coast Trail. Every single team out there has a kit on their back to stay the whole night if they got to, no matter what. Kits are done up that way. You've seen it in Exploit. You've seen it here. You've seen it down with Barry Anderson. Pretty well all the teams are set up that way, and that's due to education. And uh, I guess to just to tell them what teams to get together. When we get together in our AGMs, and I've already invited the, the commissioner and yourself to it, that's what things are then set up. What do you got? What do we got? how to do this better, how to do this better. And things are done up that way. The big things that we're after is to uh, continue on as we did, as I sp spoke about yesterday, was the big, big items in how search and rescue work and keeping that stuff going. The little stuff that we use ourselves and skidoos and all that type stuff, no different if I roll up, yes, I got a $20,000 skidoo. I would rather take my skidoo than take a skidoo that's been sitting on the trailer there, belong to the SAR team. I'm used to my own machine. I know what's in it. Uh, if I roll it over and get hurt, at least I know I got enough gear there to take care of me. But uh, that's just the way we are. I don't know if that answers it or not. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's uh, helpful. And, and some of this will come up again on our, on our Friday round table. Uh, my last question, perhaps Madam Clerk, you call up uh, Exhibit 190. Uh, page three, and that's Mr. Blackmore's uh, presentation of yesterday. And uh, this question is more for Mr. Smith. Uh, once the, it's the last paragraph that I'm uh, particularly interested in, Madam Clerk. <clears throat> One ninety. Page, page three, near the end of it. I'm, uh, I'm struck by that figure, uh, and you know, obviously it's beyond the scope of this inquiry to put a value on any particular type of work, but for $25 an hour to expect somebody to be on, uh, on sort of 24-hour standby and to use their own equipment and perhaps work 16 hours with no overtime and uh, doing all this in all kinds of weather and in, in some danger. 
Uh, this is sort of Mr. Smith. Does that not seem a very modest uh, figure for that kind of uh, that kind of uh, service? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, yes, it does. Um, and sometimes we, when doing the cost-benefit analysis for volunteers, we've uh, we've lowered that figure. Um, but in actual fact, to complete what you just mentioned, very similar to volunteer uh, fire departments, the, the figure would be closer to fifty to fifty-five dollars an hour. So really, when we look at that figure, that the value of what the ground search and El Sara. Uh, the value of the work they do, which they self-value at a little over $3 million, uh, you would regard that, I take it from your previous answer, as maybe half of its true value of approaches from a market point of view. Yes, yes, sir, that, that would be correct. If you equate it back to a police officer and the hourly wage for a, a constable who has to do the job, what, what they're paid, as an example, a uh, full-time firefighter, what they're paid, those would be comparisons when you're engaged in a, in a search and rescue mission. Uh, Mr. Budden, that number actually came from a study, and it is about 12, 15 years old. Mm. Yeah. It recognized, and this was done throughout Canada and the United States, volunteerism, whether you were playing a volunteer at bingo or you were a volunteer search and rescue, or a volunteer at the swimming pool, that was the hourly rate they came up with. That, and that was the only rate that we had that was actually on paper as a credible uh, amount at that time. And we do know right now in most places, $40 is what's used. But we stuck with what we got because we do have it in writing. <laughs> And that's all. But fair enough. I'm, I Don't guess, give him too many ideas. <laughs> my, my, my point is simply that if you're looking at the actual cost of the value of the services and you're going to put in any dollar figure, perhaps 25 is, uh, is rather low. Uh, those are really my questions, Mr. Commissioner. I'm not sure if anybody in the room, uh, council or otherwise, have questions. Uh, otherwise, I, I propose we, we not do anything further today. And, and Mr. Marshall, if he's here anyway, can can speak in the morning, and of course we'll hear from Ms. Bradley in the morning as well. I, I wonder if we can get, does uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, have um, a document that he can share with us before tomorrow? Pardon me, Peter, sorry? I'm sorry, does the Lieutenant Colonel have a document that he could share with us? Uh, uh, today? Yes. Uh, no, but he okay. had collected some statistics. That's he fine. Had, that's he fine. intended to just speak to the. No worries. Uh, to it. Yeah, that's I can, fine. We can type it out if you. Yeah, need to, that's fine. If you need it, but thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, uh, so grateful for your uh, participation, your openness, and your respectfulness for each other's uh, positions. I know it's the general tendency of lawyers to be adversarial, and it's actually quite different to try to be. Um, uh, cooperative and respectful in some cases, but uh, that's that's the task we're given, and uh, you've taken it on uh, quite seriously. So we'll see you again tomorrow morning. What time, sir? Miss Bradley has a, a little bit of a drive uh, ahead of her tomorrow, I believe. Uh, would nine thirty perhaps be an appropriate time? It works for me. Thank you. Thank. You. All rise. This commission of inquiry is concluded for the day. Thank you.